Silent Order, Axiom Hand. Jonathan Moeller. Description. The galaxy is at war, and a death at the wrong time and the wrong place can destroy an empire. When several junior officers are murdered, Jack March is sent to track down the culprit. The trail leads him to a decaying world and a brutal war between two crime syndicates. But one of the crime syndicates has a secret ally that could slaughter billions. Starting with Jack March. 1. Crawler. Jack March ran through the alley, weapon gripped in both hands. The gun was a Kalaskaran Royal Armaments .45 caliber pistol with a 22 round magazine jutting from the base of the grip. March would have preferred a plasma pistol, but only security forces could use plasma-based hand weaponry on Constantinople II. Everyone else could make do with traditional chemical propellant kinetic firearms. Men could kill each other with kinetic firearms, but one man with a plasma pistol could do far more damage. Granted, it hadn't done the local security forces much good. Their plasma weapons had proven ineffective against whatever had been killing the Royal Kalaskaran, Navy officers, taking their shore leave on the planet. The first few murders had been chalked up to muggings and personal disputes. After the fifth officer had been killed, the Royal Navy had suspected that a machinist cell had set up on Constantinople too. So, the silent order had gotten involved, and March had been dispatched to track down the murderers. He had expected to find a cell of machinist collaborators, one that used attractive women as honey traps to lure unsuspecting Royal Navy officers to their deaths. He had encountered and shut down such operations before. March had not, however, expected to find a cybernetic horror, a mixture of machine parts and twisted flesh. The creature had cut the throat of a young ensign and then fled out the back of the resort as the patrons screamed and March had pursued. He had never seen a creature like that before, and he knew every class of cyborg that the machinists had inflicted upon the galaxy in their quest to replace mankind with their final consciousness. Whatever the thing was, it was something new. Behind him, he heard the shouts of alarm, along with the panicked screams of the club's waitresses, most of whom had likely never seen a man killed before. The cruising cruiser, as the club was called, catered to junior officers of the Royal Kalaskaran Navy, men who were old enough to know better than to get into trouble on shore leave, but young enough to do it anyway. As spaceport bars went, it was one of the fancier ones that March had seen, with a cavernous air-conditioned restaurant and a broad terrace overlooking the ocean on the nights when the local humidity permitted outdoor recreation. Now the terrace had become a scene of chaos, as the club's bouncers and the various junior officers who had just seen their comrade murdered attempted to assert their authority. None that had stopped March as he had gone in pursuit of the creature. The thing had moved with such speed that it was possible that none of the naval officers or the patrons had noticed the creature leap over the rail of the terrace and land in the alley. March had tracked a man named Philip Reimer to the cruising cruiser, expecting that Reimer would turn out to be the head of a local machinist cell, or maybe an iron hand sent to make trouble for the kingdom of Kalaskar. He had not expected Reimer to turn into something that looked like a giant cybernetic spider, kill an ensign of the Royal Navy, and then flee into the alley. But whatever was going on, it was going to end tonight. The alley came to an end, and March stepped into a parking lot filled with rental cars, idling autocabs waiting along the curb for customers. It was 2300 local time, but three of Constantinople IS five moons were in the sky, and March had no trouble seeing. On the other side of the parking lot was a strip mall with retail businesses that catered to tourists. The largest of them was a big box store that sold sporting equipment for Constantinople IS vast oceans and beaches, kayaks and canoes and scuba gear and the like. A trail of blood droplets led towards the big box store, and if that were not obvious enough, one of the glass doors had been smashed. Reimer had gone that way. March ran across the parking lot and slowed as he came to the smashed doors. Undoubtedly, the store had security cameras, and March didn't wish to be recorded. 
Nevertheless, the cruising cruiser had cameras, and they had already seen him in motion. For that matter, it was possible the sporting goods store had overnight workers stocking freight, and the creature that Reimer had become would not hesitate to kill. March strode through the broken door, gun in both hands. The store beyond was dim and humid, the air conditioning shut off for the night. On March's left was a customer service counter, the cash registers to his right. In front of him stood a cardboard cutout of a smiling man and a smiling woman, both of them dressed in the store's brand of athletic clothing. A smashed android lay on the floor a few meters ahead, its silver chest and head caved in by vicious blows. A second android walked towards March, a silver humanoid figure with white glowing eyes. Good evening, respected sir, said the android in a pleasant female voice. Unfortunately, the store is closed for the evening. Please return at 8 o'clock local time, when our knowledgeable sales staff will be delighted to assist you with your purchase. The computer pseudo-intelligence controlling the android couldn't be that bright. Else it would have contacted local law enforcement when Reimer smashed through the doors and wrecked the other greeter android. Perhaps March could make use of that. Another customer came here right before me, said March. Where is he? The android paused. The only other customer in the store is currently in women's athletic footwear. Great, said March. Where's that? Aisles 19 through 37, said the android. Are there any employees in the store, said March, orienting himself by the numbered signs hanging from the ceiling. Women's athletic footwear would be on the other side of the building. None at present, sir, said the android. Please return at 8 o'clock local time when our knowledgeable sales. Thanks, said March, and he jogged forward, leaving the greeter android to stare after him in bewilderment. He headed down one of the store's central aisles, past displays of surfboards and scuba equipment and hiking boots. Once he drew too near to an end cap, and a holographic display flared to life, playing an annoying jingle and showing an attractive woman in a swimsuit extolling the virtues of a specific brand of sunscreen. A modest swimsuit, though, since this was a Kalaskaran world. March cursed under his breath and hurried on until the annoying hologram shut down. He didn't know how sensitive Reimer's hearing had become in his altered form, and he wanted to take the creature unawares. He came to aisles 19 through 37, which contained a bewildering array of women's athletic shoes for every conceivable sport and activity. March heard a crashing, clanking noise from one of the aisles, and he slowed down, the pistol held out before him. A smell filled his nostrils, a ghastly mixture of blood and diseased flesh, and the familiar metallic tang of fresh implanted nanotech-based cybernetics. The thing that had been Philip Reimer, the thing that had killed seven junior Kalaskaran naval officers in the last two months, and an eighth just now in the cruising cruiser, was not far ahead. March slowed, his shoes making no silence against the carpeted floor of the footwear aisles. He passed an end cap laden with women's running shoes in bright shades of orange and purple and pink and yellow, took a deep breath to steady his hand of flesh and hand of metal, and peered around the corner. Reimer crouched at the end of the aisle, rummaging through the shoe boxes on the shelves and muttering to himself. At least, it was the nightmare that had once been Reimer. His body was still human-shaped, more or less. But he was naked and his skin had taken the grayish pallor of a man whose blood had been replaced with nanobots. Indeed, March saw the black veins threading their way through his flesh like corruption through the flesh of a corpse. At the base of his skull was the familiar gray metal plate of a machinist hive implant, his link to the rest of the final consciousness, though right now he would only be able to communicate with the local mind group. To judge from the loose way the skin hung from his stomach and chest and thighs, Reimer had once been much heavier, even morbidly obese. That was hardly the most noticeable thing about him. The four giant metal legs jutting from the side of his torso drew the eye. The additional legs were thin, almost spindly, yet bore Reimer's weight with ease. The legs were a dull gray color, the same color as Mach's own cybernetic left arm. That wasn't surprising, given that the same technology underlay both. And if those legs were like Macha's arm, 
they would possess strength many times that of a normal man. That would explain how Reimer had ripped off the head of that poor ensign. Blue, muttered Reimer, picking up a running shoe and throwing it aside. Yellow. Orange. It doesn't make sense. The sugar is white. White. Why did it turn orange? Why? He shrieked in frustration. It doesn't make sense. March swung around the corner, pointed his pistol at Reimer's head, and squeezed the trigger twice. He did it fast, so fast that Reimer shouldn't have been able to respond or recover in time. But Reimer was just as fast as March. He twisted with a snarl, and one of his metal spider legs moved in a blur. The shots that would have penetrated Reimer's skull instead hit the metal limb. The alloy the machinists used for their cybernetics resisted the bullets with ease, and Macha's shots ricocheted off the leg to slam into the racks of sneakers. Reimer surged forward. Three of his metal legs propelled his forward motion. The fourth was still raised in guard, and it snapped back and then forward with enough force to crush bone. March was already moving, shifting his pistol to his right hand and raising his left arm in guard. Reimer was likely a more advanced version of the biological and cybernetic science that had transformed March into an iron hand, but the composition of the metal had not changed, and his left arm was just as strong as Reimer's spider leg. The leg clanged against his arm with terrific force. The shock of the impact shot down Macha's arm and into his chest and shoulder, but his cybernetic arm was strong enough to absorb the impact. A brief flicker of surprise went over Reimer's slack face, but before he could recover, Macha's right hand snapped back up. He squeezed the pistol's trigger three times, and all three shots slammed into Reimer's forehead at point-blank range. Reimer's head snapped back, and both his limbs of flesh and his legs of metal went into a wild thrashing dance as his nervous system began to shut down. March jumped back as both of Reimer's right legs hit a shelf of shoes with enough force to send it toppling over. Then the limbs went still, but Reimer did not fall. All four metal legs braced themselves against the carpet, and Reimer turned himself toward March. His face was limp, trickles of the black slime that had replaced his blood dripping down his jaw, and his biological arms and legs hung loose, but the metal limbs kept moving one at a time, like a spider preparing to pounce upon its prey. Shit, March muttered. He had seen this before. Three bullets through the brain had killed Reimer, and his biological systems had shut down. But the cybernetics were still functioning, and the machine components that had been added to his brain still kept working. Machinist infiltrator drones operated on the same principle, the nanotech converting a corpse into a cybernetic warrior for the final consciousness. Except this creature that had once been a living man would be far stronger and far more dangerous than a common infiltrator drone. March took two quick steps back and fired a round into Reimer's chest. As he expected, it did nothing. Reimer's corpse twitched, but the metal legs kept moving forward. How was the creature seeing him? It didn't seem to be using Reimer's eyes. And in any event, the physical destruction of Reimer's brain ought to have severed the connection to his optic nerves. The creature lunged at him, and March had no more time for speculation. He retreated, body held sideways, left arm out before him. The creature braced itself on three legs, the fourth lashing at March like a whip. March ducked and dodged, blocking a few of the blows on his left arm. The metal leg landed with enough force that it split open the sleeve of his jacket and his shirt, revealing the dull gray metal of his cybernetic arm beneath it. He retreated to the main aisle, and the creature pursued him. Several times March tried to attack. The only way to stop the creature would be to remove its hive implant. With his left hand, March could rip the hive implant from Reimer's skull with a single motion, shutting down the cybernetics driving the dead man's flesh. Unfortunately, the creature seemed aware of its weakness, and its metal legs wove a defensive web around it. March dared not draw close enough to attack, not when a single hit from the legs would crack his skull. Still he retreated, and the creature followed. Heat. That was it. The cybernetics embedded in the dead man's body must have included infrared sensors for detecting heat. 
Macha's body heat would stand out against the temperature of the store. He risked a glance around, seeking for anything he could use. Athletic footwear. Useless. Boating supplies. No. Camping equipment. March ran for the aisles offering camping equipment. The creature pursued him, metal legs digging against the linoleum tiles of the main aisle. March sprinted past the aisles holding camping supplies, scanning the signs for what he needed. There. Cooking supplies. More than that, vintage cooking supplies for camping enthusiasts who wanted to prepare their meals the way that campers had in ancient days on primeval earth, with campfires and metal grills. Or by using flammable hydrocarbons such as propane. At the end of an aisle waited a display of green propane tanks festooned with hazard warnings. March raced past it to a safe distance, whirled, brought up his pistol and started shooting. Nothing happened when he shot the first tank, and nothing when he shot the second tank. The third tank exploded with a harsh fireball, igniting the propane from the first two tanks and engulfing the display in flames. A shrill alarm rang out, and the sprinkler systems over the camping aisles came to life, spraying water upon the fire. But for a moment, the propane fire blazed hot, and the thing that had been Rhymer whirled to face the new source of heat, identifying it as a threat. March sprinted forward as fast as he could. Rhymer started to turn, but by then it was too late. March twisted around Rhymer's legs and leapt upon the dead man's back. His weight drove Rhymer towards the floor, but the metal legs flexed, catching their balance. Macha's left hand plunged towards Rhymer's skull, and his metal fingers grasped the hive implant and pulled. One of Rhymer's legs struck Macha's side. Pain exploded through his chest, and the force of the impact knocked him from the creature and sent him skidding across the wet floor. March slammed into an end cap of camp chairs and caught his balance, scrambling back to his feet as he tried to ignore the pain in his chest. There was something cold and heavy and wet in his left hand. It was the hive implant of a machinist drone, bloody and glistening. March looked up just in time to see Rhymer collapse to the floor. His metal legs twitched once and then went motionless. Philip Rhymer was dead. Again. March wondered just what the hell had happened to him. Right now, he had more immediate problems such as getting out of sight before he got arrested for breaking into a sporting goods store, for instance, or making sure Rhymer's corpse didn't fall into the hands of the local authorities. As far as March knew, the local authorities on Constantinople too were no more corrupt than the local authorities anywhere else in the kingdom of Kalaskar, but someone had gotten Rhymer to the planet. Likely there were machinist sympathizers someplace. He stuffed the bloody hive implant into his jacket pocket. Maybe the silent order scientists or the researchers at the Ministry of Defense could get something out of it. He grabbed a heavy camping jacket from a nearby display and wrapped it around the remnants of Rhymer's head to soak up the black slime. With his right hand, March fished his phone out of his pocket and made a call, lifting it to his ear. With his left hand, he grabbed one of Rhymer's metal legs and started dragging. Much as he hated what had been done to him, March had to admit that his cybernetic augmentations came in handy from time to time. Dragging Rhymer with his left arm was much easier than it would have been with his arm of flesh. His phone clicked as someone picked up on the third ring. March? That you? Whitefish? Yeah, it's March. March headed towards the front doors of the store as fast as he could. I'm at the sporting goods store behind the cruising cruiser. Get here with the van as fast as you can. Rhymer's our perp and he's dead. There was silence on the line for about three seconds, and then the man swore. Rhymer. Damn me, but that's a surprise. That skinny little sad sack. I thought he was an informant or a collaborator for the machinists. I didn't think he had it in him to kill naval officers with his bare hands. I mean, those young fellows in the Navy can handle themselves in a fight, even when they're drunk. Rhymer had some upgrades, said March. There was silence. March passed the cash registers, still dragging Rhymer's corpse. Well, 
Shit, said Whitefish at last. That's what I thought, said March. Also, I showed up on camera both at the cruising cruiser and the sporting goods store. Better get the video erased. Yeah, I'll get my boys on it, said Whitefish. I'm too old for this nonsense. You said that the last time I was here. And I'm even older now, said Whitefish with a sigh. Meet me out front. I'll be there in about two minutes. Thanks. March ended the call and stuffed the phone back into his pocket. The greeter android paced back and forth before the customer service counter, the indecision of its pseudo-intelligence clear. Honored sir, said the android. I must inform you that it is against store policy to allow any form of shoplifting, and shoplifters will be prosecuted to the fullest extent permitted by local and kingdom law. Good policy, said March. The android stared at him as he dragged Reimer over the shattered door. As March walked into the parking lot, a battered blue van came to a stop a few meters away, its engine giving off a tired whine. One of Whitefish's local contractors drove the van, a grim-faced former mercenary, and a second man sat in the passenger seat, a fully automatic rifle with a hundred-round magazine resting in his arms. The van's back doors opened and Whitefish leaned out. God damn it, said Whitefish. What the hell is that thing? The head of the local silent order branch was leaving late middle age and seemed to get fatter every time March saw him. He wore a loose shirt covered with tropical designs and a pair of ragged cargo pants. Nevertheless, there was still a great deal of muscle under all that fat, and there was nothing lax about the way he held his pistol pointed at Reimer's corpse. Reimer, said March. What's left of him? Told you he had some upgrades. God. Whitefish switched on his gun safety, stuffed it into a pocket, and jumped down from the van. Things always seem to get wild when you turn up, Jack. Take his other side. March nodded and took Reimer's right side, while Whitefish took his left. Together, they heaved the corpse into the back of the van. Whitefish climbed in, March followed suit, and they pulled the door shut behind them. Back to the club, said Whitefish. The driver grunted and got the van rolling. What next? The cleanup, said March. Reimer killed eight officers. We'll need to have something to tell the local authorities. The silent order can deal with the Navy, but we'll have to handle things on the ground. Whitefish sighed. You're going to work me to my grave, Jack March but he lifted his phone and started making some calls. It took four days before March could leave the planet of Constantinople too, with Philip Reimer's corpse secured in the tiger's cargo hold. Getting rid of the security video proved the easiest part of the cleanup. Whitefish owned several beachside clubs and was chummy with the owners and managers of the competing establishments. A judicious bribe convinced the cruising cruiser's manager to hand over his security footage. The servers of the sporting goods store were not terribly secure, and one of Whitefish's employees hacked in and erased the video files. Dealing with the local authorities proved trickier. Constantinople, too, was technically a colony under the jurisdiction of the government and Grand Duke of Constantinople IV the most populated planet in the Constantinople solar system. That meant a tangle of different legal authorities could claim jurisdiction for the murders. Constantinople, too, had an elected sheriff, who then appointed deputies and constables. The colonial governor could also take a hand in capital crimes, and for that matter, so could the barons and the one earl who had estates on the planet. Since all eight of the victims had been naval officers, the Kalaskaran Royal Navy could also claim precedence in the investigation. The Silent Order didn't like that. As the name implied, the Silent Order preferred to remain unnoticed and unseen. Whitefish had to make several calls to censor, the mysterious head of the Silent Order, and possibly one of the most well-informed men in the Kingdom of Kalaskar or anywhere else. In the end, the Navy issued a statement that the eight murdered officers had been killed by a machinist terrorist, a terrorist that the Navy had killed. All details about the killing were declared classified 
for the safety of the Kingdom of Kalaskar. March spent the four days of the cleanup in an enforced vacation at Whitefish's main club, a sprawling casino and nightclub called the Blue Wave. The Blue Wave offered a stupendous array of alcoholic beverages, games, musical performance, and even a discreet and heavily licensed brothel tucked away out of sight. March was never at ease while at leisure, so he spent the time alternating between exercising in the Blue Wave's excellent and infrequently used gym and driving back to the spaceport to do maintenance and upgrades on the Tiger. You should relax more, Jack, said Whitefish one night. They sat at a booth in the corner in the Blue Wave's vast dining room. Whitefish held court a few nights a week, handling business that required a personal touch and receiving visits from his informants. He wore a garish blue suit, and a truly ridiculous quantity of food covered the table in front of him, along with several bottles of expensive alcohol. A cigar smoldered in his right hand. March had declined the food and the alcohol, but he had taken one of the cigars. He didn't smoke on a regular basis, but there were times when it suited a mood, and this was one of them. I am relaxing, said March. Whitefish snorted. You spent the last four days doing deadlifts in my gym and recalibrating your ship's ion thrusters. Very relaxing. No, I didn't, said March. I spent the last four days doing deadlifts in your gym and overhauling the Tiger's fusion drive. Completely different. You didn't even visit the brothel, said Whitefish. As much as I would enjoy an android that has been used by a thousand men before me, said March, I have to decline. This cigar is excellent, though. Isn't it, said Whitefish, pleased. The man was a very good host. It was just as well he had cigars. He would have kept offering various luxuries to March until he felt his duty as host was satisfied. I get them from the Stromboli Consortium. The best tobacco in the galaxy, in the opinion of myself and many other renowned authorities, comes from a little colony on the other side of the Gloom Nebula. Cost an arm and a leg but worth it. He blew out a cloud of smoke and suddenly changed his mind to business. You should be able to leave tomorrow. March nodded. Got things cleared up? Mostly, said Whitefish. Sensor fixed things with the local authorities, and the Navy is taking credit for killing Reimer. Sensor sounded pretty pleased with you. Well, as much as the old ghost is ever pleased with anything, he must relax even less than you, Jack. He leaned closer. I sent him a DNA scan from Reimer's carcass, yeah. March nodded. Don't know what he'll learn from it. Machinist DNA is always screwed to hell and back, no offense. But that DNA scan got Sensor all excited. Tomorrow you're supposed to proceed to Constantinople Station, but on the way, you'll meet a Navy shuttle and hand over Reimer's corpse. After that, Sensor will contact you for a new job once you get to the station. March grunted. Suppose I had better have a second cigar, then. Smart man. The next day everything was arranged, and March left Constantinople IIS spaceport aboard the Tiger. His ship was a Mercator Foundry Yards Class 9 light freighter, heavily modified, upgraded, and armed. It was the kind of ship commonly called a blockade runner, a favorite of smugglers, independent operators, and privateers, which was just as well since March presented a public face to the world as a privateer. Technically, March was a privateer since he held letters of mark from the Kingdom of Kalaskar, and he regularly ran cargoes to pay his bills. And he was actually carrying cargo for the Kingdom of Kalaskar itself. Granted, that cargo was Philip Reimer's corpse secured in a metal box in the hold, but still. March sat in the flight cabin at the pilot station, screens and holographic displays showing the status of the ship and the surrounding space. One screen showed data about Constantinople too. Its surface was over 90% ocean, with a single small continent and a few small islands, which explained why the planet's main industries were tourism and a sideline in algae protein farming. After a few hours, March was 500,000 kilometers from the planet, and he docked with the waiting Royal Navy troop transport. 
Four grim-faced Royal Marines in blue power armor took Rhymer's impromptu coffin without a word, and then the transport undocked and vanished into hyperspace. Once the transport departed, March started his own hyperspace calculation. It was a short jump, and the calculation only took a few minutes, but he nonetheless performed all the pre-flight checks on the dark matter reactor, the hyperdrive itself, and the dark energy resonator. If either the dark matter reactor or the hyperdrive failed, at best the Tiger would fail to enter hyperspace. At worst, the ship would blow up. And if the dark energy resonator failed while traversing hyperspace, that would be worse. Without a functioning resonator, any ship in hyperspace would attract macrobes, dark energy-based life forms that could possess and mutate humans. March thought the remaining cybernetics and nanotech in his body, to say nothing of his damaged DNA, would render him immune to macro possession, but he didn't want to test it. So he performed all the checks, and once the system showed green, March activated the hyperdrive and took the Tiger into hyperspace. The jump took seven minutes, and once the Tiger exited the terminus of its hyperspace tunnel, March found himself past the orbit of the Constantinople system's first gas giant and its moons. Constantinople station floated in the void, a quarter of a million kilometers ahead. The station was huge, seven enormous habitat rings built within a central cylinder. Nearly a million people lived and worked on the station, and thousands of ships stopped there every month. Constantinople IV was one of the seven main worlds of the Kingdom of Kalaskar, and one of the first colonies founded by the Kalaskaran crown in the kingdom's expansion after the civil war with the Renarchists. The station was centuries old and a hub for interstellar commerce, both within the systems of the kingdom and with its neighbors. Of course, no major interstellar power permitted foreign spacecraft to approach its inhabited worlds, and Constantinople IV's ground defenses and the firepower of the Royal Kalaskaran Navy let the kingdom enforce its will in that decision. All interstellar commerce headed for Constantinople IV docked at Constantinople Station, and Kalaskaran shuttles carried the goods to the worlds, moons, and stations of the system. Incoming transmission, Captain March, said a female voice over the flight cabin speakers. The voice had a cool, upper-class Kalaskaran accent. Constantinople Station Control is hailing the Tiger. Thank you, Vigil, said March. The pseudo-intelligence that controlled many of the Tiger systems was far more powerful and sophisticated than the simple pseudo-intelligence that managed the greeter androids in the sporting goods store. Nevertheless, Vigil was still not a true artificial intelligence and possessed no sapience. Every human experiment with artificial intelligence had ended in disaster, with the AI inevitably descending into homicidal madness. Alien experiments with artificial intelligence had only garnered a little more success. March had found that out the hard way. He answered the call and stated his business and transmitted his ID information to the earnest young ensign of the Royal Kalaskaran Navy working in traffic control. March supposed the traffic controller officer was just like the young men who had been murdered on Constantinople too. After a few moments, the ensign assigned the Tiger to docking bay 9954 on ring 6, and March guided to the Tiger to the appropriate spot. Once he had docked, he set the ship systems to stand by and directed Vigil to begin diagnostics. After that, he spent some money to purchase supplies and reactor fuel from the station's vendors. It cost more than he would have liked, especially since he had been forced to leave Constantinople II without a paying cargo, but March had enough financial reserves to weather the cost for now. Once that was completed, he left the ship and walked through the concourses of Constantinople Station. The station was old, and it was built in the classic High Kalaskaran style, with lots of gleaming metal, the walls themselves adorned with massive screens showing videos about the history of the kingdom, or enormous murals commissioned from the kingdom's most prominent artists. Most of the murals showed scenes from the history of Kalaskar. One showed the first king leading the colonists from the self-immolation of the Fifth Terran Empire and landing on Kalaskar. March was reasonably sure that the first king of Kalaskar had not been that muscular or broad-shouldered, but one had to account for artistic license. 
Others showed victorious Lord Admirals of the Navy's past, and still another showed the first colonists landing on Constantinople IV. More murals showed religious themes from the Royal Kalaskaran Church, Joshua leading the Israelites to the Promised Land. Joshua looked a lot like the first king of Kalaskar, or Christ feeding the masses or driving the moneylenders from the temple. March gazed at the murals as he walked past them. He was cynical enough to see the propaganda value of such artwork, how the murals had been designed to reinforce the message that Kalaskar was one nation beneath its king. They praised Kalaskar's history and culture, reminding the people of the lineage and heritage of their traditions. Yet he had to admit they were beautiful. And the final consciousness produced no art. The machinists created nothing but blood and death and conquest, leaving ruined worlds filled with labor camps and graveyards in their wake. March supposed that summed up his feelings for his adopted nation. The kingdom of Kalaskar was not without its flaws, but it was far, far better than the inhuman tyranny of the final consciousness and the endless cruelty of the machinists. A walk of about two kilometers brought March to his favorite restaurant on Constantinople Station. The different restaurants and taverns on the station catered to different groups of people. High-ranking naval officers and visiting nobles went to their own clubs, and lower-ranking officers did the same. Enlisted men visited taverns where officers only rarely appeared. Freighter crewers and independent starship captains went to their own bars, and March followed suit. He came to a restaurant on the upper level of one of the station's commercial concourses, five levels of shops and restaurants and equipment workshops spreading away below him. The far wall of the concourse had been painted with an enormous mural showing the history of Kalaskar, with kings and lord admirals striding through the centuries while God watched from above. It was a famous mural, and March saw small clusters of tourists standing at the railings of the balconies, taking pictures with the huge painting in the background. He ignored the mural and took a booth at the restaurant, where he ordered his preferred breakfast meal from a waitress in a tight t-shirt and skirt. A few moments later, he ate his breakfast of vat-grown eggs and bacon, accompanied by large quantities of black coffee. March supposed he was close enough to Constantinople IV that he could have ordered real bacon and eggs for merely twice the cost of their vat-grown counterparts, but he had always had a taste for artificially grown meat. The habits of a lifetime, he supposed. And much to his surprise, Censor did not call until March had finished his meal and was on his third cup of coffee. He looked at the display on his phone. The call had arrived at the Tiger, and Vigil had routed it to March's phone. The display indicated that the call had arrived with the highest known level of quantum encryption, and its source was unknown. Sensor was likely calling from Constantinople IV, though technically he could have been calling from any one of the seven worlds in the kingdom of Kalaskar that possessed Tachyon entanglement relay-based communications. Though given how expensive Tachyon relays were to build, likely the head of the Silent Order was calling from Constantinople IV. But that was not important. March accepted the call and lifted the phone to his ear. Hello. Hello, Captain March, came Sensor's dry voice. You did quite well on Constantinople, too. Whitefish spoke most highly of your efforts against Philip Reimer. Thank you, sir, said March, glancing around the restaurant. Most of the breakfast crowd had died away, and there was no one close enough to overhear him. Given the number of calls that went on in a spaceport, most of the booths in the restaurants had excellent sound dampening anyway. However, said Censor, the reward for work well done is more work as the ancient proverb goes. The examination of Reimer's corpse revealed some mysteries. So soon, said March. There couldn't have been time to examine him properly yet. There wasn't, said Censor, and the scientists are still continuing their work. However, it appears that Mr. Reimer was a new type of machinist cyborg drone linked to the final consciousness. A preliminary analysis shows DNA alterations and cybernetic enhancements that we've never seen before. That's disturbing, sir, said March, but not unexpected. The machinists incorporate new technology into their designs whenever they can steal it. 
Agreed, said Censor. But there are three unexpected and disturbing elements to Rhymer. First, it appears that he regularly transformed between a human appearance and the more spider-like form that you found. March frowned. Then he was a new kind of infiltrator drone. Unable to disguise itself and then transform at will. Yes, said Censor. That is why Rhymer went for so long without getting captured on Constantinople too. Additionally, it seems that Rhymer himself had no memory of his transformations or when they happened. Macha's frown deepened. Then he was a machinist drone, without even realizing it. Almost like the Wraith devices. That is correct, said Sensor again. Which leads to the second disturbing element. Several of Rhymer's implants appeared to be in a quantum state, changing configuration based upon their circumstances. Much like the quantum inducers you brought back from Monastery Station. March said nothing for a moment. That was not good. He had already seen the havoc the machinists could wreak with a wraith device and the quantum inducers at their heart. If they had found more technology of the Great Elder Ones and figured out how to use it. What was the third disturbing element, said March at last. Whitefish tracked down Rhymer's passport, said Censor, and we cross-checked the DNA record with our analysis. The machinist implants did considerable damage to his genetic structure, but the match is unmistakable. Philip Reimer was a citizen of the world of Rusterol. March let out a long breath. That is a problem, sir. It is. Rusterol has played at neutrality between the kingdom of Kalaskar and the final consciousness for decades. Nevertheless, the natural sympathy of renarchist politics lends itself to the philosophy of the machinists. Censor paused. If the Rustari are preparing to ally with the machinists, that would be a grave blow against the kingdom. It may not be as dire as that, sir, said March. Rustral is, well, it is not a rising power. The last time I was there, it seemed like a civilization entering its final decline. The inevitable consequence of renarchist policies, I am afraid said Censor. Rustral will not have improved since your last visit. My point is that the government of Rustral might not be able to control its own planet any longer, said March. If not for the orbital railguns, Rustral would have fallen to invaders centuries ago. If the machinists have decided to take Rustral for themselves, they might have seated these new drones there. We simply do not have enough information, said Censor. Which is why, Captain March, as soon as we finish this conversation, you are heading to Rusterol. A sinking feeling went through March. He hadn't enjoyed his first visit to Rusterol, and he doubted he would enjoy the second. Am I the right man for this assignment, sir? said March. I think I would stand out rather noticeably on Rusterol. Like a sore thumb to quote the ancient cliché, said Censor, his voice drier than normal. Fortunately, we have some advantages. Reimer's passport says he comes from Rykov City on Rusterol. Rykov City is the chief spaceport on Rusterol, and most of the commercial traffic to and from the planet is routed through there. Additionally, the Silent Order branch chief is one of our more effective Sigma operatives and has maintained a strong organization in Rykov City. I don't think I've met him, sir, said March. In this case, her, said Censor. The branch chief in Rykov City is a woman named Jacqueline Tolox. As you already know, the native-born population on Rusterol is divided into two social classes, the citizens and the administrators. Tolox's father was framed for crimes he didn't commit and driven out of his position as an administrator and committed suicide. Tolox came to us for help and has been an effective member of our order ever since. As you say, sir, said March, though he would form his own opinion of Tolox once he met her. Your mission, Captain March, said Censor, is to proceed to Rusterol and contact Ms. Tolox in Rykov City. From there, you are to investigate Philip Reimer and discover how he went from an apparently unremarkable citizen of Rusterol to the machinist cyborg you fought on Constantinople II. All the necessary data 
is being downloaded to your ship as we speak. Do you have any questions? If I discover what happened to Reimer, said March, how far should I proceed in stopping it? You are an alpha operative of the Silent Order, said Censor. That would not have happened if we did not have faith in your judgment. Nevertheless, proceed with caution. The kingdom maintains a policy of neutrality with the Renarchist Republic of Rusteral, a policy that is at least officially answered in turn. Under no circumstances should Rusteral be driven any closer to the machinists. I understand, sir, said March. That meant he had to keep whatever he did quiet. Good, said Censor. I have already sent word to Tolox, and the message should arrive a day or so ahead of you. God go with you, Captain March. Given the nature of our foes, I need not remind you that we must have an answer to the riddle of Philip Reimer. I will find it, sir, said March. I am certain that you shall, said Censor, and the call ended. March put away his phone, finished his coffee, and paid his bill. He had a lot of work to do. 2. Sundered Cousins March's first task was to find a legitimate reason to visit Rusterol as a cover story for his mission. Fortunately, this was not hard. Rusterol's government called itself the Renarchist Republic and believed itself the embodied of the Renarchist ideal that modern technology could at last achieve the dream of a collectivist society where all were equal, none were inferior, and Rusterl's own factories and farms, under the benevolent and expert guidance of Rusterl's government, could provide everything that the population needed. That was the theory. In practice, Rusterl imported tremendous quantities of food and other goods. A vast river of cargo flowed constantly towards Rusterl, paid for by the Renarchist Republic's lucrative protein algae farms on the moons of their solar system's only gas giant. March had no trouble filling the tiger's hold with paying cargo. Even if he failed his mission, he could at least turn a profit on this trip, though March had no intention of failing his mission. It took the rest of the day to load the cargo onto the tiger, and the next morning, March received his clearance to depart from Constantinople Station. He sat in the pilot's acceleration chair in the flight cabin as Vigil calculated out the course to Rusterl. In theory, it was possible to open a hyperspace tunnel that would take the Tiger from Constantinople to Rusterl with a single jump. In practice, that was suicidal. Rusterl was thousands of light years away, and if Vigil made a single error, or if March made a mistake, the tiniest flaw in his vector would cause the Tiger to miss Rusterl by thousands of light years. March might find himself stranded somewhere in interstellar space, and reckless captains who tried to cut costs by jumping directly to their destination systems sooner or later disappeared without a trace. No, the wiser course was to leapfrog from solar system to solar system, like a man stepping from stone to stone to cross a stream. Albeit in three dimensions with the stones separated by unfathomable distances. March grimaced as Vigil finished her calculations for the hyperjump. It would take 79 hyperjumps to get from Constantinople to Rusterl. Coupled with sublight transit time between the jump points, it would take about five and a half days. Though perhaps he ought not to complain. Thousands of years ago, the idea of traveling such a vast distance in less than a week would have seemed unimaginable. Now it was commonplace. March supposed that if he tallied up the distances he had traveled in his adult life, it would have taken hundreds of thousands of years to travel at the speed of light. Once the tiger entered its first hyperjump, March put aside all such musings and turned his attention to the information Censor had sent about the late Philip Reimer. The more he knew about the man, the better chance March had of discovering what had happened to him. March read through the files in the flight cabin as he navigated, in the engine room as he did maintenance, and in the gym as he lifted weights. Some of the files held background information, history he already knew. The world of Rusterl had been founded by exiled Kalaskaran dissidents. Centuries ago, a man named Paul Renark had created a new political philosophy on Kalaskar. 
Renard argued that the collectivist philosophies of primeval earth, communism and socialism, and all the others, had all failed because humanity had not yet possessed the necessary technological prowess to create a truly classless society. But with modern technology, it was time to cast aside the obsolete structures of the past, abolish the church and all other religions, abolish the monarchy, abolish private property and money, and use modern science to create the ancient dream of from each according to his ability, to each according to his need. Renark and his followers tried to win victories in Kalaskar's Congress, but after that failed, they had turned instead to terrorism, triggering Kalaskar's first and largest civil war. After three years of bloody fighting, Renark was dead and his followers beaten. Throughout the tens of thousands of years of recorded human history, such ideological civil wars almost always resulted in the mass slaughter of the vanquished. Instead, the king had allowed the Renarchists to leave. Their colony ships fled Kalaskar, seeking a new world to remake in the Renarchist image. The Renarchist Republic of Rusteral had been the result. Once the Republic had been filled with expansionary zeal, seeking to expand and export the truth of Renarchist philosophy to all human worlds. After a crushing military defeat at the hands of the Ninevec and two more from the Kalaskaran Royal Navy, the Rustari had remained in their home system, focusing on selling algae protein from their ocean farms to sustain their Renarchist utopia. The Rustari military had fallen into disrepair, and they had not seriously threatened anyone for decades. March tended towards cynicism about all forms of political philosophy, but he had to admit to a special contempt for the Renarchists. Their philosophy reminded him of a weaker, far feebler version of the vision of the machinists and the final consciousness. The machinists, too, wished to sweep aside the past and forge all of mankind into a single unified state. They were simply better at it. He skimmed through the background data and turned his attention to the file sensor had found on Philip Reimer. There was precious little. Reimer had been a full citizen of Rusteral, which meant the government had provided him a guaranteed income for life. He had been a software developer, the job assigned to him by the government, and he had saved up enough to take up tourism. Of course, Reimer could have quit his job at any time and lived off his guaranteed basic income from the Republic, but evidently he had possessed enough ambition to keep him at work. Beyond that, there was little enough information about Reimer. Hopefully, March could learn more from Jacqueline Tolox. Sensor had also included a file about Tolox. Her mother and father had both been administrators in the Republic, but had been framed for the crimes of their supervisors, and her parents had killed themselves in shame. Tolox had reverted to citizen status and had both joined the Silent Order, and had somehow become one of the richest citizens in Rykov City. Given the labyrinthine laws and regulations that govern commerce on Rusteral, that was an impressive feat. The image attached to the file showed a gaunt-faced woman with a shock of blonde hair and hard blue eyes, frown lines deep around her mouth and eyes. The file noted both her intense work ethic and her extreme ruthlessness, remarkable even for a Sigma operative of the Silent Order. Hopefully, she would prove useful to Macha's mission. March passed the trip with his usual combination of maintenance, training, and exercise. On the sixth day, the Tiger exited its hyperspace tunnel and arrived at the Rusteral star system. March sat in the flight cabin, watching the displays as the Tiger's sensors updated with information. He kept the ship's weapons powered down, though he was ready to activate them at a moment's notice. The solar system had nine planets, and his sensors detected thousands of active ships moving through the system, most of them freighters. The Renarchist Republic's wealth came from the moons orbiting the first gas giant, Rusteral 7. The moons were covered in oceans, and the Republic made vast profits harvesting crop after crop of protein algae from the waters. The second planet was Rusteral itself, home to the Renarchist Republic and the Rustari nation itself. March watched as the sensor data scrolled across his displays. Rusterol had nine continents, six of them in habitable zones. The planet's population was 11 and a half billion people, heavily concentrated in urban areas, unlike Kalaskar, 
which awarded small farms to veterans on completing a tour of duty with the Royal Kalaskaran Navy, Army, or Marines. Rusterl's military had gone into decline, but twelve huge battle stations, each one a metal cylinder twelve kilometers long, orbited the planet. Each battle station had a railgun capable of firing a massive tungsten slug at a significant percentage of the speed of light. They were not as deadly as the railguns that the custodian had maintained near Monastery Station, but they were nonetheless powerful weapons, and the reason that Rustral had not fallen to invaders. March steered the Tiger towards Rustral Station, which looked like a smaller, slightly more dilapidated version of Constantinople Station. Hundreds of ships moved around the station, and a steady stream of passenger and cargo shuttles departed and docked. One of Macha's displays started flashing. Incoming transmission from Rustural Station, announced Vigil. Put it on, said March. One of the screens flickered and lit up with a young man's face. Like most of the administrators, he looked emaciated, almost underfed, his lips tight with disapproval. A uniformity of appearance was prized among the bureaucrats of the Republic, and March had noted that the administrators preferred an androgynous appearance. The male administrators never grew beards, and the female administrators usually cut their hair short and disdained makeup. Kalaskaran vessel, said the administrator with a sneer. You have entered the territory of the Renarchist Republic of Rustero. State your identity and business. March had expected some official harassment. Rustral and Kalaskar had not gone to war for a long time, but the neutrality was not a friendly one. Captain Jack March of the Freighter Tiger, he said. I am carrying cargoes to be delivered to Rykov City. Now transmitting identity documents and cargo manifests. The administrator's sneer intensified. Do you intend to drop off the cargoes at Rustural Station for transfer to the surface, or will you be accompanying your cargoes to Rykov City? I'm afraid my contract requires me to oversee delivery, said March. It wasn't a lie. He had made sure to take cargoes that required it. The administrator let out an aggravated sigh. Fine. You had best make sure you follow all Rustari laws on Rustaral, Captain March. You Kalaskarans are nothing but trouble. We Rustari have an evolved and enlightened society, free of the prejudices and irrational superstitions of the past that plague Kalaskar. I assure you that I intend to follow the law scrupulously, said March. Which he supposed was mostly true. If he did need to break Rustari law, he certainly didn't intend to get caught. No proselytizing for your royal church, continued the administrator, and any criticism of the Renarchist Republic or Renarchist thought is regressive speech and might bring you to the attention of the Securitate. Additionally, you will not be allowed to bring any weapons to the surface of the planet. Is that understood? Perfectly, said March. Tolox would be able to help him with that. Good. The administrator glared at something off camera for a moment, his hands moving through a holographic interface. You're cleared to dock at Bay 13 Ring 2. Your ship will be unloaded at once, and an autocab will take you to the cargo shuttle. Acknowledged, said March, and the transmission cut off. He grimaced and rubbed his jaw with his right hand. Likely, the truculent administrator was one of the more pleasant people he would encounter on Rustero. March steered the tiger towards the docking bay. He suspected this next part might take a while. It had taken only an hour to get the ship loaded at Constantinople Station, but it took the better part of a three and a half days to get the tiger's cargo loaded onto the shuttle to the surface. The first thing March saw when he disembarked was a video from the information section of the Renarchist Republic, playing on the wall over and over. It explained that thanks to the triumph of modern robotics and Renarchist ideology, mankind had been liberated from the drudgery of common labor, and the unloading systems aboard Rustral Station were fully automated. Visitors were invited to marvel at the miracle of Rustari technology and to consider taking the wisdom of Renarchist ideology 
back to their respective homeworlds. The unloading drones broke down five times over those three and a half days, and every time, March had to wait two or three hours for technicians to arrive from station control to cudgel the ancient unloading drones back into life. March had expected to waste an enormous quantity of valuable time on Rusteral Station, and he passed the time as he did in hyperspace, exercising and performing maintenance on the Tiger systems. He made sure to explicitly refuse permission for the station's technicians to do any work whatsoever on the Tiger while he was on Rusteral. Given the level of incompetence and sloth endemic on Rusteral Station, likely some idiot would try to refuel the ship and wind up causing an explosion. At last, the cargo shuttle was loaded, and March walked through the gloomy corridors of the station to the shuttle's docking bay, carrying a backpack with a computer and spare clothing. The atmosphere was tense, with long lines standing at each docking bay, and angry freighter crewers shouting at flustered station officials and technicians. None of the station personnel, March noted, were Rustari citizens or administrators, but were instead outworlders hired from various mercenary companies. Which didn't surprise him, since he couldn't see the citizens agreeing to work on a space station, and he suspected that the Rustari administrators became administrators specifically to avoid doing any real work. He boarded the passenger deck of the shuttle and took his place amongst several dozen irritated freighter captains and crewers. Fortunately, no one was in the mood to talk. March seated himself and checked the emergency breath mask he had packed. Given the generally low quality of maintenance aboard Rusteral Station, he didn't want to take a chance with the shuttle losing life support. Fortunately, after the delay getting the cargo unloaded, the flight from the station to Rusteral and Rykov City's spaceport proved simple. Three hours and some atmospheric turbulence later, the shuttle landed at Rykov City, and March and the other passengers disembarked. The concourse outside the shuttle was worn down, the carpet faded. Half the lights in the ceiling were out. Enormous screens covered the walls, each one showing heroic scenes of Rustari citizens building mighty industries or constructing starships or planting vast fields. The contrast with the shabby-looking spaceport and a half-dozen gaunt administrators in their gray government uniforms was noticeable. A scarecrow-like administrator approached March, a thick tablet computer cradled in his left arm, a stylus in his right hand, and a sour expression on his face. March spent 20 minutes answering questions and having his identification documents examined, but since his reason for visiting Rusterall was completely legitimate, the administrator let him pass, though warning him yet again to follow all local laws and not to proselytize in the name of the Royal Kalaskaran Church or any other religion. March spent another two hours after that at a local computer terminal at a spaceport kiosk, arranging for the delivery and pickup of his cargo. Once that was finished, he decided to make his way to Jacqueline Tolix's office. Tolox owned a warehouse and a repair shop for her vending machine business, and according to Sensor, she operated out of that building. Sensor had also arranged for one of Mach's cargoes to be a load of machine parts for Tolix's business, so he had an excellent cover story for visiting her warehouse. Several autocabs were available, but March decided to bypass them. It was only five kilometers from the spaceport to Tolix's building, and March decided to walk. It was a short distance, and it would let him take a quick look around Rykov City and see if Rustral had changed much since his last visit. Unfortunately, it had not. March was the only person afoot as he walked from the spaceport, making his way past the various taverns and bars and restaurants that catered to freighter crewers. The sky was a dull overcast gray, and against the clouds rose the skyline of Rykov City's massive apartment blocks. Each citizen of the Renarchist Republic received an apartment from the government, though to judge from some of the craters and scarring on the apartment buildings, the apartments were not in good shape, and March knew the Rustari government regularly covered up news of shoddy construction and collapsed buildings. Perhaps that was why there were so many citizens and their companions on the street. The Rustari citizens were easy to identify. The administrators tended towards the Gaunt, since Renarchist ideology mandated a vegetarian diet for the truly devoted Renarchists. 
The citizens of Rusteral had no such limitation, and the smallest citizen that March saw, whether man or woman, had to weigh at least 400 pounds. All the citizens drove in their own personal electric carts, all provided by the government, and the steady rasp of their treads against the streets and the sidewalks filled March's ears. The reason for the citizens' universal obesity were the metal canisters strapped to the chairs of the electric carts. Free of charge, the government provided a drug to its citizens that it claimed promoted good health and mental clarity. The drug, nicknamed sugar, was guaranteed by law to every citizen a minimum of three times a day. The silent order had analyzed sugar and found that it was actually a highly addictive euphoric that had an additional side effect of crippling the user's metabolism. As a result, the Renarchist Republic citizens were compliant. Criminal charges resulted in the withdrawal of sugar privileges, disinclined to make trouble, and died early of various metabolic diseases, which cut down on the strain on the Republic's health systems. The citizens drove their electric carts, sipping from their canisters of sugar, but their companions went afoot. The android companions were another guaranteed right of the citizens of Rusteral. Every citizen received a companion upon reaching the age of 18, and every single companion looked like a man or a woman of transcendent beauty, their engineered pseudo-flesh sculpted and shaped and toned. The contrast between the companions and their citizens was astonishing. March knew that the citizens used the companion androids as domestic servants, social companionship, and what was euphemistically called intimacy services. A few of the citizens glanced at March as he walked past their laboring electric carts. Their eyes were dull, incurious, indifferent. Most of the citizens did not look up from their phones or tablets, their screens filled with videos or games. A few of the citizens read the Republic's official news sites. The citizens who noticed March glared at him with undisguised hostility. At first, he assumed that it was because he looked Kalaskaran, or at the very least because he was an outworlder, but then he realized the reason was far simpler. He was the only person in sight who was not riding in an electric cart. Maybe it would have been wiser to take an autocab to Tolix's building. Fortunately, most of the citizens were so wrapped up in their tablets and phones or their sugar-induced stupors that few bothered to notice March at all. He had heard many outworlders express contempt for the Rustari citizenry, but March only felt sorry for them. The Renarchist Republic had taken its people and made them docile and compliant and apathetic. It had imprisoned them, not with locks and bars and barbed wire, but with drugs and empty luxuries and shallow hedonism. March wondered how many of the citizens had ever left Rykov City. He turned a corner and made his way down another street, away from the businesses that serviced the spaceport. Squat, ugly warehouses and blocky office buildings rose over the sidewalk, many of them surrounded by chain-link fences topped with coils of razor wire. Given what March had seen of the citizens of Rusterol, the razor wire seemed excessive. At last, March came to Tolix's address. Her building was a combined office warehouse, with truck docks on the main floor and an office level above. A single sign next to the driveway leading to the truck docks proclaimed the OLOX vending. March walked to the main door, a faceless slab of steel, and hit the buzzer. Yeah. Came a man's voice harsh and sullen. What do you want? My name's Jack March, said March. I'm here to see Ms. Tolox about a delivery. There was a long pause. All right, said the sullen voice. Hang on a moment. I'll take you to see the boss. There was another long pause, and then the bolts in the door clanged. The door swung open, and March found himself standing face to face with a heavy man in a greasy gray mechanic's coverall. Most of the Rustari citizens were big, but this man was big for muscle, his forearms thick and knotted and scarred. His balding black hair had been cut down to stubble, and his eyes squinted with suspicion. Then he nodded and stepped to the side. Inside, he said. The boss will want to see you. March nodded, and the man shut the door. His demeanor changed when the door locked shut, and he grinned and stuck out his right hand. 
Glad to meet you, Jack March, said the man. March shook his hand. Name's Niles Dredger. I work for Ms. Tolox, but we both have the same employer. I do some various jobs for Ms. Tolox for our mutual employer. That meant Dredger was a Delta operative, a local troubleshooter, serving under the command of the Sigma operative branch chief. Sorry I had to be harsh. March shrugged. I've had worse things happen to me. Dredger gestured, and they headed down a concrete corridor, dim lights in steel cages overhead. We've got to be careful, and not just for the obvious reasons. We're always getting junior administrators sniffing around the warehouse, looking for violations and infractions. The little shits need to get some notches on their belts before they can get promoted, and we'd make a good target. He grinned. Fortunately, they come out of the University of Rusteral without knowing a single useful skill, and none of them have ever been in a fight in their life. Give them a harsh look and they melt like butter in the sun. March nodded as he followed Dredger. Suppose the Securitate is harder to handle. Dredger grunted. They are. The Securitate doesn't fool around. But I don't think they know about us. That's the boss's problem, not mine. And they've got their hands full dealing with labor unrest at the algae farms. He grinned. The Republic likes to talk a big game about the rights of workers and citizens, but if anyone threatens their cash flow from the algae farms, they'll crack down, and they'll crack down hard. Punch a man in his wallet, and you'll see where his heart is, I tell you. Profound, said March. Dredger laughed. Too deep for me, I think. I just like punching people. He grinned, the manic cheery grin of a happy brawler. Boss tells me where to punch, and I punch. It's the simple pleasures in life. The corridor ended in another metal door. Dredger unlocked it, and March followed him into a cavernous warehouse. About half the space was taken up with pallets of non-perishable junk food, cases of chocolate bars, chips, soft drinks, and so forth. The other half of the warehouse was full of vending machines in various states of disassembly and disrepair, machine parts stacked around them. Against one wall stood a desk supporting a trio of large flat panel monitors and a pair of hologram displays. A coffin-sized portable mainframe system stood next to the desk, whirring softly, lights flashing in its carapace. The screens and holograms showed the management program for several thousand network vending machines, inventory levels, daily sales, mechanical problems, and so forth. At the desk, scowling at the displays, sat a thin woman in early middle age. She wore a coat and a pair of trousers that looked like the usual gray uniform of an administrator, but the clothes had been subtly altered. The coat was double-breasted and too long, hanging to her knees, and the high-heeled boots were too tall. She had a shock of blonde hair that was starting to turn a yellowish-white and icy blue eyes. Her mouth was set in a perpetual scowl, the deep lines giving her pale face a bitter cast. Boss, said Dredger. This is Jack March. Said you were expecting him. The woman's cold eyes flicked up and down March, lingering for a moment on the leather bracer and glove that concealed his cybernetic left hand, and she nodded. I see. Thank you, Dredger. She rose and extended her hand. I'm Jacqueline Tolox owner and proprietor of Tolox Vending, and chief of our mutual employer's local branch. March shook her right hand. Her grasp was bony and dry, and surprisingly strong. We've got business to discuss. Come with me. Dredger, keep an eye on things here. We might have work to do later. Dredger nodded, circled around the desk, and dropped into the seat. Tolox walked past March, and he followed her across the warehouse. There was a narrow metal door next to a pair of derelict vending machines, and she produced a keycard and swiped it through the lock. The lock beeped, and Tolox opened the door and stepped through it. The room beyond was a large office with a metal floor, the walls and ceiling paneled in an odd, rough-looking material March recognized as foamed to block electromagnetic radiation, specifically radio waves. Tolox had taken care to protect her office from prying eyes. A large metal desk sat halfway across the room, 
supporting another set of flat panel screens and holographic displays that seem to duplicate the information from the warehouse computer. The only personal item was a picture showing a younger Tolox standing with a smiling man who had the same hawkish features and lean build. Her father, most likely, the former administrator who had been framed and forced out of the Republic's bureaucracy, leading his daughter to the silent order. You can take a seat, said Tolox, dropping into the chair behind the desk. March sat in one of the plastic folding chairs. Tolox reached under the desk, picked up a portable scanning unit about the size of a small cooler, and pointed its reticules at March. She frowned for a moment, tapped some keys on the computer, and the scanning unit whirred. Then Tolox nodded to herself and stashed the scanning unit back under the desk. Looks like you're really Jack March, said Tolox. Got the message from Sensor on one of last night's courier ships. Just as well I was stuck unloading on Rustral Station for three days, said March. Tolox grinned without humor. The legendary efficiency of the Renarchist Republic. We can't even outsource efficiently. Just as well that the Republic has eliminated the need for citizens to work. God knows I couldn't hire competent people from the citizens. She drummed her fingers on the metal desk for a minute. You walked here, didn't you? March nodded. That was a mistake, said Tolox. Bet you stood out like a sore thumb. Yeah, said March. Not that many people noticed. Tolox grunted. The damn city could get nuked, and the citizens wouldn't look up from their tablets. But I'm going to be blunt, Captain March. I prefer it, said March. Things get done quicker that way. Tolox blinked, and this time she smiled with genuine amusement. Refreshing to hear that, really. Talk too bluntly to a citizen, and you'll get a complaint about regressive speech lodged with the Securitate against you. But let's be blunt with each other. You're the wrong man for this problem, March. You're too fit to be a Rustari citizen, and too muscular to be a Rustari administrator. You're obviously an outworlder, and you'll stand out anywhere you go on Rustral. I agree, said March. I don't think I'm the right operative for this job. But Censor gave the order, and so I came. I'm not in the habit of failing missions, and I don't want to start now. So, I'm going to find out what happened to Philip Reimer, and you're going to help me do it. Once again, Tolok smiled. Direct of you. You did say you like bluntness. I prefer it. It's rare here. So then. Sensor has given us our tasks, and let's get to it. She tapped a key, and one of the holographic displays changed to show a bearded man with the morbid obesity of a citizen. Recognize him? No, said March. He leaned closer. Wait. That's Reimer, isn't it? He had looked quite different when March had killed him on Constantinople too. That's him, said Tolox. I've dug up everything we can find about him, and I'm afraid there's nothing that stands out. He was an unremarkable citizen, in every way. Born here in Rykov City, normal school record, and at the age of 18, he entered the University of Rustral in hopes of becoming an administrator. Didn't work out, so he was a software developer for eight years. After that, he got bored, so he left, went on public income with his companion and his daily ration of sugar. Ever since then, he seems to have rarely left his apartment, and he never left Rykov City. Until two months ago, said March, when he decided to take a vacation to Constantinople too. Tolox nodded, which was totally out of character for him. March frowned. Did he have any machinist sympathies? Not that we know about, said Tolox. We have a lot of machinist sympathizers on Rustral. Oh, the Republic is officially neutral, but several members of the Presidium would like to see us move closer to the final consciousness. But nearly all the machinist sympathizers are administrators. Citizens tend not to get involved in politics. Her mouth twisted with contempt. The sugar helps make sure of that. 
general apathy is a side effect of long-term addiction. None of the administrators take it, said March. Tolak smirked. That's one of the many dirty little secrets of the Republic. Sugar is freely available to all citizens of the Republic, whether or not they're administrators. But to get ahead in the government, you need to be off the sugar. You can't think clearly while you're on it, and it's hard to backstab properly without thinking clearly. Backstab, said March. Tolix's eyes glinted. The primary skill of an administrator. They're not good for much else. March remembered Censor's story of what had happened to Tolix's father. Reimer, he said instead. He was a sugar user. Lifelong, said Tolox. Another dirty secret of the Republic is that the administrators hold the citizenry in condescending contempt. And in the case of a man like Reimer, I'm afraid that contempt might have been warranted. He never left Rykov City. And after he quit his job, he spent all his time ingesting sugar, watching videos, playing games, and amusing himself with his companion. Her smirk returned. A model citizen of the Renarchist Republic. So why does a man like that, said March, suddenly leave Rusterol, travel to Constantinople too, and become a machinist drone on a murder spree against Kalaskaran naval officers? A good question, said Tolox. I don't have an answer yet. Seems the best way to start, said March, is by backtracking Reimer's movements before he left Rustral. Agreed, said Tolox. I've put together a file from our sources. Everything we know about him. She grimaced. Unfortunately, the data is not particularly helpful. Reimer led a singularly uninteresting life before he crossed your path. He rarely left his apartment, and when he did, he frequented the same clubs and stores. Clubs, said March. Fast food restaurants and gaming houses mostly, said Tolox. Do any criminal organizations have influence at those gaming houses, said March. Some, said Tolox. Why do you ask? It's common for the machinists to suborn criminal organizations, said March to use them as sort of mercenary auxiliaries. It is possible, said Tolox. She sighed and spread her hands. I'm afraid I have only so many resources, Captain March. Most of my efforts have been focused on machinist sympathizers among the administrators. But to answer your question, there are any number of local criminal organizations on Rusterol, some of them with links off-world. Most of them control the gaming houses and sell drugs other than sugar, but they only have a certain amount of influence. That cynical smirk returned. Between the sugar and the companions, most of the citizenry have all the vice they need until they die of heart failure. My theory is that this happened involuntarily to Reimer, said March. As you said, he shows no prior involvement in anything even remotely political. It's possible for a man of his age and habits to undergo a drastic change of heart and join the machinists, but it's unlikely. I think your idea of backtracking his movements is the best course. At some point in the last year, he was likely kidnapped and had his implants installed, and if we can find where that happened, then we'll solve the mystery. Tolox nodded. Then you think Reimer wasn't aware of what happened to him? Probably not, said March. Sensor said that Reimer's implants were in a quantum state. Likely he could transform between the form of a standard human and the battle form that I fought on Constantinople II. He might not have even realized what was going on. He didn't seem lucid when I encountered him. God, said Tolox, leaning back in her chair. That's a disturbing thought, March. Dealing with machinist agents is bad enough. But the machinists don't usually send their drones to make a mess. Too obvious. Her eyes flicked to his gloved left hand. Except for the iron hands. But transforming someone into a drone without their knowledge, it's like something out of a bad video drama, isn't it? She raked a hand through her ragged hair. It's something the Republic would do if it was competent enough to manage it. It would, said March. The machinists 
think renarchism is just an earlier, less evolved form of their ideology. Maybe every government like the Republic either collapses or turns into something like the final consciousness. Her smile was bitter. I think Rustral will collapse and end up conquered by the final consciousness. The only thing that keeps the government afloat is the algae harvests from the moons of Rustral 7. That pays for everything. The sugar, the government, what's left of the military, the Securitate. But they've been over-farming the oceans for decades. The nitrogen level is rising by a tenth of a percent every year. When it gets high enough, it will kill off the algae, the harvest will stop, and the government will collapse. Forty years? Fifty. That's how long Rustral has. That's beyond my pay grade, said March. I'm here to find out what happened to Rhymer. Right, said Tolox. I'll send Dredger with you. He's a steady man. Good in a fight and keeps his mouth shut. His day job is doing maintenance on my vending machines, so he already has an excellent cover story for driving around Rykov City. He'll set you up with whatever equipment you need. She got to her feet. Good luck, Captain March. Hopefully I won't need it, said March, and they left her office and went to join Dredger. 3. Gambling Debts To judge from his van, Niles Dredger was used to this kind of thing. His vehicle looked like a typical windowless repair van, long and painted gray with the Tolox vending logo on the side. Within the van was a small portable workshop containing tools and a collection of spare parts for vending machines. Behind the cabinets holding spare parts and tools were hidden compartments containing the various items an operative of the silent order might find useful. No plasma weaponry, I'm afraid, said Dredger. March stood with him inside the warehouse's truck dock. Dredger had opened one of his van's hidden storage compartments and was sifting through the gear inside. The Securitate doesn't care about locally manufactured kinetic firearms, but if you get caught with a plasma weapon, you go to prison for a long time. Those don't look locally manufactured, said March, considering the selection of chunky black guns Dredger had produced. Hell no, said Dredger. Anything manufactured on Rustoral is worth less than its raw materials. I made all these myself with an assembly printer. So I suppose they're still locally made, technically speaking. March selected a heavy plastic pistol with an 11-round magazine, nodded, and tucked it and some spare magazines into his coat. He also took some other tools, a lockpicking gun, a sensor detector, and a few other useful items. Ready? Yeah, said March. He climbed into the van and Dredger started the engine. The vehicle gave off a grating mechanical whine perhaps from poor maintenance, or more likely from maintenance done with low-quality Rustari parts. Dredger backed the van out of the truck dock, turned around, took them to the street. March watched traffic as Dredger drove from the warehouses near the spaceport toward the grim monoliths of the city's residential towers. Most of the vehicles on the roads were service vans or trucks hauling goods. Buses drove past wider than usual to accommodate the citizens' electric carts and their android companions. The sidewalks were full of citizens and their companions. The citizens all wore the same drab tent-like coveralls, while their companions wore a variety of colorful, tight-fitting, and usually skimpy outfits. Yeah, said Dredger, the Rusties are a hell of a sight, aren't they? Like looking at horses that have never run a minute in their lives. You're not Rustari, said March. Nah, said Dredger. Came from a farm colony way out near Mercator. Dad wanted me to marry the neighbor's daughter to get her father's land. Course the daughter made the typical female citizen of Rustaral look like a beauty, and she had a temper to match. Got off world at the first chance I could get, and I've been bouncing around ever since. Right, said March. Based on some of those tattoos on his arms, some of Dredger's work experience had been with pirate gangs. March wondered how he had wound up on Rustaral. But local branch chiefs had wide latitude to choose their own Delta operatives, 
and a man who had been part of a pirate gang would know how to handle himself in a fight. But I like it here. Dredger grinned as he passed a bus. By local standards, I'm downright handsome. Especially to the administrator women. Rough men are rare here, so they've got a taste for a fellow like me. Forbidden fruit and all that. All the women I want, so long as I'm not too picky. Of course, you have to handle them carefully, else they'll complain to the Securitate that you're politically regressive and showing counter renarchist tendencies. He snorted. Course, if they take a hit or two of the sugar, not much bothers them at all. Though most administrators stay away from the sugar. But they drink like fish, let me tell you. You don't use the sugar, said March. Hell no, said Dredger. Stuff rots your brains. A man in our line of work needs to keep his wits sharp. He slowed down and made a right turn, driving down a street lined with massive apartment towers on either side. March checked the address and saw Philip Reimer's apartment tower on the left. According to Tolix's information, Reimer had lived on the 19th floor of the building. Dredger stopped in front of the no parking signs along the curb. Wait a moment, said Dredger. I need to bribe the building manager not to make trouble for us. He reached behind his seat and picked up a bottle of liquor. Also, to switch off the cameras on the 19th floor due to a technical malfunction. March frowned. That will leave a trail. Wouldn't it be better to sneak in? Dredger grinned again. It is the Rustari way, my friend. The building manager is a low-level administrator and bored out of his skull. If we don't pay him his bribe, he'll report us to the Securitate for whatever nonsense he can think of. If we pay him his bribe, we can do whatever we want so long as we don't get him in trouble with his superiors. And he'll shut off the cameras on the 19th floor, said March. Now you're getting it, said Dredger. He also picked up a package of beef jerky. Evidently, the building's manager had specific tastes in bribes. Pity equipment malfunctions are so common here. He disappeared into the tower's lobby. Five minutes later, he returned with a disgusted expression on his face. It didn't go well, said March, getting out of the van. I pay too much, said Dredger. The security camera system in this building has been down for the last three years. They're waiting on parts. Come on. They walked into the lobby. When the building had first been constructed, the lobby had been a fine example of Rustarel's industrial aesthetic. A mural filled one wall, showing Rustari workers laboring in their factories and Rustari farmers in their fields, all of them looking joyful and focused while Paul Renark looked on with approval. Things had gone downhill since then. Half the lobby's lights were out, and the mural was cracked and peeling. Bags of garbage sat piled up against the walls, and the air smelled of rot and wet carpets. A Rustari woman sat in her electric cart near the manager's office, the tube of a sugar canister in her mouth, as she hummed to herself. There was no graffiti, though March suspected that most of the citizens could not work up the energy for active destruction. Elevator, said Dredger, gesturing at the row of dented metal doors on the far wall. March considered the general maintenance standards of Rusterol. Stairs. Dredger grunted in annoyance. Bet you're one of those irritating fellows who exercises for fun. Beats taking sugar, said March, pushing open the stairwell door. No argument there. They climbed to the 19th floor. The stairs were far cleaner than the lobby, likely because so few of the citizens ever used them. On every landing, windows looked over the street and the surrounding apartment towers. Dredger was wheezing a bit by the time they reached the 19th floor, though he didn't complain. The corridor was deserted. From behind apartment doors came music or the sound of loud voices, likely entertainment videos streamed over the network. March came to Reimer's apartment door and listened. There was nothing but silence on the other side. I'll go first, said March, removing the lockpicking gun from the interior pocket of his coat. If anything's waiting for us, 
I'll have a better chance of dealing with it. Won't argue with that, said Dredger. I'll keep lookout. March went to work on the lock. Like nearly everything else on Rusteral, the quality was shoddy, and it only took the lockpicking gun three tries to undo the tumblers. March put away the lock gun, drew the printed plastic pistol, and pushed open the door, raising the gun to cover the door. Nothing moved, and no one raised the alarm. They both took a moment to don gloves and pull ski masks over their faces, which would prevent them from leaving fingerprints and hair. March stepped into the apartment, and Dredger followed him, closing the door behind them. It would have been useful for Dredger to keep watch outside, but an apartment door standing open would likely draw unwanted attention, even here. March scanned the apartment, and the first thing that caught his notice was the smell. It wasn't pleasant, and it was a mixture of rotting garbage, cheap microwaved food, and body odor. March wondered if Reimer had ever cleaned once during his years here. Admittedly, that did not seem like the behavior of a man who would travel thousands of light years to murder Kalaskar and junior officers. Guess our boy Reimer never bothered to clean up, said Dredger, his disgust plain. The ski mask made him look even more thuggish than usual. No, said March, and he walked into the living room. Moldering chaos dominated the room. The only light came from a pair of grimy windows overlooking the street below. The three main pieces of furniture were a couch, a massive wall-mounted monitor, and a cheap plastic desk holding a computer that looked as if it had been optimized for gaming. Both end tables next to the couch overflowed with empty plastic food containers, no doubt the source of the rotting smell. Dozens of empty cans of beer and energy drinks littered the desk and had fallen to the floor in small piles. A naked, headless corpse stood in the corner. Mach's gun shifted in its direction before his brain caught up with his hand. Reimer's companion, said Dredger. Yeah, said March. I was wondering what had happened to it. The companion was female, its artificial body shaped like an exaggerated female form. The designers had gone into great detail on various portions of its anatomy. Someone had ripped off the companion's head, and it lay at the android's feet, eyes gazing at the ceiling. A tangled nest of wires and plastic cables dangled from the stump of the neck, along with the glistening synthetic muscles. A score of slashes marked the simulated flesh, as if the companion had been whipped with steel cables. Or metal legs like those that March had seen jutting from Reimer's sides. God, muttered Dredger. Looks like our boy had some anger issues. How hard would it be to rip off a companion's head, said March. Really hard, said Dredger. They've got a metal and carbon fiber skeleton. Normal human strength shouldn't be able to do it. Reimer must have transformed here at least once, said March. Had there been witnesses? Let's check the bedroom. Reimer's bedroom was as much of a stinking mess as his living room. Discarded clothes carpeted the floor. March wondered if Reimer had ever done laundry, though no doubt the building's laundry machines had been down for maintenance for years. More empty food containers and beverage cans stood clustered on the dresser and the nightstand, and next to the bed stood half a hundred empty metal canisters, some of them with a dried grayish-white sludge still coating the interior. Empty sugar canisters. Good God, said Dredger. What did he get up to with his companion in here? The bed had been shredded. The blankets had been torn to tatters, and something had carved deep slashes into the mattress. March stepped around a pile of dirty laundry and looked at the wall over the bed. The paint had been slashed and scratched as well. It wasn't his companion, said March. And he ripped off his companion's head as well. When I killed Reimer, he had cybernetic limbs that looked like metal spider legs coming out of his sides. March pointed at the bed. He must have transformed here. Transformed, said Dredger. The scientists think his cybernetic implants were in a quantum state, said March. That meant he could shift between a cybernetic form and a more normal human appearance. The implants wouldn't even show up on a security scan. Never heard of technology that can do that, said Dredger. 
Not many people have, said March, thinking of the great elder ones and their relics. So, said Dredger, where does a fine, upstanding Rustari citizen like Reimer get technology like that? I don't know, said March. But none of his behavior matched that of a trained, covert operative. I think he was just a dupe and had the implants installed without his knowledge. Dredger snorted. That's major surgery. How does someone get cybernetic implants installed without realizing it? With a lot of drugs, said March. But the machinists hadn't used drugs on March when they had converted him into an iron hand. No, he had been awake and screaming for the entire. He pushed aside the thought. What next, said Dredger. We backtrack Mr. Reimer's activities, said March. He did a perfunctory search of the bedroom and the attached bathroom, but aside from a variety of mold and a toilet that had never been cleaned, he found nothing useful. March walked back to the living room and sat down, powering on Reimer's computer. The screen came to life, and the first thing that March saw was a remarkably flexible naked woman performing a yoga pose. Reimer's desktop image, no doubt. Icons for various video games littered the desktop, and March opened Reimer's message application. Something chimed next to Reimer's computer. That's a phone, said Dredger. Yeah, said March, pushing aside some empty food wrappers. There was indeed a phone plugged into the computer. A charging icon appeared on the phone's display. He's been gone long enough that the capacitors went flat. The phone started charging when I powered up the computer. He slid the phone to the edge of the desk. Go through that and see if you can find anything useful. Dredger grunted, sat down and picked up the phone. Let's see, looks like he didn't bother to encrypt this properly. He tapped at the phone for a bit. He's using 93% of the internal storage. Video files. Ha. Huh. Three guesses as to what kind of videos. I wouldn't take that bet, said March, scrolling through the messages. He paused long enough to plug a blocky black device into the computer. It chirped a few times, and then blue lights began flashing on its side. The device would capture the contents of Reimer's computer, and March could take them back for analysis. Tolox had other operatives who could go over the information closely and look for anything useful. Idiot, muttered Dredger, shaking his head. Left his banking app open. Suppose it would be helpful if he suddenly received large sums from mysterious sources. That's how this sort of thing usually works, said March, scrolling through the messages. Unfortunately, that did not appear to be the case this time. Reimer had received statements from the Central Bank of Rusterol in his messages, and the statements looked utterly unremarkable. His only source of income was the money he received every month from the Renarchist government due to his status as a citizen, along with his monthly allowance of sugar, and Reimer spent most of his money on food, drink, and video games. March frowned, looking at the more recent messages. A new expense had come into Reimer's life. Devereaux's video parlor, said March. Yeah, said Dredger. I see that on his banking app. Looks like our boy made some new friends before he turned into a cybernetic spider. What is a video parlor, said March. Based on the companions and Reimer's desktop images, March suspected it would probably be something banned as grossly offensive to public morals on Kalaskar. Video games, said Dredger. Hey, said March. It's kind of like a bar or a club, said Dredger. People get together, get drunk and eat junk food, and place wagers on video games. Really, said March. He'd never heard of that, and the idea held little appeal to him. The thought of holding a controller and mashing buttons for hours on end was not the sort of thing he enjoyed, and he wouldn't enjoy watching someone else do it. Yeah, said Dredger. He warmed to the topic. Every world has its own sport, right? They're mad for soccer on Kalaskar and a bunch of other worlds. Football and basketball, some other places. Hell, even the Kesrudites have gladiatorial games. 
but can you see the average Rustari citizen running up and down a soccer field? No, said March. Dredger bobbed his head. The national sport here is video games. The big one is Renarchus Tiro. First-person shooter, and you run around mazes and industrial sites or whatever, shooting regressives and counter-revolutionaries. The top players make big money and endorsements and get special privileges from the government. He leaned forward. You know, I used to be globally ranked at Renarchus Tiro. You have to be in the top 5,000 players to do that. Really, said March again. What were you ranked? Dredger laughed. Number 4,997. Not a lot of endorsement money at that level, let me tell you. Devereaux's video parlor, said March. It's like a sports bar, yeah. People go there and place bets on the gaming tournaments. And get drunk in the process, said Dredger, looking back at Reimer's phone. Looks like our friend really got into organized gaming about six months ago, seems like. Started going to Devereaux's every week and placing bets. I don't know anything about organized video gaming tournaments, said March. But I do know that wherever there is gambling on organized sports, there is organized crime. Oh yeah. You're catching on to the way things work here, said Dredger. All the gaming leagues are crooked as a bent screw. So long as the Securitate Commissars get their cut, they look the other way. Maurice Devereaux is one of the big fish. He owns the club and fixes some of the Renarchus Tiro tournaments. He's also got his fingers in a dozen other illegal pies, smuggling and drugs and occasional kidnapping and human trafficking, that kind of thing. Kidnapping, said March. One of the machinists' favorite tactics is to gain control of organized crime groups or hire them as local mercenaries. He pointed at the computer screen. The messages app showed that Reimer had subscribed to the newsletter of Devereaux's video parlor, which offered coupons and special deals. So Philip Reimer turns into a new kind of machinist drone, but before that, he frequents a club owned by an organized crime syndicate. Hell of a coincidence, isn't it? said Dredger. Yeah, said March. In this business, coincidences aren't a good thing. How far is it to Devereaux's video parlor from here? I want to have a look around. About 12, 15 miles, said Dredger. It's over right on the edge of the industrial districts. Trouble is, you and me, we're both obviously outworlders. We'll stick out there. Organized video game tournaments are the kind of things that the Rusties enjoy, but it doesn't draw many outworlders. Does Tolox Vending have any machines in the area? said March. Tolox Vending has machines everywhere, said Dredger. He rubbed the back of his neck. I ought to know. When I'm not doing this kind of thing for the boss, I spend all day driving around in circles fixing the damn things. Then you're in the neighborhood for a repair job, said March, and you stopped in for a drink. Dredger grunted. Yeah, that should work. Even the citizens who have jobs tend to take three or four hours for lunch breaks. It's why nothing ever gets done around here if you don't pay bribes. Take his phone. March removed the scanning device from Reimer's computer and tucked it into his pocket. Maybe Tolox has someone who can get more off it, but... He paused as he started to rise. A glint of metal beneath the desk had caught his eye. It was an empty sugar canister, which seemed out of place. To judge from the heaps of sugar canisters in the bedroom, Reimer had preferred to use sugar while in bed. March hadn't seen any empty canisters in the living room. Maybe Reimer had brought this one out here to use it as a waste bin. Though to judge from the garbage strewn on every flat surface, Reimer didn't seem the sort to put his trash in the proper receptacle. What is it? said Dredger. March reached with his left hand and picked up the canister. All of Reimer's other sugar containers are in the bedroom. Why is this one out here? Dredger shrugged. He felt like taking a hit of sugar while playing video games. Maybe. March examined the canister and something odd caught his attention. 
All the other sugar containers he had seen in Reimer's apartment had a grayish-white residue inside. This one didn't. The residue was a harsh orange color, almost like a traffic cone. Isn't dry sugar residue usually white, said March. Or kind of grayish, said Dredger. Depends on how long it's been left to dry. Does it ever turn orange, said March, tilting the canister towards Dredger. Dredger's blunt features screwed up with confusion. No, it doesn't. What the hell is that stuff? He started to reach for the orange residue. Don't, said March. Dredger blinked and then grimaced and withdrew his hand. Yeah. Rookie mistake. Running your fingers through an unknown substance is a great way to get killed. March nodded and got to his feet, still holding the empty canister. Let's take this as well. Maybe Tolox has someone who can look at it. She does, said Dredger. Do you think this has something to do with Reimer going berserk? March shrugged. It might. Or maybe he ate too much of something with orange food coloring and vomited into the canister. He frowned. Oh, there are ever problems with the sugar. Or with people tampering with it or undercutting the price. Never. At least not that I've ever heard of, said Dredger. It's one of the few things the government manages to do efficiently. Makes sense, I suppose, if you think of the sugar as a drug and the government as a drug cartel. Anyone tried to mess with the sugar, the government would come down on them like a ton of bricks. And why undercut it or tamper with it? The Republic gives it to the citizens for free. Can't undercut free. Suppose not, said March. Let's pay a visit to Devereaux's video parlor. I want to have a look around. A drink couldn't hurt, said Dredger. March checked through the door's peephole to make sure the corridor was empty, and then slipped through the door, Dredger behind him. March locked the door behind them, and they stripped off their masks and gloves. Dredger led the way back down the stairs to the lobby. No one interrupted them, and in short order they climbed into the van and drove away. As promised, Devereaux's video parlor was a long way from the apartment tower. It sat on the edge of Rykov City's industrial district, and Dredger drove through miles of industrial blocks. Some of the massive factories still operated, the automated equipment turning out goods for the native Rastari population, but most of the buildings looked abandoned and decaying. March wondered how many criminals had set up shop in the abandoned factories. They would make a superb base for clandestine activities. Hell, if this mission went bad, March suspected he could evade detection for weeks in the maze of crumbling factories. Devereaux's video parlor sat in a parking lot next to an abandoned factory so large it looked as if a capital starship had landed on the planet's surface. The video parlor was in a much better condition than the crumbling concrete and metal labyrinth of the factory. It was a long, sleek black building that rose five stories tall, and it put March in mind of a combined hotel, restaurant, casino, and convention center. The parking lot was large to make room for the electric carts of the citizens as they left their cars and rode to the building. March already saw a steady stream of electric carts heading through the gleaming glass doors, along with more administrators than he would have expected. Evidently, even the administrators could set aside their disdain for the common citizens long enough to gamble on tournaments of Renarchist Hero. Both of us are going to stand out here, said March with a scowl. Little bit, said Dredger. But a few outworlders turn up from time to time. We buy some drinks, place a few bets on the games, and stay out of trouble, we'll be fine. You should be able to get a good look at Devereaux and his boys. This time of night, he likes to put in an appearance, maybe shake a few hands and hand out a few drink coupons. That way, no one can accuse him of being regressive in his attitudes towards common citizens. March nodded and got out of the van, checking his weapons and his tools beneath his coat. They joined the crowd heading for the door. Both the final consciousness and the silent order had trained him to remain inconspicuous while doing missions, which given his height and size was sometimes difficult. 
but here he felt especially obvious. Most of the crowd drove those electric carts with metal sugar cylinders affixed to the side, and the men driving those carts easily weighed two and a half times as much as March. The administrators went on foot, and while the citizens tended towards morbid obesity, the administrators were emaciated and gaunt. Even without the use of his cybernetic left arm, March doubted that a single one of them could have threatened him physically. Both he and Dredger quite clearly did not fit in. Yet no one noticed. At first, March blamed that on the sugar-induced apathy, but then he realized that both the citizens and the administrators were excited. The citizens had dyed their hair, and even their scraggly beards bright blue or vivid green. While the administrators all had the same solemn gray uniform, they wore bracelets of either green or blue on their left wrists. March realized that the gaming tournament must have been divided into blue and green teams, and so the video parlor's patrons had shown up with the colors of their team. March expected to find bouncers at the door, but there were none. This wasn't a spaceport bar, and the citizens likely were too lethargic to cause much trouble. Beyond the doors, the video parlor was cavernous, with ample space between the tables to allow electric carts to maneuver. The far wall was a massive window with an uninspiring view of the abandoned industrial complex, a broad dais for live bands or presenters stretched beneath it. Raised balconies rose on either side of the room, with lift elevators for electric carts, though mostly administrators sat up there. Huge screens hung from the balconies and the walls, showing advertisements for Renarchist Hero and sponsored products. Booths lined the walls beneath the balconies, and it looked like outworlders and citizens who still preferred their own feet to the electric cart seated themselves there. There, said March, and he and Dredger claimed a booth that had a good view of the dais and the main dining room. As soon as they sat down, a companion android hurried over. The android looked like an impossibly voluptuous woman in a red bikini, and she wore four-inch spiked heels and carried a tray. Dredger ordered a beer, March coffee, and the companion glided away. Why companion waitresses, said March. Dredger shrugged. Why not? Devereaux, can't find enough citizens to work here. And companions are unlikely to report you to the Securitate for regressive behavior. The screen started displaying pre-tournament interviews with the players, who began sharing their deep thoughts about what playing Renarchist Hero meant to them. Sometimes there were montages of the players sitting at their computers, controllers in hand, as their families looked on proudly. March found the entire thing surreal. He had nothing in his experience with which to compare it. Fortunately, Dredger took up the slack, happily pointing out the various players and their expected standing in the tournament. The companion returned with their drinks, and March took a sip of his coffee, thinking over what he had seen. Rusterol seemed like a world speeding rapidly towards its terminal decline. If the administrators were as pro-machinist as Tolox and Dredger said, and if the citizens were apathetic and lethargic from the sugar, then Rusterol might collapse before the machinists could get around to conquering it. Yet Rusterol didn't seem the kind of place where the machinists would recruit covert agents to use against their enemies. No, they preferred to recruit from places like Calixtus. March knew that well. He had lived it. Yet the facts contradicted what was before his eyes. Philip Reimer had become a machinist drone and gone on a murder spree. Had the machinists found a way to covertly transform people without their knowledge, just as the Wraith devices let them use undetectable mind control? That was a disturbing thought. Because if they had, Rustral would make a ripe recruiting ground. There were billions of citizens like Reimer here. The doors opened, and a large group of men entered. Ah, here we go, said Dredger. Here comes Devereaux. Guy in the center, wearing the black suit. March took a sip of his coffee, using the motion to scrutinize the group of men. It was obvious that Maurice Devereaux had been an administrator before he turned to organize crime. He had the same gaunt, emaciated appearance, and he wore a suit cut like the uniform of an administrator, though his was stark black. With him came a crowd of men with the look of former administrators, and a half-dozen men who appeared to be off-world bodyguards. 
they crossed to the dais and seated themselves at the tables there. It put March in mind of an ancient king sitting on his throne and surveying his court. He watched as Devereux settled in to oversee his kingdom. Those men around him, said March. His lieutenants? Yeah, said Dredger. The types who look like former administrators. Devereux's got a lot of friends in the government. So long as he jumps when the Securitate needs him to take care of a problem off the books, Devereux can do more or less as he likes. The other guys, the outworlders? His bodyguards. Offworld muscle. Dredger grinned. Hard to find reliable help here on Rusteral. March nodded. Let's watch the tournament for a while. I want to see if anything unusual happens. He suspected he would need to take a quiet look around the premises later. In a place like this, the real business took place behind closed doors, while the food and drink and the gaming tournament were just cover, if a profitable cover. Fair enough, said Dredger. If those receipts are any indication, our boy came here often and placed a lot of bets. Seemed to be the only place he went in public. March nodded again. Which means that if you were going to have someone disappear, he'd be a perfect candidate. Likely why they sent him. When he vanished, did anyone notice? He felt a flicker of pity for Philip Reimer. The man's life seemed to have been thoroughly wasted, a useless parade of empty pleasure and empty diversions. Likely Reimer had been out of his mind and had no idea what was happening when March killed him. Of course, that didn't make the naval officers that Reimer had murdered any less dead. Well, if we're going to stay here, I'm going to order some dinner, said Dredger. You want anything? The food here isn't great, but it's better than the crap we sell in our vending machines. March started to say that he didn't want anything. The menu looked unappealing, with every single entree a combination of salt, grease, cheese, and simple carbohydrates. He had brought some ration bars in his luggage, and when he found a hotel for the night, he would just have one of those. Then something on the dais caught his eye. One of the outworlders had gotten to his feet and spoke in Devereux's ear, while the gaunt crime boss nodded. The man was not Rustari, and had the lean, compact build of an experienced fighter beneath his expensive suit. Devereux nodded, and the man straightened up, revealing a hard face with a scar running down the left side turning his mouth into a permanent sneer. March knew that face far better than he would have liked. He looked back to the menu, hoping that Simon Laurie hadn't noticed him. Change your mind, said Dredger. Well, the bacon sandwich isn't too bad. Course, it isn't real bacon. Haven't been real pigs on Rusteral for centuries. We. Oui. Don't be obvious about it, said March but look at the outworlder standing on the right side of the dais. Rough-looking man with a scar on the left side of his face, but wearing a nice suit. Dredger yawned and glanced to the left, then looked back at the menu. Yeah, I see him. Looks like a dangerous sort. His name is Simon Laurie, said March. Or at least that's one of the names he uses. He felt his voice growing harsh and did not bother to soften his tone. He's one of the most effective machinist agents I've ever encountered. I've gone up against him twice before, and both times he got a lot of innocent people killed. Damn, said Dredger. You sure? I'm certain, said March. Well, said Dredger. Guess we found Reimer's connection to the machinists. Yeah, said March, thinking fast. During both of March's previous encounters with Laurie, the machinist agent had been using one of the Wraith devices. Did he have one here? March remembered Sensor's report that Reimer's cybernetic implants had been in a state of quantum flux. Was Laurie experimenting with more technology of the Great Elder Ones? March had only encountered those damned quantum inducers so far, but the machinists might have dug up more of the Great Elder Ones relics. Okay, said Dredger. You recognize Laurie on sight. Would Laurie recognize you? Immediately, said March. Did his best to get me killed a couple of times. 
Is he pissed enough that he would shoot you in front of a crowd? said Dredger. He wouldn't have to, said March. If he's friends with Devereaux, he can have Devereaux send his men after me. We'll walk out to the van and have Devereaux's men waiting to kill me. And probably you. Maybe we should leave now, said Dredger. March glanced around the cavernous room. If we leave now, it will draw attention to ourselves. Let's wait a few minutes until the tournament starts. Then we can maybe slip out without attracting notice, or get out through the kitchen or the emergency exits. It seemed his luck was a double-edged sword. March had been expecting to spend considerably more time investigating Devereaux and the video parlor. Instead, Simon Laurie had simply strolled through the front door with Devereaux. However, that also proved that Laurie didn't know the silent order had discovered his involvement. If he saw March, he would realize that things had gone wrong and would take steps to protect himself. March needed to get out of the video parlor without drawing Laurie's notice. Yeah, said Dredger. Yeah, that makes sense. We'll slip out when the tournament starts. The screens had switched to the pregame commentary, with announcers speculating on whether the blue team or the green team would do better at Renarchist Hero. Meanwhile, I suppose we had better order something to eat. It'll look weird if we don't. Considering the enormous trays of snack foods that the companion waitresses were bringing to the citizens' tables, March thought Dredger had a point. He saw one man start on a plate of fried potatoes, deep-fried cheese sticks, chicken tenders lathered in sauce and onion rings, a 144-ounce container of a soft drink at his side. There had to be something like 10,000 calories on the tray before him, and March thought that was just the first course. All right, said March. I will take. Right then, everything went to hell. March glanced at the dais again and saw Laurie speaking with some of Devereaux's bodyguards. Were any of those men machinist agents? As they spoke, March's eyes drifted to the massive window behind them, to the huge industrial complex rising against the darkening sky, like an artificial hill. A glint of light caught March's eye. Something was moving on the roof of the industrial complex, and he was certain that nothing had been there before. It was likely nothing. Perhaps a bird had landed on the rooftop and disturbed one of the machines. The Renarchist government had made a hash of Rusterol's ecology, but they hadn't killed all the native birds. But something about the distant shape set off alarms in Macha's mind. It occurred to him that if someone wanted to attack the video parlor, shooting through those huge windows behind the dais would be a superb way to do it. Dredger, he said. Who owns that industrial complex behind the video parlor? Dredger blinked. Damned if I know. Place has been abandoned the entire time I've lived in Rykov City. No one manufactures things on Rusteral if they can avoid it. Would anyone be in that complex? said March, slipping his phone from his pocket. Shouldn't be, said Dredger. Not many criminals will even use them as bases. Too many old chemicals and malfunctioning repair drones, and so forth. People might use them for a quiet meeting, but that's about it. Yeah, said March, raising his phone and pretending to scroll through something, but there's someone up there right now. His phone had some useful modifications, and one of them was a camera lens that could pivot and zoom. While pretending to check his phone, March adjusted the angle of the lens and zoomed in on the industrial complex. He saw a metal walkway running along the side of the building, a hundred meters above the ground. A woman in a dark coat stood there, her hood pulled up, sunglasses concealing her eyes. No, not sunglasses, tinted goggles. And there was something long and black in her hands, something mounted on a tripod facing the video parlor. A sniper rifle. There was a flash of light. March looked up just in time to see one of the gaunt men near Devereaux keel over. The top half of his head burned away. A smoking hole melted in the window behind him. For a moment, no one noticed except for Devereaux and Laurie, both of whom threw themselves to the floor. The crack of the plasma bolt burning through the window had been drowned out by a round of applause from the commentators on the video screens, 
but as the applause died down, the woman on the walkway fired three more times. Her shots killed two of Devereaux's bodyguards and another of his lieutenants, and this time, everyone in the video parlor heard the noise. The reaction was instantaneous. What the hell, said Dredger as the dining room exploded into chaos. Those citizens and administrators capable of walking sprinted for the doors in a chaotic rush. Those in carts tried to turn their vehicles towards the exit, fleeing as fast as the carts would allow. Devereaux's bodyguards closed around him, and together with Laurie and his lieutenants, they hastened towards the kitchens. March shoved to his feet, looked around, and spotted an emergency exit near the dais. What the hell are you doing, said Dredger. Get the van to the front gate of that industrial complex, said March, shoving an earpiece into his ear and sliding his phone back into his pocket. Link your phone up to mine and I'll keep you informed. Quantum encryption only. I'm going after our sniper. There was no time to explain, but he outranked Dredger, and the other man only nodded, heaving to his feet with a grunt. March wasn't sure, but he thought the first blast might have been aimed at either Devereaux or Lori. That meant someone knew what Lori was up to, and the woman with the sniper rifle might have all the information March needed to stop Lori's plan. He saw Devereaux and Lori and their guards vanish into the kitchens, and March sprinted for the emergency door. 4. Clockwork Eye March burst out the door and looked around. He found himself in the wide rear parking lot of Devereaux's video parlor. A few service vans were parked next to a pair of overflowing metal trash dumpsters awaiting the recycling trucks, and some of the video parlor's employees escaped through nearby emergency doors. But for the moment, March was alone. Without the obstruction of the massive window, he got a clear look at the walkway and the woman standing upon it. From this distance, she seemed only a black speck upon the walkway, but she hadn't moved since pulling the trigger. That seemed sloppy. A clever sniper had escape routes prepared. But perhaps she already did, and knew that she could escape at will. Or maybe she had someone coming to pick her up, a helicopter maybe, or a low-flying spacecraft. Confronting her was a gamble. It was also possible that her attack had nothing to do whatsoever with Maurice Devereaux and Simon Laurie. Yet it was too much of a coincidence. Laurie walked into the room, and then someone shot through the window. The woman was either a potential ally or a potential foe. Either way, he could not pass up the possibility of useful information. March ran across the parking lot, heading for the chain-link fence that surrounded the industrial complex. There was no barbed wire atop it. March sped up, jumped, and drove the fingers of his left hand into the gaps in the fence. His left arm contracted, pulling him up, and he seized the top of the fence, heaved, and rolled over the top. He landed in a crouch on the other side. The courtyard at the base of the industrial complex had once been a parking lot, though the asphalt was crumbling, weeds shooting up from the cracks. March spotted a door below the sniper's walkway and hurried towards it, keeping a wary eye on the sniper. The woman hadn't moved. What was she waiting for? Almost certainly, someone in the video parlor had notified the Securitate, and the emergency response vehicles were likely on their way. He reached the door and saw that while it had been locked, the heavy padlock lay in pieces on the floor. It looked as if someone had cut it with a laser cutter or a plasma torch within the last few hours. The sniper had come this way. March eased the door open and stepped inside. He found himself in a cavernous room filled with rusting machines and robot arms, cables dangling from the ceiling beams far overhead. Light leaked through the skylights, throwing wild shadows over the machinery. Unless March missed his guess, this place had once manufactured cars. Come to think of it, he saw half-assembled Rustari cars still on the line, moldering along with the rest of the machinery. It looked as if the entire factory had simply stopped in the middle of the day and no one had ever bothered to repair it or even strip it to sell for parts. A good metaphor for Rusteral, he supposed. 
His earpiece chimed. March? It was Dredger. Yeah, murmured March, tapping a button on the earpiece. I'm back in the van, said Dredger, and bringing it to the gate. I'll wait as long as I can, but if the Securitate starts sniffing around, I'll have to go. Acknowledged, whispered March. He spotted a flight of metal stairs clinging to the concrete wall, rising towards the metal rafters of the ceiling and the equipment installed there. March saw no other nearby stairwells. The sniper would almost certainly have to descend this way. I'm in pursuit. And for God's sake, said Dredger, if the Securitate starts looking at the complex, get the hell out of there. You're an outworlder and a Kalaskarin. If the Securitate needs someone to blame for the murders, you're a perfect candidate. If this blows up bad enough, it might even get to the boss. I'll be careful, said March. He reached into his jacket and drew the cheap plastic pistol. It wouldn't have much stopping power, but at close range it would still kill. Hopefully, he wouldn't need it. Hey, wait, said Dredger. Doesn't that earpiece of yours have a camera? I can watch from here, and if you get your head blown off, I'll at least have a video to give back to the boss. March tapped the button on his earpiece again, activating the camera. It was a good idea. In the heat of the moment, he might not notice an important detail, but reviewing the video later would prove helpful. And if March was killed, the camera in the earpiece would provide some record of his death for Tolox and Censor. Though he had no intention of getting killed. He hastened up the stairs, the brutal training he had endured as an iron hand letting him move in relative silence. March kept his eyes on the steps above, pistol raised, watching for any sign of movement. Dredger kept a steady stream of updates coming into his earpiece. The Securitate Rapid Response Team had arrived and locked down the video parlor, though no doubt generous bribes from Devereaux would convince them to depart in good time. Until then, they were interviewing witnesses. Dredger had a scanner on the Securitate's local channel, and so far, they hadn't shown any interest in March or Dredger or even any awareness that they existed. March kept climbing, listening with half an ear. At last, he reached the top of the stairs and stepped onto a broad metal catwalk encircling the wall. Dozens of smaller catwalks led to service gantries where technicians had repaired the ceiling-mounted equipment. It was a long way down to the factory floor. About 20 meters to his right was an open door, gray daylight leaking through it. That was the door the sniper had used to access the outdoor walkway. It was entirely possible she was still there. March took one step forward. The woman walked through the open door, saw him, and froze. The face behind the black goggles was pale and gaunt, and her head had been shaven. Beneath the long coat, she wore gray cargo trousers and a black t-shirt, and part of his mind noted that the t-shirt fit her very well. The rest of his mind examined the extensive amount of weaponry that she carried. There were pistols on either hip, a bandolier across her chest holding grenades and ammunition, and to judge from the bulge on the coat's forearms, she had a pair of knives hidden up her sleeves. She carried the long black sniper rifle and a collapsed tripod. March didn't recognize the model, but it was a familiar design, and the weapon could spit out a plasma bolt across a long distance at great accuracy. Every weapon she had was superior to the cheap plastic pistol in March's hand. But Macha's weapon was pointed at her, and she would not be able to bring any of her guns to bear before he fired. A look of irritation went over the woman's face as she came to that realization. I just want to talk, said March. Inquiry, said the woman, her voice flat and toneless. State your purpose. Something in her voice scratched a memory. Did he know her? No, March was sure he had never met her before. But he had met people who talked like that, usually people who were linked to the final consciousness and part of its hive mind. Was she a machinist agent? Or a member of the final consciousness? If so, why had she just shot at Devereaux and Laurie? Why did you try to kill Maurice Devereaux, said March? Because I was hired to do so. 
Irritation went over the pale face. And since he escaped, I have waived my fee. Who hired you to do it? said March. Pattern Alpha 3, said the woman. An odd answer. No, it wasn't an answer. It was an attack pattern, the sort used by commandos or covert operatives when coordinating their movements or by. The realization came to March in a blazing flash. Or by attack drones with voice command. He threw himself to the floor, which was the only thing that saved his life. A plasma bolt blazed through the space his head had occupied earlier and blasted a smoking crater in the concrete wall. March rolled to one knee, his gun hand automatically tracking towards the source of the blast. Six meters further down the walkway was a thing that looked like a black metal spider the size of a dog. Its head was a mass of optical and infrared sensors surrounding the emitter of a small plasma cannon. It was a security drone. Likely the sniper had set it up before she tried to kill Devereaux, and had only been stalling until the machine could get a lock on March. His gun would be useless against it. The heavy armor on the drone could shrug off small caliber bullets with ease. Already the spidery legs were clanging against the metal walkway as the drone shifted, lining up another shot. But March was already moving. He sprinted forward, and the drone's second shot missed him. Before it could line up a third shot, March hammered his left hand down. His cybernetic limb drove his fist forward with terrific force, and his blow smashed the drone's head, crushing it to twisted metal and broken plastic. The drone shuddered, its legs drumming against the walkway, and March seized one of its legs in his left hand. The drone weighed about 180 pounds, but Macha's cybernetic arm handled that with ease. He yanked the robot off the ground, spun, and hurled the drone like a discus, its legs flailing as it tried to gain purchase. While March had been busy with the drone, the sniper had whirled and fled down another walkway towards the center of the factory. The drone's center of mass missed her, but the legs raked her chest and legs. The woman lost her balance with a yell, her head clipping the railing as she went down. The drone bounced off the railing and landed with a crash on the factory floor. March sprinted towards her, gun in hand, but the sniper reacted with greater speed than he would have thought. She rolled to one knee, yanked one of the plasma pistols from her belt and started shooting. March threw himself to the side. Aiming a handgun one-handed was a challenge, and doing it while under stress was even harder. Nevertheless, if March hadn't dodged, the first shot would have drilled straight through his chest and the second through his skull. The air around him heated up from the plasma bolts, and he squeezed off a quick pair of shots with his pistol. The bullets came nowhere near hitting the sniper, but they did force her to duck and stop shooting at March. The sniper pushed off the catwalk and dashed forward, coat flying behind her. As she did, March saw that the goggles had fallen away from her face. Likely, they had been knocked off when she had hit the railing. March jumped to his feet and sprinted after her. The woman dodged around a corner, vanishing behind a machine jutting from the ceiling. March ran after her, skidded to a stop before he reached the corner, and tucked his shoulder and rolled. It seemed excessive, but his caution was proven sound an instant later as another plasma bolt shot past him. The woman stood twenty meters further down the catwalk, and she had climbed halfway up a ladder to the ceiling. March snapped his pistol up, tracking towards her, but the woman was already moving. As she disappeared through a hatch in the ceiling, March caught a glint of metal from her face. No, not her face, from her eyes, as if she had metallic lenses over them. A dark suspicion gripped March, and he sprinted forward, stopping at the base of the ladder. He edged forward and peered up the ladder, expecting the sniper to take a shot at him. But he looked up just in time to see her boots and backside, which was admittedly shapely, disappear over the lip of the well. He heard a throbbing noise coming from the rooftop. An engine? No, a helicopter rotor. March jumped, seized one of the ladder rungs with his metal hand and yanked himself up. The strength of his cybernetic arm heaved him up the ladder faster than he could have managed otherwise, and he caught the last few rungs and scrambled onto the rooftop, rolling and coming to a crouch, pistol held ready. 
He looked up just in time to see the sniper jump into a waiting helicopter, which took off at once. The helicopter was a small two-seater with little room for cargo and no weapon mounts, likely intended to help ranchers with large herds keep watch on their cattle from the air. March caught a glimpse of the pilot. It was another woman, her eyes hidden beneath sunglasses and her head concealed beneath a heavy headset and microphone, her brown hair dancing in the blast of air from the chopper's rotors. The sniper swung into the passenger seat and strapped in as the helicopter took off, and she looked down at March as she did. He got a good look at her face. It was a pretty face that would have been much prettier if she had grown her hair out. But her eyes held his attention. They were a metallic gray, and scar tissue marked the skin of her face near her eyes and on her temples, making it look as if she wore a mask. And the eyes didn't just look metallic. They were metallic, cybernetic implants that had replaced the eyes she had been born with. If March had been closer, he knew he would have seen that the irises of her eyes looked like an intricate clockwork mechanism. He had seen eyes like that many times before, and he knew just what the sniper was. Or rather what she had been. The helicopter spun away, and March tried to get a look at the sniper's neck. There was no sign of a hive implant there though she was far enough away that he couldn't tell if she had a scar at the base of her skull or not. The sniper looked back at him, and March tensed, preparing himself if she tried to shoot him again. But the helicopter flew away, picking up speed as it gained altitude. March let out a long breath, flipped the safety on his pistol back on, and shoved it into his coat. March? Dredger's voice crackled in his ear. You still alive? Yeah. In the chaos of the fight, March had forgotten about Dredger. You get all that? Yup, said Dredger. Spooky chick with the weird eyes. You recognize her? No, said March. But I know what she is. Shouldn't talk about it over the phone, though. Speaking of that, you've got to move, said Dredger. The Securitate has figured out that the shots came from the factory complex. They've sealed off the main gate, and they're coming through the entrance you used. If you don't get out of there, you're going to get arrested. Right. March jogged back to the hatch he had used and peered over the edge. He caught flashes of light from far below and heard a harsh voice shouting orders. The Securitate's first responders were storming into the factory, and if March didn't move, he was going to get arrested. Or shot. The Renarchist Republic Securitate struck him as the sort of police force that arranged accidents for inconvenient persons. The north face of the building, said March, breaking into a run as he dashed in that direction. Any Securitate forces there? No, said Dredger. But there's no way down on that side of the complex. Leave that to me, said March, dodging around a rusting air handler. Just wait for me there. He reached the northern edge of the complex and stopped. As Dredger had warned, there was no way down. But the northern wall was a maze of pipes and ducts, spreading down in metal lines towards the ground a hundred meters below. March stepped off the edge of the roof and jumped. A massive metal duct hurtled past him as he plummeted towards the unyielding ground. March punched out with his left arm, and the cybernetic limb drove through the sheet metal of the duct. He fell another few meters, his arm ripping through the sheet metal like a knife through plastic wrap. His arm caught on a weld and March jerked to a halt. His left arm didn't feel pain but his shoulder and chest and back did, and he grimaced as his muscles strained. Just as well, he spent so much time lifting weights while the tiger was in transit. He took a deep breath, pushed off the duct, and repeated the process, falling a few meters and then driving his cybernetic fist through the sheet metal. His shoulder and back screamed with the strain, but he went from the roof to the asphalt of the parking lot in less than a minute. Dredger's van was idling on the street, and March sprinted across the parking lot, jumped over the fence, pulled the door open and threw himself into the van's passenger seat. Go, said March, trying to catch his breath. Dredger was already driving off before March had finished speaking. Good God, man. Did you just punch your way down the side of a building? 
Yeah, said March, glancing at the side mirror. In the distance, he saw the flash of emergency lights, but they weren't pursuing Dredger's van. I don't recommend it. Dredger snorted. Remind me to never challenge you to an arm wrestling contest. He glanced at Macha's left arm. The repeated blows through the sheet metal had shredded his glove and bracer, though it would take far more than jagged steel to damage his arm. That's a machinist cybernetic arm, isn't it? March grunted. And you thought your past was colorful. Dredger snorted again. Not like that. You were an iron hand. March nodded. And now I'm not. The arm's useful, though. Yeah, for punching your way out of an abandoned factory, said Dredger. But that woman with the spooky eyes, you said she knew what she was. March nodded once more. Was she a machinist drone too, said Dredger. I mean, a former drone. Someone who got out of the hive mind. Dredger, March reflected, was quite a bit brighter than he looked. I think so, said March. We had better talk to Tolox about it. He glanced out the window. Assuming we don't get arrested first. As it turned out, they didn't get arrested. Tolox was massively annoyed once they returned to the warehouse base. March suspected that Tolox preferred to operate behind the scenes, doing the work of the Silent Order on Rustral through bribes and blackmail and the occasional quiet assassination. The sort of thing March had done, chasing a sniper through an abandoned factory, was not the sort of covert operation that Tolox preferred. Yet March was an alpha operative, free to act as he saw fit, and he knew that Tolox cared more about results than methods. Her sources within the Securitate let her access transmissions from the response team at the video parlor, and March and Tolox listened for an hour and a half after he returned to her office. It seemed that he and Dredger had gotten away clean, and there was no mention of March, Dredger, or Dredger's van in the reports. For that matter, the Securitate wasn't having any luck tracking down the sniper, and no one had noticed the helicopter. Either the Securitate was massively incompetent, or Devereaux and Lori were liberally supplying bribes to shut down the investigation as quickly as possible. Or most likely both. At last, Tolok shut off the update scrolling across her computer, leaned back in her desk chair and sighed. All right, she said. You took a risk. I did, said March. A calculated risk, yes, but still a risk. I don't like risks, said Tolox. She smirked a little. I suppose it's the culture of the Rustari to avoid risks, but we're in the wrong business for them. We are, said March. But doing nothing is its own risk as well. If Dredger and I had waited at the video parlor, we might have gotten arrested. If Laurie recognized me, he wouldn't stop at anything to eliminate me. For that matter, if I hadn't chased the sniper, we would have even less information than we do now. Tolox nodded. You're right. It was a risk. But it paid off, didn't it? You found a great deal of useful information, and we'll be able to plan our next move. Agreed, said March. If Lori is working with Devereaux, then that's almost certainly the source of what happened to Philip Reimer. Simon Lori. Tolox tapped her fingers together. You've run into him before. More often than I would like, said March. He's a machinist agent, and he's been involved in some high-level trouble. In other words, said Tolox, whatever's going on here isn't a sideshow. He's one of their top operatives. The final consciousness wouldn't send him to Rusteral unless they planned something big. Yeah. Macha's left hand clenched into a fist with the memory. He's gotten away from me twice before and killed a lot of innocent people in the process. I don't want him to get away a third time. He rubbed his jaw with his right hand. Stubble rasped beneath his palm. He needed a shave. And recruiting from a local criminal organization is exactly Laurie's style. We can assume that Maurice Devereaux's organization is basically an auxiliary arm of the final consciousness now. 
likely Reimer was a trial run for whatever Lori and the machinists have in mind. All right, said Tolox. But it looks like there's a third player in the game now. The woman who shot Devereaux's lieutenants, said March. Tolox began picking off points on her bony fingers. There are three possibilities. She was out for private revenge against someone in Devereaux's organization. That seems unlikely, given the kind of equipment and support she had. The second possibility is that one of Devereaux's rivals hired her to take him out. The final possibility is that she was there to assassinate Lori. And it went bad, and she hit Devereaux's lieutenants by mistake, said March. I'm not sure, but I think she was aiming for either Lori or Devereaux. At the last minute, one of Devereaux's men stood up and caught the shot. Sheer bad luck. I'm not certain, but I think that is what happened. He tapped his metal fingers against the arm of the chair. An assassin like that, I don't think she would have missed otherwise. Not someone like her. You know her then, said Tolox. No, said March. But I know what she is. Or what she used to be. He nodded at the hollow display. Bring up the video. Tolox tapped a few commands into her keyboard. The hollow display showed Macha's chase through the factory. Tolox sped through the playback and froze during the gunfight on the catwalk over the factory floor. The camera in his earpiece wasn't great, and the image was blurry and pixelated. Nevertheless, it had captured a good picture of the sniper in the black coat. The coat flared around her, and the metallic glint of her eyes was visible. The eyes, said Tolox. They're cybernetic, aren't they? They are, said March. You've read my file. You know I was an iron hand. Tolox inclined her head. This woman used to be an iron eye. Tolox frowned. I know what the iron hands are. Commando, said March. Infiltrators. Assassins. Saboteurs. Experts in black ops. If we're unlucky, Lori brought a squad of them with him to Rustero. But what exactly did the Iron Eyes do, said Tolox. Calculation, said March, remembering. Calculating what, said Tolox with some impatience. March shook off the dark memories of the past. Her eyes will be cybernetic, and her brain is fused with a powerful computer. Her perception of time is different from yours or mine because she can think much, much faster thanks to that computer. Her ocular perception is a thousand times superior to normal human eyesight, and she can see into the infrared and ultraviolet spectrums. March took a deep breath. And because of that, the iron eyes are supremely good at anything that requires perception and calculation. Piloting, prisoner interrogation, navigation, and long-range shooting. The final consciousness uses them as pilots, navigators, and fire control. If you have a group of Iron Eyes linked to machinist soldiers through the local hive mind segment, and the Iron Eyes are directing the fire, it will be a total slaughter. A hundred machinist soldiers backed up by ten Iron Eyes can slaughter twenty times as many soldiers. But she's not with the machinists, said Tolox. Not if she tried to shoot Lori or one of the machinists' local allies. No, said March. I think she's like me. I didn't see a hive implant on her neck when I was chasing her, and I didn't see one when I checked the video. He nodded at the hologram of the fleeing sniper. I think she was part of the final consciousness, but broke away. Tolox waved a finger through the woman's image. It's possible the hive implant was attached elsewhere on her body. I believe it has to be affixed to either the brainstem or the spinal column, yes. It does, said March, but an iron eyes hive implant must be at the base of the skull. The computer wraps around her cerebral cortex. That's the only way to generate the necessary computational power for her calculations. So why is a former iron eye running around shooting at machinist operatives, said Tolox. Revenge. Maybe, said March. Better guess is that she's gone freelance. 
Someone hired her to shoot Lori or Devereaux. It went bad, and she bugged out. Then who hired our sniper, said Tolox. It wasn't me, and it wasn't any one of my people. Two possibilities, said March. Either one of Devereaux's rivals wanted to get rid of him, or someone knows what Lori is up to and wanted to shoot him. He leaned back in the chair and frowned. And that leaves us with two options. We investigate Devereaux and Lori and risk tipping them off that we know they're up to something, or we try to find who hired our sniper and make friends with them. Maybe we can do both, said Tolox. You were right about one thing. That little adventure of yours brought up some useful information. We. Someone knocked at the office door. Tolox hit a key on the computer, and the display shifted to the feed from the camera over the door. March glimpsed a woman in the image, and Tolox nodded to herself and pressed the intercom button. Come in, she said. The door opened, and a young woman with the look of an administrator came inside. She had the same gaunt look as most of the bureaucrats of Rusterl's government, but her skin still had the flush of youth. March guessed her to be no more than 25 or 26 years of age. She had dark hair and wide green eyes the color of jade. The woman took a step into the room, saw March, and came to a stop. Oh, she said. She looked at March, looked away, and then looked back at Tolox. I, I didn't know you had company, Miss Tolox. I can come back. It's not a problem. I can. It's all right, Revel, said Tolox. Jack March meet Juliet Revel, one of my Delta operatives. She works in the Republic's government, but the less you know about each other, the better. March rose and shook Revel's hand. She met his eyes, licked her lips, and looked away again. Pleasure to meet you, Mr. March, said Revel. She collected herself and looked at Tolox. I think I found the owner of the helicopter in the video, ma'am. Tolox blinked. Already? Revel looked at March, pushed some hair behind her ear, and then back at Tolox. I, ah, uh, well, the helicopter didn't have any identifying marks. But I was able to zoom in and get the serial numbers off some of the parts, and I cross-referenced the history of those parts in the registration database. Those parts were sold to Renarchist Aviation, which assembled the helicopter, and I got into Renarchist Aviation sales and tax records. That helicopter was sold to a company that did fishing tours along the ocean, but they went bankrupt ten years ago. All their assets were bought up by a company called Brew Holdings, and the helicopter has been registered to them ever since. Ah, said Tolox with satisfaction. That is exactly what we needed. Thank you, Juliet. Revel nodded, stepped towards the door, and then hesitated. Ah, is there anything else you need from me, Miss Tolox? She glanced at March as she said it. I, I sent that cylinder to the drug lab, and we should hear back from them soon. No, that's all, said Tolox. She smiled, which made her look less harsh. Thank you again, Juliet. You'll find your usual payment in your account, and if I need you again, I'll let you know. Juliet smiled back, looked at March once more, and then disappeared through the office door. Tolox let out a sardonic laugh. What, said March? Tolox raised an eyebrow. Are you going to sleep with her? I don't think it would take much work. We just met, said March. And I'm on a mission. That would be an unnecessary complication. Men always say that, said Tolox, leaning back in her chair with a cynical smile, but they never quite seemed to mean it. She gestured at the door. You figured out why she reacted like that yet? Enlighten me, said March. He didn't like this conversation. It was a distraction from the mission. I'm a little too old for libidinous urgings, let's say, said Tolox, but I used to be young. A young woman like Juliet, she's grown up on Rusteral. All she's ever known are weak men like the administrators or the citizens in their electric carts. But then she meets an outworlder in good physical condition who is so obviously masculine, 
Well, it puts regressive thoughts into her head. For God's sake, said March, though he recognized her point. Quite a few of the female citizens had been staring at him in Devereaux's video parlor. If the Securitate bothered with a more thorough investigation, he hoped they wouldn't remember it. You sound just like Dredger. Dredger's a pig, said Tolox without rancor. A good operative, true, but if I had any female relatives, I wouldn't want him within a thousand light years of them. I am less interested in Ms. Revel's romantic inclinations, said March, and more interested in the significance of Brew Holdings. Tolox blinked in surprise and then nodded. Yes, of course. I'm afraid I'm devolving into a meddlesome old woman. Anyway, Brew Holdings. As you probably guess, it's a shell company devoted to money laundering. The owner of the company is Bernard Casimir, and he is another major figure in Rykov City's organized crime. What's his racket, said March. Liquor smuggling, said Tolox. The law mandates that all liquor sold on Rustral be brewed or otherwise prepared on Rustral. Her thin smile returned. But given the generally poor standards for manufacturing anything here, the liquor produced here is questionable. Too weak, said March. Or it will make you go blind, said Tolox. So corrupt administrators with money and people who manage to hide enough of their money from the treasury want off-world liquor. Casimir controls all the liquor smuggling in Rykov City and all the other major cities on this continent. He has a club he calls the Renarchist's Pride, and it serves the best liquor on Rustral. For an extravagant price, of course. And he and Devereaux are mortal enemies. I thought that Devereaux was involved in fixing video game tournaments, said March. Why would Casimir want to kill him? Casimir was charging him too much for liquor, or so Devereaux thought, said Tolox. Devereaux tried to start his own liquor smuggling channel, and Casimir shut him down hard. Devereaux lost a lot of money, and they've been trying to screw each other ever since. Their organizations would probably fight each other in the streets if the Securitate wouldn't fall on them like a ton of bricks for it. March thought that over. Then it might not have anything to do with Lori and the machinists. Casimir might have hired that Iron Eye to take out his rival. Yep, said Tolox. But you thought the Iron Eye took a shot at Lori. Sure about that. March considered it for a while. I am, he said at last. It was either Lori or Devereaux. All right, said Tolox. We'll keep looking into Devereaux's business, but we'll also pay a visit to Bernard Casimir. She smirked. He knows all my business isn't above the board, and he owes me a few favors. I'll need you to come with me. A bodyguard, said March. Exactly, said Tolox. Can't repay someone favors if they're dead. It. A knock came at the door. Tolox switched to the camera feed and saw Juliet revel again. What is it? said Tolox. Miss Tolox. Came Revel's voice. The report from the drug lab on that canister came back. Come on in then, said Tolox. The door unlocked again, and Revel came back inside. She looked at March, smiled, and handed Tolox a sheet of paper. Here it is. Whatever was left in that canister, it wasn't sugar. Thank you, Juliet, said Tolox. Good work. You'd better head out now. I don't want you to be missed at work. Revel hesitated, glanced at March again, thanked Tolox and disappeared through the door again. Tolox laughed. That girl has it for you bad, Captain March. If she'd had time, she'd have gone home and put on makeup and a dress before she came back in here. March sighed. Can we focus on the business at hand? It had been a long time since he had been with a woman, but he did not want to bed one of Tolix's operatives. Very well, said Tolox. She scanned the printout. That orange stuff in the canister, it looks like it had traces of sugar in it, but it was mostly inertial storage fluid. 
the kind of stuff, said March, used to store inactive nanobots. Yeah, said Tolox. Like if you wanted someone to ingest nanobots that would activate once they entered the victim's bloodstream. Then that's how Rhymer became a drone, said March. He consumed tainted sugar. He must have gotten it from Lori or one of Lori's people at the video parlor. The Republic controls sugar production and distribution, said Tolox. I don't see how Lori could have managed it. This is Rustral, said March. Someone was probably bribed. Tolox nodded. Let's talk to Casimir first. I'll make some calls and set up a visit with him. She got to her feet, and March followed her into the warehouse. Dredger sat at the main desk, watching the displays monitoring Tolox Vending's machinery. One of the displays had switched to an active session of Renarchus Tiro, and Dredger held a controller, scowling as he hit the buttons. I thought I told you not to play that crap on our network, said Tolox, though she sounded amused. Dredger made an unhappy sound. Just as well. He tossed the controller onto the desk as Game Over flashed across the display. The developers totally nerfed rocket launchers with the last update. Assholes. Right, said Tolox. Get ready. We're going to pay Bernard Casimir a visit. 5. Machine Gaze As it happened, it took Tolox three days to arrange a meeting with Casimir. March spent those three days working with Dredger, and they alternated between vending machine repair and surveilling Devereaux's video parlor. Setting up the surveillance proved easy. Devereaux's bribes caused the Securitate to close their investigation with a conclusion of murder by persons unknown, and the government lost interest in the attack at the video parlor. Untroubled by official observation, March installed cameras in the buildings overlooking the video parlor. The abandoned factory complex where March had chased the sniper provided an excellent platform for recording the back entrance of the video parlor, while the surrounding apartment towers offered views of the video parlor's front entrance. The towers had enough abandoned apartments that March had no trouble positioning the cameras. They soon traced Lori's movements. Every day, Lori took a car from a fortified warehouse compound near the airport a compound owned by one of Devereaux's companies. Whenever he did, two cars filled with Devereaux's enforcers accompanied him. March wanted to break into the warehouse and have a look around while Lori was away, but that proved impossible. A 12-foot concrete wall topped with a roll of razor wire encircled the warehouse. The gate in the wall was guarded night and day, and security cameras dotted both the wall and the building itself. March also saw security drones patrolling the warehouse's yard, though they were armed with kinetic weapons instead of the plasma cannon he had faced in the sniper's drone. In time, March knew he could find a way into the warehouse. That said, he would not take the risk, not until he knew there was something to be gained. Perhaps there was a way to manipulate the authorities into cracking down on whatever Lori planned. There were many machinist sympathizers within Rusterl's government, but there were also anti-machinist factions that had a healthy fear of the final consciousness. At night, March stayed in Tolix's warehouse, in the dormitory she used to house temporary workers on the rare occasion she needed to hire them. It wasn't terribly comfortable, but March had known much worse, and the steel beams in the ceiling were strong enough to allow him to do pull-ups. In the late afternoon of the third day, March and Dredger returned to the warehouse to find Tolox waiting for them. We've got an appointment with Bernard Casimir, said Tolox. Dredger grunted. Took the greedy bastard long enough. He wanted a bigger bribe, said March. Tolox shook her head. No. He wanted promises. Casimir is spooked. Hell, I'd even say he's scared. Don't know what's frightened him so badly, but he's spending money like water to get more security around him, and he's put out feelers to hire mercenaries. Maybe his war with Devereaux scared him, said Dredger. Now that Devereaux has got machinist friends and all. 
Or maybe, said March, whatever Lori's up to has got him worried. That's my guess, said Tolox. He slapped down Devereaux once before, and Devereaux's operation alone isn't enough to frighten him. But Devereaux's new friend, Lori, that might do it. Makes sense, said March. Especially if Casimir hired that Iron Eye to kill Lori. That's one of the things I want to find out, said Tolox. Casimir's skittish, but I think I might be able to talk him around into helping us. He's got a big operation and a lot of friends in high places. Many senior administrators like his liquor. If we work together, we have a better chance of shutting down Lori. She looked at March and raised an eyebrow. Unless you've got scruples about working with criminals. March shrugged. Depends on the criminals. Kesrudite slavers. No. A liquor smuggler. I've dealt with worse people. And the machinists are the enemy. Not Casimir and his thugs. Glad you're on board, said Tolox. I had your suit sent up to your room. March blinked. Suit. Well, you didn't pack any formal wear, did you? March shook his head. Tolox smiled. The Renarchist's pride is a classy place. Be sure to take a shower, too. You smell like vending machine oil. March returned to his room and got dressed. It was a nice suit, he had to admit, far nicer than he expected. Black shoes, black trousers, a crisp white shirt, a dark blue tie, and a double-breasted black coat cut long in the Rustari style. March appreciated that the loose Rustari style left ample room for a shoulder holster beneath the coat, though he expected that Casimir's men would refuse to allow any weapons in the presence of their chief. He pulled a black glove over his cybernetic hand, a common affectation for people with cybernetic limbs, and descended to the warehouse. Dredger awaited him, looking uncomfortable in a similar suit with a red tie. How you clean up well, said Dredger. Miss Revel sees you dressed like that, she'll be out of her clothes before you can say hello. For God's sake, said March, taking a plastic pistol and tucking it into his shoulder holster, along with a pair of spare magazines. Dredger grinned. Well, you can have Miss Revel. She doesn't like me, which is baffling, because I'm so likable. The door to the office opened, and Tolok stepped out. She dressed as she usually did, but she had traded her gray suit for a white one. The color suited her well, or at least made her face less harsh. She had even donned earrings and a bracelet. Boss, said Dredger with a grin. Ready for a night out on the town. Tolak snorted. Don't be snide. Dredger, you drive. An unmarked four-door sedan sat at one end of the warehouse. Dredger got into the driver's seat, and March took the passenger side. Tolak seated herself in the back as Dredger started the engine. One of the warehouse doors slid open, and Dredger drove out of the complex and into the street. There wasn't much traffic near the spaceport at this time of night, mostly heavy trucks hauling unloaded goods from the cargo shuttles. My appointment with Casimir is at 2200, said Tolox. Of course he'll keep me waiting. It's the usual kind of game when dealing with someone like him. You two will need to watch my back. March nodded. Won't Dredger and I stand out? Dredger laughed. Not at the Renarchist's pride. March saw Tolix's thin smile in the rearview mirror. The people who go to the pride tend to have enemies, and outworld mercenaries make the best bodyguards. If Casimir really did hire someone to shoot Lori, he didn't hire a Rustari, did he? Dredger drove from the towering apartment blocks and towards the government buildings and public spaces at the heart of Rykov City. The government buildings, March noted sourly, were in much better repair than the rest of the city. The seat of government had been built in the classic Rustari style, which was meant to convey strength and order and stability, but which instead looked like an ugly squat block of concrete and glass. There were also huge squares gathered around statues of heroes of the Renarchists. In centuries past, March knew, the Republic had gathered huge rallies of citizens to protest the Kingdom of Kalaskar, 
or whatever served as the government's boogeyman of the week. They hadn't done that for a few decades. March supposed the sight of tens of thousands of sugar-addicted citizens in their electric carts would not intimidate anyone. A mixture of disgust and unease went over him as he looked at the brilliantly lit government buildings. They looked impressive, but behind them, the society of Rusterol was crumbling. March tried to imagine how it would end, and no good outcomes came to his mind. Dredger stopped in front of a tall building with the look of an office tower. All the top floors were dark. Light glowed from the glass doors on the ground floor, and four men in dark suits with the look of bouncers stood before the door, eyes hidden behind mirrored shades. It was well past dark, which meant that the shades were disguised night vision equipment, perhaps with image enhancement capabilities. March assumed this meant they had arrived at the Renarchist's pride. A man in a valet's red uniform hurried forward, and Dredger rolled down the window. Welcome, said the valet. Ms. Tolix's party. That's us, said Dredger. The valet nodded. I'll park your vehicle for you. You and your party can go right inside, Miss Tolox. Mr. Casimir is expecting you. Thanks, said Dredger. He climbed out of the car, and March and Tolox followed suit. The valet got in and drove off. If he dents that car, I'm going to be pissed. Why? It's not yours, said Tolox, smoothing her white coat. Will they take our guns, said March. Tolox shook her head the light from the doors to the Renarchist's pride glinting in her jagged hair. No. Firearms are allowed, but not plasma weapons, particle beams, lasers, or explosives. Casimir can shut down any trouble as quick as he wants. You'll see why. Don't start any trouble. She led the way to the doors, March at her left and Dredger at her right. The bouncers politely stopped her, waved hand scanners over the three of them, and gestured for them to pass. One of the bouncers opened the door, and March followed Tolox into the Renarchist's pride. March wasn't sure what to expect. A seedy, obviously criminal place like a spaceport bar. A brothel with pretensions. A strip club. March had encountered taverns and bars of every sort during his work as an iron hand and an alpha operative. He did not, however, expect to find that the Renarchist's pride looked so classy. Subdued lighting glinted off the polished red marble of the floor and the gleaming black basalt of the walls. Tables of dark wood stood in orderly rows, and administrators and wealthy outworlders sat at the tables, eating and drinking. Quiet music played over the speakers, something with a piano and a stringed instrument. A long bar covered the entirety of one wall, and behind the bar, March saw an astonishing array of imported and expensive liquor. The bartenders and waitresses were all female and attractive, and while their short skirts and jackets fit well, and their high heels showed their legs to good effect, their costumes were hardly scandalous. Truth be told, after the grotesquely exaggerated companions or the sugar-addicted citizens, March found it difficult not to stare at them. Difficult, but not impossible. Training and instinct took over, and March scanned the room for threats. Right away, he saw why Casimir had no trouble allowing kinetic firearms into the Renarchist's pride. Two massive black metal shapes stood against the walls, each one standing about eight feet tall. Both looked vaguely human-shaped, though much wider and broader than normal humans. Armored helmets covered their faces, and both arms ended in triple-barreled plasma cannons. Mach's experienced eyes noted the hidden launch ports for grenades and small rockets. Jesus, muttered Dredger. Are those suits of power armor? Nope, said March. Heroth Foundry's Mark 12 assault drone. Plasma cannons, grenades, rocket launchers, and burst lasers. One of those could probably kill everyone in the building without much trouble. Our guns wouldn't even scratch the armor. Though March could disable one of the drones if he timed it right. He knew the weak points on the Mark 12 drones, Weak points that Heroth Foundries had corrected when the Mark 13 came along a few years later. If March hammered his cybernetic fist through the weak points, the impact would disable the drone. But even then, it was chancy. The drones were quick, 
and would likely gun him down before he got close enough. No need to worry about the drones, said Tolox, glancing over the crowd. Everyone's on their best behavior here. Drones help with that, I suppose, said Dredger. Miss Tolox. One of the waitresses approached, a blonde young woman with a bright smile and cold eyes. Mr. Casimir will see you now. He regrets to inform you that only one of your party can accompany you. Very well, said Tolox. Dredger, you're with me. March, stay here and make sure we keep out of trouble. March nodded and Dredger patted his pocket. If there was trouble, Dredger would call and March would serve as the backup. Though if Casimir wanted to murder the head of the local Silent Order branch, inviting her into his private club was not the best way to do it. Right, said March. Go have a drink, said Tolox. This way, Miss Tolox, said the waitress. Tolox and Dredger followed the young woman. They crossed to a door next to one of the assault drones and vanished through it. March nodded to himself and walked to the bar, leaning against it. What will you have, sir? said the bartender, another young woman with a bright smile and cold eyes. Whiskey, said March. One shot. Whatever's the cheapest. The bartender feigned approval at his choice and turned to prepare his drink. Macha's eyes lingered on her backside for a moment, then he made himself look up and watch the mirror running along the bar to keep an eye on the room. He wondered where Casimir had found all these waitresses. They didn't look rustari, and they didn't have any of the telltale signs of sugar addiction. Maybe he had hired them all from off-planet. The bartender set down his drink, and March paid her and took a sip. He didn't know what kind of whiskey she had given him, and he didn't much care. It was good, though. Even a sip burned against his tongue and sent warmth flooding down his chest. He leaned against the bar and gazed into the mirror, watching the room. This was pleasant, he had to admit. The liquor was good, and the atmosphere of the Renarchist's pride was enjoyable. Recreation was not something March enjoyed often. Suddenly, almost against his will, his mind conjured an image of Juliet Revel standing next to him in a sleek black dress gazing up at him as she leaned upon his arm. March shook his head in annoyance and took one more sip of the whiskey. He had come here to do a job, not to daydream about attractive women. He reached into his coat and glanced at his phone. He decided to give Tolox and Casimir 45 minutes. Then he would contact Dredger. If he received no response, then he would take action. A dark flicker in the mirror caught his eye and March turned. A woman walked towards him. She was dressed oddly by Rustari standards, wearing high-heeled black boots, black dress trousers, a white shirt with a high collar buttoned up to her throat, a black waistcoat, and a long black coat that hung to her knees. It looked a little like the suits the administrators wore, but it was better cut, and it fit well against her body. Her head had been shaved bald, even her eyebrows, and a pair of dark sunglasses concealed her eyes. The last time March had seen her, she had been wearing black goggles. The sniper leaned against the bar and looked at him, Macha's reflection in the sunglasses. Up close, she looked far more attractive than she had while fleeing through the factory. Had she grown her hair out, she would have been stunning. March watched her. The woman smiled at last. It is customary in these social interactions for the male to purchase alcohol for the female. Her voice was flat toneless, a contrast from the almost manic glee in her expression. And why would I want to buy you a drink? said March. Traditionally, said the woman, the purchase of alcohol is used as a social gesture to express sexual interest and to initiate the rituals of courtship. She grinned at him. Her teeth were white behind pale lips. On a more informal basis, it could be used to initiate a conversation. What would we want to talk about, said March. Many things. The woman reached up and adjusted her sunglasses, and March caught a glimpse of her cybernetic eyes and the scar tissue around them. This close, her metallic irises looked like whirling clockwork engines. Bartender, said March. 
Another drink for the lady. Same as what I had. The bartender produced another overpriced drink, and the sniper picked it up. She took a sip, nodded to herself, and straightened up. Let us sit together and converse, said the sniper. We can speak in relative privacy over there. She nodded towards one of the assault drones. The other patrons, fearing the possibility of their mortality, will not sit near them. Most humans do not like to be reminded of their mortality. What do you think of it? said March, picking up his drink. She smiled again. I think everything dies. March followed her to the table. He pulled out the chair for her, and the woman sat, carefully arranging the skirt of her coat to hang behind her. As she sat, March took a quick look at her neck. Yes, it was there, the familiar scar of a removed hive implant at the base of her skull. Had March shaved his head, his scar would have been just as visible. He sat, and the woman regarded him, still smiling. What should I call you, said March. Axiom, said the woman. Short for axiomatic, said March. Axiom's smile widened, though her toneless voice never changed infliction. No. Simply axiom. By what name shall I call you? I already know many things about you, but I do not know your name. Jack March, said March. And what do you know about me? Axiom looked at him over the top of her glasses, the cybernetic eyes seeming to spin. I know that you stand 190.5 centimeters tall and weigh 98.42 kilograms, said Axiom. I know that you have a body fat percentage of 8%, that your body temperature is presently 37.2 Celsius, except for your left arm, and that your heart rate is presently 68 beats a minute. It has risen since we started talking as an involuntary reaction, most probably because you find me attractive. She leaned closer. And I know that your left arm is a cybernetic prosthesis capable of prodigious feats of strength, and despite considerable amounts of surgical work, you still have substantial quantities of nanotech in your bloodstream and bone marrow and several remaining implants. All of this cybernetic technology is machinist in origin. You're very observant, said March. But I would expect that from a former Iron Eye. Axiom smiled. And how do you know that I am a former Iron Eye and not a current one? No hive implant, said March. The scar is visible. Ah, said Axiom. Of course. That was why you held out the chair for me. I thought you were just being gallant. Maybe it was both, said March. I would expect that from a former iron hand, said Axiom. Well, she lifted her glass. Shall we drink to our liberation and the ultimate destruction of the final consciousness? I'll drink to that, said March. They clicked glasses, and March took only a light sip of his whiskey. He noted that Axiom did the same. How were you separated, said Axiom. For drones of our level, separation from the hive mind of the final consciousness is a rarity. I was wounded, said March. He didn't want to tell her the whole story. There was no way he could trust her. A family cared for me until I could get on my feet again. They didn't have to, but they did. Then the machinists killed them and all their neighbors for no reason. And billions of other people, too. For no reason. No reason at all, save that they had lost control of the system. For that, they had bombed Martel's world and turned a habitable world into a cinder. Fascinating, said Axiom. Then you left for matters of. She stopped and considered. Conscience. March shrugged. If you want to call it that. Maybe I was just angry that people who had helped me had been killed for no reason. Axiom took another sip of her drink and set the glass back down. I was born on a small colony world. Separatists from one of the major interstellar powers. March nodded. He had heard stories like this before. Small, undefended colonies were often easy pickings for anyone looking for prey. 
when the machinists came, my sister and I were both tested for compatibility. I was compatible, she was not. Much later, I was on a mission where I encountered her again. I had been ordered to kill her, but I could not. She helped me get away and find surgeons who could help me. We have been freelancers ever since. Your sister, said March, and then he understood. The helicopter pilot. Very good, said Axiom. You and Miss Tolox are both silent order, are you not? March said nothing. Casimir does not know, said Axiom. In certain areas he is quite cunning, but in others he is oblivious. Ms. Tolox presents herself to Rustral as an information broker and a peddler of influence. Which she is, said March. She is also head of the local branch of the Silent Order, said Axiom. I have seen it before. She leaned forward, seemingly fascinated. But why does a former Iron Hand work for the Silent Order? A man with your skill set could become quite wealthy. Not quite as wealthy as me, of course, but still. Why does a former Iron Eye become a hired assassin, said March. Axiom smiled. Because I am good at it. Because the scum I kill deserve it, even if I am hired by a different kind of scum. Because the galaxy is a hard place, and two women making their way through it need all the money they can get. And you have answered my question with another. Why are you working for the Kingdom of Kalaskar? They are high-bound traditionalists wedded to an archaic religion. They fight the machinists, said March. They've refused to have anything to do with the final consciousness. They see it for the abomination that it is. Abomination, said Axiom. A strong word, though I cannot disagree. Is that why you are silent order? Revenge on the final consciousness? Or because of your sense of right and wrong? March shrugged. Why can't it be both? Do you ever miss it, said Axiom. The hive mind, I mean. She lowered her voice. The absolute unity. The mighty chorus inside of your skull. The certainty that whatever it wanted to do was correct. No, said March. I don't. He found himself speaking more than he intended. At the time, you can't think past it. Nothing else exists. But once you've been out of it, you see it for the horror it was. Something he had heard in a sermon on Kalaskar came back to his mind. It is only to the damned that their torment seems anything less than intolerable. Ah! Axiom let out a breath. What does that make us then? The formerly damned. Or is that why you fight the final consciousness? Repayment for your torment. March was growing tired of the philosophizing. You say I fight the final consciousness, but I'm not the one who tried to shoot a major machinist operative a few days ago. For the first time, Axiom scowled. That was just bad luck. I had him. If Devereaux's lieutenant had not moved a tenth of a second before I pulled the trigger, Richard Venator would be dead, and we would not be having this conversation. Richard Venator, said March. Likely, that was the alias Lori had been using on Rusteral. Casimir hired you to kill him. He did, said Axiom. Annoyance entered her toneless voice. I do not like to fail. Granted, I failed through random chance, but I failed nonetheless. Why did Casimir hire you to kill Venator? said March. Because he does not like what Venator is helping Devereaux to do, said Axiom. And what is that? said March. I do not know, said Axiom. Casimir himself does not know. In a way, you remind me of Casimir. Oh, said March. He believes himself dedicated to an ideal, just as you do, said Axiom. And she turned her head. But I calculate our discussion is about to move to another phase. March followed her gaze. Another woman walked towards them, dressed in a long black formal dress that left her toned arms bare. Her black hair had been done up in an elaborate crown, 
and jewels glittered on her ears and upon her throat. Her heels made gentle clicks as she walked towards the table, and she stopped and looked down at March and Axiom. The last time March had seen this woman, she had been wearing sunglasses and a headset as she piloted the helicopter away from the factory complex. She wasn't as pale as Axiom and had deep brown hair and brown eyes. Likely Axiom would have looked like that had the machinist not made her into an iron eye. Helen, said Axiom. The woman looked at her, at March, and then sighed. You clean up nicely. So do you, said March. Especially since you flew away in a helicopter the last time that I saw you. Helen shook her head. You were trying to shoot my sister. I wanted to talk to her, said March. To employ the popular metaphor, said Axiom, we got off on the wrong foot. Though since we were not dancing, the metaphor is not suitable. Since my sister has no social graces whatsoever, said Helen, I'll make the introductions. My name is Helen Descard, and you've met my sister Axiom. We are freelance professionals who solve problems for reasonable fees. That was one of the more unusual euphemisms March had ever heard for contract murder. He rose to his feet and shook her hand. I'm Jack March. I'm a privateer captain. Helen raised one eyebrow. And just why was a privateer captain running around a rooftop with a gun? March met her eye as he released her hand. I was solving a problem on a freelance basis. Axiom snorted. Helen gave him a thin smile. I'm sure. She looked at Axiom again. Casimir and Tolox are ready for us. And they want us to bring Captain March. She looked back at March. Guess it's time for more freelance problem solving. Axiom got to her feet, adjusting her coat, and she and March followed Helen to the door that Tolox and Dredger had taken earlier. The door opened, and March saw an elevator on the other side. He entered with Axiom, and Helen joined them and pressed the button for the top floor. The door slid closed. If Axiom actually pulls the trigger on your freelance problems, said March, then what do you do? I cannot stand people, said Axiom. They talk too much, and most of their faces look stupid. As you might guess, said Helen in a dry voice, despite her immense abilities, Axiom has certain social difficulties. I represent her to people who might wish to hire her talents for various tasks. In other words, said March, she's the gunman and you're the fixer. Gunwoman, said Axiom. More or less, said Helen. Though we make most of our money from industrial espionage and high-end burglaries these days. Casimir promised us a large payoff for this job. You were right about him, by the way, said Axiom. Silent order. March frowned. I thought you said no one else knew. Pay better attention, said Axiom. I said Casimir and his people did not know. My sister and I are not Casimir or his people. Helen's eyes flicked over Mach's left arm. So how does a former Iron Hand end up working for the Silent Order? Revenge mostly, said Axiom. Some adherence to higher principle, but mostly revenge. The same reason I shoot machinist operatives whenever convenient. Makes sense, said Helen. March let out a long breath. Do you give customers discounts when they have to listen to you two talk? Helen laughed. We charge them extra. But I think, Captain March, that you and Ms. Tolox and Mr. Casimir are about to do all the talking. The door hissed open, and March found himself on the top floor of the office building, 80 stories above the street below. The hallway that stretched away from the elevator looked like a typical office wing. Neither March's dress shoes nor Axiom's and Helen's high heels made any noise against the carpet. The hallway was darkened, with only a third of the lights in the ceiling on, and the occasional gleam of headlights coming from the window at the end of the hall. Helen walked past five doors. She opened the sixth door, and she gestured for March to step inside. 
The room beyond was large, with a wall-sized glass window overlooking the illuminated towers of downtown Rykov City. Night definitely improved the city's appearance. A long conference table ran the center of the room, and a small wet bar stood in the corner. Two hulking men who had the look of private security stood near the wet bar, eyes concealed beneath shades, their coats failing to mask the bulge of shoulder holsters. Dredger stood against the far wall, looking just as ominous, and Tolok sat at the table in front of him, her expression calm. Bernard Casimir sat on the other side of the table, scowling. If Maurice Devereaux was an administrator who'd gone bad in the world of organized crime, Bernard Casimir looked a citizen who had made good. He looked like he had lost a great deal of weight, and to judge from the sagging look of the skin on his face, he'd done it the old-fashioned way through diet and exercise, rather than resorting to surgery or genetic resequencing. He was as tough-looking as one of his bouncers, and his suit was a little too loose for him. Captain March said Tolox. Join us, please. Casimir glared at March with flat, shark-like eyes. You're the freelancer Tolox hired to take care of our little problem. So I'm told, said March. Casimir snorted. I'm hiring freelancers, and Jacqueline here is hiring freelancers. You'd think that between the two of us, we would be smart enough to pool the cost, but no. Everyone's going behind everyone else's back. He lifted a glass of amber-colored liquid and took a swig. But we got problems. Between the two of us, maybe our freelancers can help solve that problem. What's your problem, Mr. Casimir? said March, stepping to stand near Dredger. Helen moved to wait near the bar. Axiom started wandering through the room, looking at everything with interest, the lights reflecting off her sunglasses. Neither Casimir nor his guards reacted. They must have been used to her eccentricities by now. Richard Venator, said Casimir, leaning forward. Or Simon Laurie, as you know him. I want him dead. Devereaux too, if you can manage it, but Venator has to die. He has wronged you, said March. Casimir scoffed. Let's stop playing games, shall we? I smuggle liquor. If you wanted to play games, you should talk to Devereaux. He's the asshole who fixes games. Richard Venator is a machinist operative. Major 1-2. Some of the senior administrators in the Republic quietly let him onto Rusteral, but I have important friends too, and they told me what was going on. With a subtle hint, said March, that Mr. Lorry should have a fatal accident. You get it, said Casimir. Guy like him, no, the final consciousness doesn't send him to do small shit. He's up to something nasty, and he's recruited Devereaux to his side. Devereaux owns a warehouse complex by the spaceport, and Venator's working on something there. March shrugged. Why do you care? I don't think you're doing this for free, but why tangle with a machinist agent? These people are serious. There can't be much profit in it. Casimir snorted. And do you think there will be much profit in letting the machinists conquer Rustral? He waved a thick hand. People think I'm an idiot, but I'm not. I don't think you're an idiot, Bernard, said Tolox. If I did, I wouldn't be sitting here. Hey, said Casimir. Compliments don't suit you, Jacqueline. Tolox laughed at that. But I know what the administrators think of the citizens. That we're all dumb cattle that need to be managed and herded and kept doped up on the sugar. And maybe they're right, yeah. That's why I got off the sugar and went into business for myself. Hard as hell, let me tell you, but I did it. He shook his head and took another drink. But that's not the point. As bad as the administrators are, the machinists are worse. A lot of the administrators think Rusteral would be better off as part of the final consciousness. I know Maurice Devereaux thinks that. Well, he's an idiot, and so are the rest of them. If the machinists take over the planet, Devereaux and his pals will be the first ones shot. I know what the machinists have done to other planets they've conquered. The labor camps, the strip mining, the toxic heavy industries, the corpses rendered down for recycled protein. 
Rustral is a shit planet, yeah, but it's still my shit planet. And whatever Venator and Devereaux are working on is going to hand Rustral over to the final consciousness. You're a patriot then, said March. His opinion of Casimir had just gone up, assuming the speech was sincere. Ha, said Casimir. If you want to think of it that way, yeah, fine. Or if the machinists conquer Rustral, it'll be a lot harder for me to sell liquor to idiots in the government. He shrugged. Think whatever you like. This plan of Venators and Devereaux, said March. How do you know it threatens all of Rustral? Spies are common as dirt. Maybe Venator's just setting up an espionage branch in Rykov City. If he was doing that, said Casimir, leaning forward and waving his glass, then how come he's tampering with the sugar? March felt a chill. Go on. That warehouse Devereaux has, said Casimir. He pays for it with a contract from the Republic. The government leases some sugar distribution to him, and the sugar canisters are stored there before final delivery. Devereaux's been spending fortunes on other stuff too, medical supplies and chemicals and drugs. He's doing something to the sugar. He shrugged. Hell, if you wanted to kill off the citizens of Rykov City, Poisoned sugar would be the way to do it. Maybe it's time, Captain March, said Tolox, glancing his way, to share some more information. March nodded. A few weeks ago, a citizen of Rykov City named Philip Reimer went berserk and killed several naval officers at a resort. Casimir snorted. That's plenty odd. Especially since the average citizen would have a hard time standing up to kill a fly. When he killed them, said March, he transformed into a new kind of machinist drone. He didn't seem aware of what was happening or what he was doing. I wound up having to kill him. Axiom nodded with approval. When I came here and searched his apartment, I found dozens of empty sugar containers. One of the empty containers had a dried orange residue inside it. Casimir's scowl deepened. That's not right. Sugar residue looks grayish-white, and it gets grayer the older it gets. Yeah, said March. Let's tally this up. We've got a Rustari citizen who turned into a new kind of machinist drone and killed a bunch of people. We've got an empty sugar canister with an odd residue. We did some tests on it, and the residue turned out to have a lot of inertial storage fluid in it, the kind used for storing medical nanobots. And now you're telling me that Devereaux controls a warehouse used for sugar distribution and that he's friends with a machinist operative. Casimir gave a slow nod. Seems like a lot of coincidences, doesn't it? said March. Might be, might be, said Casimir. He looked at Tolox. What's your interest in all this? You own vending machines. Though I suppose if the machinists conquer Rusterol, They'll get rid of the vending machines, along with all the liquor. Maybe I'm a patriot like you, Bernard, said Tolox with a shrug. Organized crime's one thing. Dealing with the machinists is something else entirely. I started out as an administrator, but I got chased out of the government. Despite all that, I don't want to see the final consciousness conquer Rusterol. I hate the Republic and I think the sugar is a crime against the people of Rusterol. But I still don't want the machinists to take over the planet. Fair enough, said Casimir. He finished his drink, set down the glass and leaned back in his chair. Then what do we do about it? I tried to have Miss Axiom blow off Venator's head, but that didn't work out. Suppose it wouldn't matter. If I killed him, another agent would come along and take over the operation. No, said March. We're going to have to shut down Devereaux's warehouse and his operation. Though if possible, March was going to kill Lori. The man had earned it after the near disasters at Rust Belt Station and the Eschaton system and the destruction of the Covenant. God only knew how much more trouble the man would cause if he was not stopped. I am glad we are all in agreement, said Casimir. He reached for his drink, glared at the empty glass and lowered his hand. 
Then how are we to do it? I have some armed assets, but direct confrontation would be risky. The Securitate permits both Devereaux and me some leeway, but that does not extend to street warfare. If I attack Devereaux's warehouse, the Securitate will fall upon us like a citizen down a flight of stairs. March had not heard that metaphor before, but it was an unpleasant mental image. Maybe that's the key, said Tolox. We arrange for an anonymous attack on Devereaux's warehouse. When the Securitate arrives, they realize what he's up to and shut him down. Casimir mulled it over. No. Almost certainly Devereaux has protection from pro-machinist administrators. If the Securitate tries to shut him down, he'll make a phone call to his friends. He shook his head. Either we have to break his plan so wide open that everyone on Rusteral knows about it. Which would not be good for anyone in this room, said Tolox. Or sabotage, said March. They all looked at him. We find a way to completely destroy Devereaux's facility, said March. We don't know what he's working on yet, pointed out Tolox. No, said March. But if we scout his facility, we will likely find out. We would have to do it anyway to plan proper sabotage. If we destroy whatever Devereaux is building, that will likely convince the machinists to abandon the plan. Axiom had been silent throughout the conversation, but now she walked to the window, her reflection in the glass. It sounds like we have the basis for agreement, said Tolox. Our organizations will work together to scout Devereaux's warehouse and prepare a plan of untraceable sabotage. Agreed, said Casimir. We can work out the details later. He turned a longing eye towards the bar. Meanwhile, let's... Axiom took several quick steps back, yanking out a gun from beneath her coat. Casimir's bodyguards reacted at once, drawing guns from beneath their jackets and holding them in Axiom's general direction. Casimir surged to his feet, yanking out a pistol. March and Dredger both drew their weapons, and Tolox got to her feet and stepped back from the table. Axiom, said Helen. What's wrong? They are coming, said Axiom, her gun pointed at the window. I calculate this is a retaliatory strike for the attack at the video parlor. What are you talking about, said Casimir. I... Something moved outside the window. March just had time to shift his aim when the window exploded, and the thing outside leapt into the conference room. It landed on the table, four spider-like metal legs bracing its impact. The rest of the creature looked like a human man, the skin grayish, the veins turned black with nanotech. It was another drone like Philip Reimer. March started to aim, and the spidery drone exploded into motion. 6. Calculated March was fast, but Axiom was faster. Her arms moved in a blur, both hands wrapped around the handle of her pistol. The weapon barked three times, and the drone's head exploded backward in a flash of red blood and gray brains. The drone shuddered, its limbs of flesh jerking, and the metal legs jutting from its side hammered at the table, digging chips from the expensive wood. Jesus Christ, said Casimir, his eyes wide and his ruddy face. What the hell is that? A ghost drone, said Axiom. The implants exist in a quantum state, and the host is unaware of them until they are activated, and the transformation begins. The hive implant, said March, jumping upon the table. Get the hive implant. He had barely reached the corpse when the ghost drone came back to life, just as Reimer had. The brain was dead, destroyed by Axiom's bullets. But the hive implant at the base of the skull was still intact, as were the cybernetic augmentations along the spine. The implants took control of the body, and two metal legs whipped towards Macha's face with enough force to crack bone. His left arm snapped up, blocking the legs, and he felt the shock of their impact down his entire body. It forced him back a step, and he lost his balance and fell, landing hard on two of the chairs. Dredger, Casimir, and both of Casimir's bodyguards opened up with their pistols, 
the bullets hammering into the gaunt torso of the ghost drone. The cyborg rocked from the impacts, though any bullets that struck the metal legs ricocheted off and buried themselves in the walls. None of it did any good. The drone would keep fighting until its hive implant was disabled or removed. Stop shooting, said Axiom, as March heaved himself to his feet. Stop shooting. Are you insane, said Casimir, slapping another magazine into his smoking pistol. Do as she says, snapped Helen, looking at March. Do as she says or we're all dead. March jumped back on the table. The ghost drone reacted at once, two of the metal legs lashing at him like deadly whips. But this time he had anticipated the attack, and he dodged, the metal legs carving gouges from the table. He leapt on the ghost drone's back, his metal fingers grasping the dark metal of the hive implant, and he ripped with every bit of strength that his cybernetic arm could manage. The hive implant tore free of the dead man's head with a wet tearing noise, translucent slime and thick black fluid dripping from it. March fell backward as the ghost drone went into a final jerking dance and then went still, the metal legs locked and holding the dead man in macabre suspension. What the hell was that thing, said Casimir. Were you not listening, said Axiom. I explained it to you. Ghost drone, said March, staring at the dead thing as the pieces came together into his mind. It was a good name for this type of drone. That's what Lori and Devereaux are doing. Sugar tainted with nanobots. The victims use the tainted sugar, and the nanobots infect their bodies and start constructing cybernetic implants. The implants are in a quantum state and only activate when ordered. Like turning citizens into bombs. Hell, said Casimir, rubbing his jaw. Maybe we can use the body as proof, said Tolox. She had a pistol in her hand and she stood next to Helen, who didn't seem to have any weapons. Get more of the administrators on our side. The pro-machinist administrators might look the other way, but if we wave something like this in front of their faces, they'll come down hard on us, said Casimir. We. Idiots, said Axiom, shifting her aim back to the window. Stop talking. March looked at the window, just in time for the rest of the panes to explode. Four ghost drones burst through the glass and rushed forward. All of them shared the emaciated gaunt look of the previous two ghost drones March had encountered. Their skin had turned a sickly gray, and the veins had turned black from nanotech. Each man had four metal cyborg limbs sprouting from the sides of his torso, two from his left side and two from his right side. This time, the ghost drones did not hesitate, but attacked at once, rushing forward in a tide of corpse-like flesh and dull gray metal limbs. March and the others fought for their lives. A hail of gunfire met the charging drones, and the kinetic impact slowed the enemy. Two of the drones died in the first moment, bullets stabbing into their skulls. Death only made them pause for a few heartbeats as their hive implants took over. That was bad since the ghost drones seemed to fight better once their organic brains were dead. March doubted the average Rustari citizen had much in the way of combat training. One of Casimir's bodyguards went down when a metal leg caved in his skull. March seized the drone's moment of imbalance to wrench a hive implant free and fling it aside. The drone went into a spastic dance, a metal spider leg striking March's chest and sending him stumbling back. Casimir's second bodyguard figured out the drone's weakness and stepped closer, emptying his pistol into the hive implant. Unfortunately for him, the hive implants were impervious to bullets, and the drone's legs reached up and crushed his head. A volley of gunfire tore into the drone as Axiom stitched shots up and down its torso, and the former citizen staggered, black slime flying from the wounds. March, shouted Axiom. I shoot, you kill. He grasped her intent at once. With her uncanny aim, she could stun the ghost drones and knock them off their balance. Axiom emptied another magazine into the nearest drone, and March stepped closer and ripped out its hive implant. The drone collapsed, and as it did, March saw more of them climbing through the shattered windows. He realized that they must have the ability to crawl up walls, like insects. If we stay here, we're dead, said Tolox. Out, roared Casimir. Move, move, move. 
He pushed Helen through the door, which was rather chivalrous of him, and then urged Tolox through. Axiom went next as the ghost drones gathered themselves for another charge, and then March and Casimir went through the door. Casimir swung the door shut and locked it behind them. It was a heavy metal door, an inch and a half of steel, and Macha's gun wouldn't have penetrated it. Even a plasma pistol might have taken a few bolts to burn through it. There was a clang, and a dent appeared in the door, and then another. The drywall next to the doorframe shattered in a spray of crumbling white chips, and a cybernetic leg ripped through it. March wasn't sure if the ghost drones would punch through the door first or the wall. Elevator, said Casimir. Quick, quick. They turned and ran down the hallway, the thud of cybernetic limbs hammering against the door filling March's ears. March checked his gun, ejected the spent magazine, and slid a new one into the weapon. Not that it would do much good against the ghost drones. Unless Casimir had a cache of plasma weaponry stashed up here, Macha's arm would have to be his main weapon against the enemy. The fingers of his left hand were crusted with the drying slime that had surrounded the hive implants. Casimir reached the elevator door and jabbed the call button. March expected the doors to open at once. No one else should have used the elevator since he had come to this floor with Axiom and Helen. Wait, March said. We had better take the stairs. I calculate a high probability that the enemy will have sent ghost drones to the stairwell, said Axiom. And not the elevator, said March. They couldn't get their goddamn giant mutant robot spiders past the bar downstairs, said Dredger. If the implants are in a quantum state, said March, they could have walked right past the security downstairs, and no one would have been the wiser. He took a cautious step back from the elevator doors. No one else followed suit. We. The doors hissed open, and there was only darkness beyond. The elevator car wasn't there. A ghost drone was, though. This one looked as if it had once been a woman, though her body was now gaunt and emaciated, the black threads spreading through her flesh. The metal legs grasped the sides of the elevator shaft, carrying her upward. The bloodshot eyes fixed on them, and the drone sprang from the elevator in a blur. She crashed into them, the metal legs sending Casimir and Dredger flying, and she hit Axiom. For all her speed and skill, Axiom wasn't large, and the drone's weight knocked her to the floor. She tried to squirm away, but one of the cybernetic legs clipped her across the head with enough force to bounce her head off the carpet, her sunglasses tumbling away. Her mechanical eyes went wide with pain and surprise, and the drone raised two of its cybernetic limbs to smash her head. Tolox tried to aim her pistol, but the drone was right on top of Axiom, and she could not take a clear shot. March moved, whipping his left arm before him, and he caught the descending limbs on his forearm. The impact rocked him back, his shoes skidding against the carpet, and the drone raised her limbs against a strike. Before she could, March raised his pistol and put two rounds through the woman's forehead. The drone shuddered as the brain died and the hive implant started to take control, but before it could, he sidestepped, seized the hive implant and ripped it out of the base of the skull. As usual that made a mess, but the drone shuddered and collapsed. Helen helped Axiom back to her feet. Are you hurt? Minor injuries and scrapes, said Axiom, but there was an unsteady note in her otherwise toneless voice. But I calculated a 100% probability I would have died if March had not intervened. March glanced at Casimir and Dredger, saw that they were getting back up, and looked into the elevator shaft. He didn't see any sign of the car. He did see another dozen ghost drones making their way up the shaft, their legs clicking against the concrete walls. Shit, said March. We'll have to take the stairs. Behind him, he heard the wrenching shriek as the ghost drones in the conference room battered their way through the metal door. He glanced over his shoulder and saw that they had ripped the door and its frame out of the wall. God, what he would not give for a decent plasma pistol just now. This way, said Casimir, beckoning. They sprinted down the hallway and turned a corner. March was impressed by how fast Tolox, Axiom, and Helen could move while wearing high heels, but fear was the best motivator of all. 
At the end of the corridor was a metal doorway with a glowing red exit sign over the frame. Let me go first, said March. No argument, said Casimir. Axiom, said March. Get ready to shoot. Wouldn't surprise me if there's a ghost drone behind the door. Axiom nodded, taking her pistol in a two-handed grip, her metallic eyes reflecting the light. Normally, March would have been alarmed to have someone with a pistol shooting over his shoulder, but with an iron eye's abilities, it would have been more surprising if she hit him by accident. March wrenched the door open and stepped back. Beyond was a concrete stairwell with a steel railing, and just as he had predicted, a ghost drone waited behind the door. It surged forward, metal legs drawing back to strike, and Axiom shot it twice in the head. Blood and brain spattered across the door, and March stepped into the reach of its twitching limbs, grasped the hive implant, and tore it loose. The ghost drone shuddered, and one of the limbs smacked March across the chest. He stumbled back and hit the wall, but Dredger caught his right arm and helped him keep his balance. March nodded his thanks and stepped over the dead ghost drone and into the stairwell. At once he heard the tapping clang of more ghost drones ascending the stairs. How far down were they? No more than ten floors, he guessed. God damn it, said Casimir. The bastards have us cornered. We'll have to find a defensible location and fight, said Dredger. Insufficient, said Axiom. Jack March is the only one among us who is close to a physical match for the drone's strength. I calculate a 100% probability that we shall be overpowered and killed. March looked down the corridor. How much longer until the ghost drones from the conference room found them? The roof, said Helen. Bernard, there's a helicopter there. If I can get to it, we can get out of here. That's a big helicopter, said Casimir. Can you fly it? She raised an eyebrow. I can fly anything. Stop talking and move, said March. The clanging from the stairwell was getting louder, and March heard the thud of metal legs against the carpet in the hallway. Go. He led the way up the stairs, the others following him. It was only one flight of stairs to the last landing before the roof. The stairs terminated in a steel door that read roof access, authorized entry only, and it was locked. March solved that problem by punching the lock four times with his left hand. On the fourth blow, the lock shattered and his fist drove through the door, and March kicked it open. The clanging from the stairs below had gotten much louder. March stepped onto the rooftop and looked around. It was no different than the rooftops of other high-rise buildings he had visited on other worlds. HVAC equipment stood in a neat row alongside locked metal cabinets holding electrical transformers. At the far end of the rooftop was a landing pad with a helicopter painted in the red and gold colors of the Renarchist Republic of Rusterl. Come on, said Casimir. You've got the keys to this thing, said Dredger. I can override the lock controls on this model of aircraft, said Axiom. Better do it quick, said March, glancing back. He saw a glint of metal in the stairwell. They're coming. Tolox, Dredger, Casimir, help me hold them off while Axiom and Helen get the chopper started. March punched out the lock on the helicopter's passenger door, and Helen and Axiom scrambled aboard. He whirled and joined Casimir, Dredger, and Tolox as they pointed their guns at the stairwell. A heartbeat later, the ghost drones burst from the ruined door. March and the others started shooting, the muzzle flashes of their weapons brilliant in the night. The first drone went down, the top of its head exploding. A second drone shoved it aside and started forward, only to go down under another volley of gunshots. A third and fourth met the same fate in rapid succession. But by then the first two ghost drones started moving again, their hive implants taking control of the dead bodies. More ghost drones burst from the stairs, rushing towards the helicopter, and March and the others had to divide their fire. A whir filled his ears, and the chopper's rotors started to spin. Go, shouted Axiom. Get on board now. We are leaving. 
Tolox, Casimir, and Dredger scrambled into the helicopter's passenger compartment, and March jumped up and followed suit. He whirled, aiming with his right hand while his left grasped one of the plastic straps hanging from the ceiling, and he started shooting. The others began shooting out the door as well, hitting the ghost drones as they tried to get close. Yet the drones they had already killed kept moving. March cursed, shoved his pistol into its holster, gripped the strap with his right hand and braced himself. The helicopter started to rise into the air, but not before one of the ghost drones leapt and caught the edge of the deck with its metal forelimbs. The drone started to heave itself up, looking like a giant metal spider dragging along a corpse. The dead face stared at nothing, the mouth hanging open, blood leaking from the bullet wounds in the forehead. March shifted his stance and punched with all the power his cybernetic arm could provide. He caught the drone in the center of the chest, and he heard ribs crack beneath his blow. The drone flew backward and hit the roof, the metal legs scrabbling for balance. Another leapt at the helicopter, but Dredger shot it in midair. The impact of the bullet altered the ghost drone's trajectory, and it hit the edge of the roof instead. The helicopter slewed to the right as Helen put it through a tight turn, and March grabbed the strap to keep from falling over. The others followed suit, Dredger and Casimir cursing with every word, and Helen sent the helicopter hurtling into the concrete canyon of the street between the high-rise buildings. March saw a dozen ghost drones stop at the edge of the roof, and he feared they would leap from the building, throw themselves into the helicopter's rotors, and send them plummeting to their deaths. He had no doubt that the drones would sacrifice themselves at their master's command. But Helen had accelerated too quickly. The drones would have leapt, March suspected, but Helen had gotten the helicopter out of reach. The building receded in the distance and then disappeared as Helen leveled the chopper's flight out and sent them around a corner. What the hell were those things, said Casimir. He looked at March, his coat flapping around him in the wind. And how the hell can you punch a hole in a metal door? Bernard, said Tolox. I think it's time we had a long talk. Later, shouted Helen. We need to decide something important first. Yeah, said Casimir. Like what? Like what the hell do we do now, said Helen. We just stole a government helicopter. Silence answered her. That's a really good point, said Dredger. Tolox and Casimir had a hurried negotiation, and they came to a quick accord. Their escape had left behind any number of problems. Casimir's two bodyguards were dead in the conference room, to say nothing of the ghost drones they had killed and then destroyed. Almost certainly someone had heard the gunfire and called the Securitate, or at least seen the stolen helicopter flying overhead. And given that there were machinist sympathizers within the Securitate, that was bad. They might decide to kill Casimir under the guise of resisting arrest or some other charge. And that didn't even cover the problem of the stolen helicopter. March had the most experience with covert operations, so he took charge. At his direction, Helen set the helicopter down in the street. It took a few moments of work to sabotage the helicopter, and once they were safely away, it blew up. It made an impressive fireball, but no one was hurt, and the fire would destroy evidence of the theft. After that, March stole a van, and he drove to Tolix's warehouse. They would hole up here while Casimir directed his organization, and Tolox checked with her contacts in the Securitate. The reaction of the Securitate to the helicopter explosion and the violence at the rooftop would determine what happened next. March left Tolox and Casimir in the main warehouse, Casimir swearing into his phone, and Tolox retreating into her office to make some phone calls. Axiom and Helen seated themselves by the wall, with Dredger making a half-hearted attempt to flirt with a disinterested Helen. He didn't try to hit on Axiom. Wise of him, probably. March wanted a shower. The others had gotten out of the fight more or less clean, but March had been spattered with the fluids of the dead ghost drones every time he had ripped out a hive implant. The blood of the drones had been replaced by uncounted trillions of nanobots, which meant they bled a glittering black sludge mixed with the remnants of their actual blood. 
March knew that the nanobots were inert, that they would have been coded to the genetic sequences of the individual drones and couldn't hurt anyone else. He still wanted a damn shower. March returned to his room in the warehouse's dormitory, stripped off his suit, and threw it in the garbage. They would have to destroy their pistols as well since the bullets could be traced, but Dredger could just print some new ones. The suit could be destroyed with the pistols. He locked the door to the bathroom and took a long hot shower. That, at least, was a luxury of Rusteral he could appreciate. The tiger didn't have a shower since water in spaceflight was too precious to be wasted. The sanitizer booth did an admirable job, but it certainly didn't feel as pleasant as hot water. Once March had scrubbed off the last of the crusted slime, he shut off the water, toweled off and pulled on a pair of exercise pants and a t-shirt. What he wanted to do was lie down and sleep. What he would actually do was find Tolox and see if she needed anything right now. Depending on how the Securitate reacted to the incident at the Renarchist's Pride, they might have to get off-planet in a hurry. March stepped back into his room as someone knocked at the door. Yeah, he said, reaching for the gun he had left on the dresser. It is Axiom, came the toneless voice. March opened the door and saw Axiom standing there, still in her black suit. He opened the door, and she stepped past him and into the room. She smiled at him, and an odd sensation went through March. Axiom hadn't replaced her sunglasses, and he could see the band of scar tissue across her face, could see the intricate whirling mechanisms of her eyes. Except they weren't really her eyes. The machinists had taken them and installed cybernetic mechanisms in their place. Looking at her was almost like looking into the face of a woman who was blindfolded. It was an unsettling feeling. Any news, said March. Not yet, said Axiom. She leaned against the wall, pushed back her coat, and slid her hands into her pockets. Her clothes fit her body very well. Tolix's contacts have provided useful information. The Securitate has been summoned to deal with the helicopter explosion and reports of gunfire above the Renarchist's pride, but no reports have made it onto the news sites yet, and any social media posts about them have been shut down. Almost certainly, pro-machinist elements within the Securitate are directing the investigation and will squelch it to protect Devereaux's operation. Attention would be counterproductive to their goals just now. Great, said March. That meant they could not count on any help from the Republic, though March had doubted the government would provide any useful assistance. On the plus side, it also meant for the moment that the Securitate would not come after Tolox or Casimir. Going after a crime boss and the biggest vending business in Rykov City would not keep things quiet. Axiom shrugged. It could have been worse. We are still all alive, are we not? March nodded. I'm going to check in with Tolox, and then I'm going to get some sleep. He started towards the door. A moment, said Axiom. She reached out and closed the door. March looked at her, at the door, and then back at her. I hope you didn't get me alone to kill me, said March. He said it half-jokingly, but he remembered the position of his gun on the dresser, noted her stance against the wall. Axiom smiled. No. I wish to thank you. You were right. About what, said March. The dangers of the elevator, said Axiom. I should have been more careful. Had you not been there, I calculate with 100% certainty that the ghost drone would have killed me. March shrugged. I've been in a lot of fights. Um. So have I, said Axiom both when I was still part of the final consciousness and after Helen helped me to break free. Nonetheless, my instincts and calculations were wrong. I thank you for saving my life, Captain Jack March. The words had an odd weight of formality to them. You're welcome, said March. Suppose you're glad you didn't shoot me at the factory then. I admit it was not through lack of trying, said Axiom. You are a surprising man. She straightened up, 
her hands coming out of her pockets. I wish to ask you something. All right, said March. He wondered what she wanted. How much will you be paid for this job, said Axiom. Assuming we are not killed, of course. March shrugged. I brought enough cargo to Rustral Station to cover the cost of the trip and turn a profit. Axiom blinked. With her cybernetic eyes, March supposed she could see right through her eyelids. But the silent order does not pay you. No, said March. Hard to be a covert operative when there's a paper trail. He shrugged again. If I live long enough to retire, I'll get a pension. Maybe a little farm somewhere on Kalaskar. A farm. Her nose wrinkled with distaste. It's what the Kalaskarans do, said March. Serve in the Royal Navy or the Royal Army, retire, and go start a small farm somewhere on Kalaskar. I do not work for free, said Axiom. I am happy to kill machinists and their useful idiots, but I will not do it for free. She watched him without blinking, the irises of her eyes turning like gears around the pupils. Do you believe in the kingdom of Kalaskar, Captain March? In its laws and ideals? God and the king and duty and sober living and all that. Kalaskar has resisted the final consciousness for centuries, said March. They've beaten back the machinists in several wars. They're the most effective enemies of the final consciousness. Ah, said Axiom. That is why you are an operative of the Silent Order. What do you mean, said March. Not for the ideals of the Kalaskarans, said Axiom, but for revenge. His metal hand curled into a fist. Maybe I have cause for revenge. You do, said Axiom. So do I. But I do not wish to spend my life in that pursuit. Revenge is ultimately a zero sum. My sister and I will make enough money, buy an asteroid someplace, and retire there. She shrugged. Do I wish harm to the final consciousness? Yes. But I do not wish to pour my life away fighting them. I'm not your boss, said March. I didn't even hire you. Do as you wish. What I want, said Axiom, is to understand you. Why, said March. She stepped closer to him, the strange eyes looking up at him. He didn't step back. A former iron hand, said Axiom. There are not many of you. Most iron hands end up dead in the service of the final consciousness. Her voice lowered. You are a rare man, Jack March. Both in the literal and in the metaphorical meanings of the word. That's very kind, said March. And I wanted to know what kind of man you are, said Axiom. She took one more step closer. Because then I would make up my mind whether or not I wished to do this. She closed the distance between them before March could react, and she leaned up and kissed him. He started to flinch away, and then stopped when his brain caught up with his reflexes and realized what was happening. Then other urges outpaced both his brain and his reflexes. Her lips were soft and warm against his, almost feverish hot. Her body temperature would run a little higher than human normal due to the enhanced metabolism required to support her cortex computer. March found his hand settling on her hips and through his right hand felt the warmth of her body soaking into his skin. The kiss ended and she looked at him, her arms curling around his back. He could not judge her mood from her eyes, but the smile looked pleased. You said you wanted to thank me for saving your life, said March. His voice had gone hoarse. Is that what you meant? It is not, said Axiom. I rarely find a man desirable. Helen is the one who wishes marriage and children. But do not fear, Captain March. I have no such illusions. I merely wish to take pleasure with you, to our mutual satisfaction. March said nothing. His training and experience said this was an extremely bad idea. His body reminded him that it had been years since he had been with a woman. His brain was starting to imagine what she looked like beneath the white shirt and the black coat. You find me desirable as well, 
said Axiom. I can tell. She kissed him again. I can see the dilation of your pupils, the increased blood pressure and heartbeat. Her eyes flicked downward for a moment, and she smiled. As if the other indications were not blatantly obvious. We are both physically fit, and I am certain the experience shall be a tremendously pleasurable one. She kissed him again, harder this time, and March found himself kissing her back. He had almost died tonight, they both had. It would be pleasant to forget himself for an hour, to lose himself in the raw sensation and pure physical need. Her hands went beneath his t-shirt, sliding over his back and sides and downward across his stomach. Then her hands brushed the thick scar across the center of his stomach, and cold sanity reasserted itself. He stepped out of Axiom's grasp, and a hurt look flickered over her face for just a moment. Have I displeased you in some fashion, said Axiom. The metallic eyes flicked him up and down. Your attraction to me is not vain. Nor is mine, if that is what concerns you. No, said Mark, shaking his head. No, that's not it. I have a mission. You do too. This would be a distraction. When Casimir hired me to kill Richard Venator, said Axiom, a vow of celibacy was not one of the requirements. But I am an operative of the Silent Order, said March. Do operatives of the Silent Order take vows of celibacy? One wonders how you obtain new recruits. But I cannot afford a distraction from my mission, said March. I am sorry. He noticed that his T-shirt was still tugged up from Axiom's seeking hands. He pulled it back down to his waistband. Ah. Axiom looked at his face. Do you hate yourself, Captain March? No, said March. A better question, said Axiom. Do you hate what you have become? March shrugged. I used to be an iron hand, and now I'm not. That's an improvement. But do you hate yourself, said Axiom. She stepped closer, and slowly and gently lifted the hem of the t-shirt to run a finger along the thick scar on his stomach. March gripped her wrist with his right hand and eased her finger back. Don't. Do you hate what you've become, said Axiom. Do you hate what the machinists made you into? The silent order operative with the arm of an iron hand. Do you hate what they made you into, said March. The woman with iron eyes? Axiom considered this. A fair question. No, I do not. I hate the final consciousness. I hate them for taking me from my family, for the pain they inflicted upon my sister, for the agony they inflicted upon me. Her smile was thin. They keep you awake for the final surgeries. But you knew that. I am free of them now, but it left me better. Stronger. Smarter. I can think faster than any normal human. I am stronger than a normal human woman. I look at you, and I can see the beat of your heart, the flow of your blood within your veins. I can see things that normal humans would never dream existed. So while I hate the final consciousness, I do not hate what I have become. Good for you, said March. Axiom inclined her head. I believe I understand you better now, Captain March. Good night. Without another word she left, closing the door behind her. March stared at the door and took a deep breath, trying to calm down. God damn it, he muttered. He felt like an idiot. But turning her down had been the smart thing to do. March was on a mission, and he could not afford any distractions. And he hated for anyone to see his scars. A liability, he knew, but it wasn't something he had been able to overcome. No better to turn her down. But she didn't hate the scars the machinists had given her, as he did. March wondered what she knew that he did not. If Tolox needed him, she knew where to find him. March turned off the light and lay down, and was tired enough that he fell asleep at once. 7. Sugar 
they met for a council of war the next morning. Tolaks had a conference room next to the workers' dormitory, though it was less impressive than the one the ghost drones had torn apart. A pair of plastic folding tables had been put together, and metal folding chairs sat around it. Tolox had also provided an array of foodstuffs from her various suppliers, mostly prepackaged breakfast pastries. Dredger and Casimir loved the pastries and dug in with enthusiasm. March helped himself to some beef jerky and protein bars. At least the coffee was mostly good. Axiom and Helen did not eat anything, though both women took coffee. They had changed from their formal clothes to the usual dress of off-world freighter crewers visiting Rusteral. Black cargo trousers, gray t-shirts, jackets with a lot of pockets. Axiom had found a new pair of sunglasses and gave no indication of her attempt to seduce March last night. Though Helen looked at March with a faintly puzzled look. March wondered how much Axiom had told her sister. Everything, most likely. All right, said Tolox, walking into the room. She had changed into her usual gray coat and trousers. The coffee steamed as she poured herself a cup, and she sat at the head of the table. We've all got a common enemy, so it's time we started talking about how to take that enemy down. She looked around the table. First things first. It doesn't look like there's going to be any official response from the Securitate about last night. March frowned. They'll ignore an exploded helicopter and a gunfight in the heart of the city. Axiom smiled. They already ignored several murders at Devereaux's video parlor. According to the news, said Tolox, the helicopter explosion was caused by a malfunctioning power relay that blew up under the street. The sound of gunfire was likely administrators and citizens both misinterpreting the sound of the explosion. She offered her thin, mirthless smile. They have so little experience with firearms, you understand. I have spoken with my employees at the Renarchist's Pride, said Casimir. They report nothing out of the ordinary last night, save for a large group of citizens who entered the bar, used the elevators, and disappeared. Our ghost drone, said March. Before their transformations. It would seem so, said Casimir. From what I've gathered, said Tolox, it seems the Securitate thinks this is a war between Casimir's organization and Devereaux's. The anti-machinist elements in the Securitate won't intervene unless the violence gets out of hand. The pro-machinist elements will protect Devereaux, but can't be seen helping a machinist agent since the Republic is officially neutral. Then they are an equation that balances to exactly zero, said Axiom. If I am to kill Richard Venator, I must do it without the help of the Renarchist Republic. Especially if we want to get paid, said Helen, giving Casimir a pointed look. He just grinned back at her. That means we can't expect any help from the authorities, said March, but they won't interfere with us. He shook his head. Hell of a way to run a government. Traditional Rustari efficiency, said Casimir opening the wrapper of another breakfast pastry. If he kept eating like that, he was going to need to lose the weight all over again. But that means we have a free hand to shut down whatever Lori and Devereaux are doing, said Tolox. Based on what we saw last night, it seems clear that Lori is planning to distribute tainted sugar to covertly transform Rustari citizens into those ghost drones without their knowledge. We don't know what his long-term plan is. Maybe he's planning to use them as assassins to overthrow the Republic and install a more openly pro-machinist government. Maybe it's all just an experiment. But either way, we're going to stop him. Great, said Casimir. Such a fine and stirring speech. How are we going to stop him? No one said anything into the silence. Sabotage, said March. With the assets we have available here, that's the only option. Hiring mercenaries would just cause the Securitate to crack down on us, and we can't get them to do our dirty work for us. The easiest way is to plant bombs and blow up the whole building. That'll make a mess, said Dredger. And we might kill innocent people, 
said Casimir. They all gave him a surprised look. What, said Casimir affronted. I am a smuggler, not a barbarian. I got involved in this to keep the machinists from killing people, not to blow up random citizens. Mr. Casimir is right, said March. And practically, we need to know more about the warehouse before we blow it up. If Lori has, say, chemical weapons inside, or a nanotech-based plague, blowing up the warehouse would spread it across Rykov City. He could also have defenses hidden inside that could neutralize any explosives. The most logical path forward, said Axiom, is to obtain blueprints for Devereux's warehouse complex. Given the scope and size of the Republic's bureaucracy, it is likely that plans for the warehouse must have been filed somewhere when it was constructed. That would be correct, said Tolox. I can probably obtain the blueprints, though it will take some bribery. Meanwhile, we should start surveilling the warehouse complex, said March. Learn the traffic patterns and the comings and goings of the delivery trucks and anyone who works there. It might be easiest to hijack one of the trucks and smuggle a bomb through the gate. I shall assist with that, said Axiom. You hired us to kill Richard Venator, and this is the best path to achieve that objective. March wasn't entirely happy about that. He wasn't sure that Axiom was entirely sane. For that matter, she had attempted to seduce a man she had known for less than a day, which was not a sign of reliability. That said, her unique skills and abilities would make her useful. All right, said March. We better get started. Dredger, can you drive? The Tolox vending van proved an excellent way for March and Axiom to get around the neighborhood near the spaceport and the warehouses. Tolox vending controlled most of the vending machines in the warehouses and the spaceport, and Dredger drove from machine to machine, doing repairs and restocking. March feared Axiom would stand out. Attractive women drew attention wherever they went, to say nothing of Axiom's scars, cybernetic eyes, and complete lack of hair. Fortunately, she proved adept at disguise. A baggy gray jumpsuit concealed her figure, and she donned a brown wig and sports cap adorned with Tolox Vending's logo, much to Dredger's amusement. Heavy sunglasses masked her eyes and the scars around them, and she looked like a bored worker refilling vending machines. What she and March actually did was install hidden cameras. While Dredger repaired the vending machines, made small talk with facility managers, and paid the occasional judicious bribe, March and Axiom slipped away. Tolox had provided them with small, high-resolution battery-powered cameras, with sufficient charge for two weeks of continuous recording and transmitting. The camera's encrypted signals went to a laptop computer in Dredger's van, and step by methodical step, March and Axiom encircled Devereux's warehouse complex with cameras. The process took about two days, and when they were done, they had a 360-degree view of Devereux's warehouse. After that, March and Axiom spent the next day in Tolix's warehouse, the laptop plugged into a pair of projectors and two dozen camera feeds shimmering in the air before them. I do not think entry through the gate will be viable, said Axiom, pointing at a camera image. Every single truck that passes through the gate is inspected. The drivers must present credentials, and the guards visually inspect the cargo area. She considered. There are only two guards in the booth. It might be possible to overwhelm them. Yeah, said March, but security drones are patrolling the yard at all times. He pointed at another camera feed. It showed a black metal spider that looked like the one Axiom had used at the factory complex. Unlike Axiom's drone, it was armed with a pair of machine guns mounted on its back in a swiveling turret. The guns lacked the raw destructive power of plasma weaponry, but the robot could unleash a devastating amount of fire in a short time. And there were at least a dozen of the drones guarding the warehouse. That was on top of the security cameras that covered all angles of approach, the razor wire on the wall, and the scanners mounted on either side of the main gate to augment the visual inspections. Covert entry may be impossible, said Axiom. We might have to employ brute force. Maybe, said March. 
but it doesn't look like the roof is guarded, and we might be able to find another way in. Fortunately, by then, Tolix's friends and Casimir's bribes had produced a blueprint of the warehouse and a map of the subterranean city. Like many modern cities, Rykov City extended almost as far underground as its skyscrapers rose above ground. The city's fusion power plants were underground, ready to be collapsed in the event of a reactor failure, along with the maze of the subway system, the vast basements of the skyscrapers, underground parking garages, sewers, and a maze of access tunnels and equipment. Some of the sections of the underground city were inspected weekly and maintained, as well as anything on Rusteral was ever maintained. Some had been abandoned and sealed off for centuries. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in luck, said Casimir. Tolox had brought up the relevant sections of the map on one of the holo displays of her warehouse's main workstation, and March and the others stood around the desk. Would you mind explaining how, Mr. Casimir, said Helen. The map of the underground city was a bewildering maze of blue lines, red lines, and cryptic labels. Devereaux's warehouse, said Casimir, pointing at the appropriate spot on the map. It extends two stories underground. The first basement level looks like commercial freezer storage units. The second floor is the HVAC equipment to keep all those freezers running. He grinned. But this is where it's useful. A hundred years ago, the subway used to have a station near Tolix's warehouse. The government moved the subway lines after the spaceport expanded. But the subway tunnel is still there, said Helen, nodding with understanding. Sealed off, but still there. Yeah, said Tolox. She traced her finger through the holographic diagram. And it runs right next to the subbasement of Devereaux's warehouse. Close enough that a plasma torch could cut through without too much work. Well, Miss Axiom, said Dredger. He had worked up the courage to flirt with her on and off over the last few days with no response. Do you fancy a walk through the sewers? Not particularly, said Axiom, the holographic display reflecting in her sunglasses. But this appears our best chance for unobserved entry to Devereaux's facility. Based on what we have observed, I calculate our best chance for entry will be at midnight tonight when the delivery of sugar arrives. Agreed, said March. I hope we have a plasma torch. Casimir smiled. I can obtain one for a very reasonable cost. That night, March and Axiom descended into the subterranean maze beneath Rykov City. They held flashlights because while Axiom could see in the dark, March could not. March was carrying a pair of printed guns, since he didn't know if Lori had the foresight to install extra defenses in the basement, or if the machinist agent had realized the danger the subway tunnel presented to Devereaux's warehouse. March carried the plasma torch slung over his shoulder, the strap digging into his chest. They used a tunnel junction near Tolix's base and then descended into the maze. Fifty meters down a tunnel they came to a locked metal door, the hinges bleeding rust into the concrete frame. March broke the lock with his left hand, and they stepped through the door and into an abandoned subway station. He swept his light back and forth, taking in the crumbling platform the rails gleaming in the gloom, the empty ticket booth, and peeling murals showing renarchist ideals upon the walls. Left, I think, said March, sweeping his light in that direction. That is correct, said Axiom, walking to the edge of the platform with a gun in her right hand. She looked at the rails. None of the rails are electrified. There is no danger. March nodded and dropped off the platform, dust gritting beneath his boots. Axiom followed suit, and they started the long walk down the silent tunnel. It reminded March of walking through a graveyard. Nothing moved in the shadowy gloom, and the flashlight in his right hand threw weird shadows against the concrete walls. Something flickered in the shadows, and March froze, shifting his pistol in that direction. Do not be alarmed, said Axiom. It is only a rat. March grimaced but nodded and kept going. You do not care for rats, said Axiom. I'm not fond of things that can bite and spread disease, said March. There had been rats everywhere in the labor camps of Calixtus. As a child, 
He had spent a lot of time emptying and resetting the rat traps his mother had set around their tent. The remaining machinist nanotech in your bloodstream should protect you from any of the diseases carried by common rats, said Axiom. She paused. Unless you hate that part of yourself as well. March sighed. This is not the time for personal conversations. Quite right, said Axiom, and she fell silent. They kept moving forward. March shifted his pistol to his left hand and drew out his phone with his right, pulling up the map. From time to time rats skittered past in the darkness, fleeing whenever March turned his light in their direction. They walked for a half mile and March stopped, pointing his flashlight at the pipes running along the ceiling and reading the numbers. I think this is it, said March. I calculate that you are correct, said Axiom, gazing at the wall. I don't suppose you can see through the wall, said March. He caught Axiom's smile in the gloom. The equipment necessary to do so would not fit inside a human skull. But I can tell that the wall is thinner here. The steel beams are not as thick. If Tolix's surmise is correct, the original owners of Devereux's warehouse likely dug as close as they could to the tunnel wall without breaching it. Let's hope Lori hasn't realized that, said March. He returned his pistol to its holster and his phone to its pocket, strapped his flashlight to his head so it would look wherever he pointed, and produced a pair of welder's glasses. When he put them over his eyes, he couldn't see anything in the gloom of the old tunnel. Keep watch while I cut us a door. I shall, said Axiom, taking a few steps back. March hefted the plasma torch. It felt like holding a large, unwieldy rifle. Two massive power packs were mounted on either side of the torch, and the emitter would spit out a foot-long blade of plasma that could slice through almost anything given enough time. March adjusted the controls, setting it to the appropriate temperature and intensity for cutting through concrete. Don't you need welder's glasses, said March. I do not, said Axiom. The amount of radiant light necessary to damage my optical sensors would also kill everyone in the tunnel. Handy, said March. Maybe you should be the one with the torch. I do not have a cybernetic arm capable of supporting the torch's weight for the necessary length of time, said Axiom. In other words, said March, it's heavy and you don't want to hold it. I believe I just said that, yes. March laughed a little and started the torch. The brilliant white hot plasma blade flared to life, roaring like a forest fire, and he began to work. It was more like digging a short tunnel than cutting through a wall. The torch sliced segments from the wall, and March paused to let Axiom pull them free. Once they broke through the tunnel wall, March found a second wall behind it, one built of rebar and concrete slabs. It was the wall of the warehouse's lower basement. It took an hour to cut through that. March carved small pieces free with the plasma torch, and Axiom set them down one by one, taking care to remain silent. March didn't know if Lori and Devereaux had thought to put any security in the basement. For that matter, he didn't know how far the light and the noise from the plasma torch would carry. Yet no one responded, and as the hole grew bigger, March saw the backside of a large metal machine. An industrial air circulator, he thought, designed to push air to the freezers on the first level of the basement. About an hour later, he shut off the torch, wiping the sweat from his forehead. The ambient temperature in the tunnel must have gone up by about 40 degrees, from the torch's radiant heat. All right, said March. Let's sneak in and have a look around. If there are guards in the basement, I want to know about them sooner rather than later. Agreed, said Axiom. March drew his pistol and climbed through the hole, the smell of plasma-cut concrete dust filling his nostrils. He straightened up behind the air handler and stepped out, pistol ready in his right hand. The basement was cavernous, but most of the space was filled with air handling equipment. At once, March saw why no one had noticed the noise of the torch. The machinery made a constant noise, the whir of the fans filling March's ears, and the bulk of the equipment would have blocked the light. Axiom climbed up behind him, gun ready. 
Can you see anything? said March. Axiom shook her head. No human heat signatures. I do not detect any cameras or electronic security measures, either. Guess Lori didn't expect someone to tunnel into his basement, said March. It is an unconventional strategy. They moved past the roaring HVAC machines, making a complete circuit of the basement. March saw no guards and no security measures, whether cameras, motion detectors, or other devices. It looked like Lori and Devereaux had, at last, missed a step. At the far end of the basement, a flight of metal steps climbed to a steel door. March ascended the stairs and stopped at the top, trying to listen at the door, but he couldn't hear anything over the whine of the machinery. Can you see anything? said March. No, said Axiom. The walls are too thick and there's too much steel. March tried the door. It was unlocked and he eased it open a few inches. Dim light leaked through the door and beyond he saw a corridor with metal freezer cases lining the walls. He pushed open the door the rest of the way and stepped into the hallway. The only illumination came from a few lights mounted to the ceiling and once again he saw no signs of a security system. It seemed that Lori and his allies had indeed missed a bet. The defenses above ground were formidable, but no one had thought to guard the basement. To judge from the dust on the freezer cases, no one had been down here for a long time. There was another flight of stairs and a metal door at the end of the corridor. March and Axiom climbed the stairs in silence. This time, he heard noises from behind the door, the whir of machinery, the clang of metal containers, the clatter of something that sounded like a conveyor belt. March looked at Axiom, and she nodded. He eased the door open an inch and peered through the crack. All he saw was a stack of empty shipping pallets a foot away. Someone had left them piled up, blocking the basement door. That would provide excellent cover. March reached into his coat, drew out the camera earpiece he had used during his pursuit of Axiom in the abandoned factory complex, and put it over his ear. Then he slipped through the door and peered around the stack of pallets. The first thing he saw was a naked woman holding a plasma rifle. The sight was so incongruous that his mind froze up for a second, but then he started noticing the details. The figure was not a woman, but a companion android, with the cartoonish proportions common in female companions. A few yards away stood a naked male companion, a plasma rifle in his arms. Both companions were missing the tops of their heads. No, March saw that the artificial flesh had been removed from the backs of their skulls, revealing the metal and wires beneath. The companions were hardwired to be incapable of violence against humans, and unless March missed his guess, their programming had been forcefully altered to include parameters for violence. Beyond the two guards, he saw a factory. Lights hung from the ceiling overhead, throwing their harsh glare on hundreds of pallets of sugar canisters stacked near the truck dock. Dozens of companion androids moved through the factory, all of them missing the tops of their heads, and they unloaded the cylinders and carried them to the huge array of complex machinery that filled the central third of the warehouse. March recognized the massive pile of metal pipes and cylinders as a nanotech fabricator, the kind of assembler that could churn out tens of trillions of nanobots in an hour. As he watched, the companion workers fed the sugar canisters into the machine. They were carefully opened, injected with a spurt of orange fluid, and then sealed again and stacked on new pallets, exactly as they had been stacked before. The nanobot fabricator was connected to a massive black cylinder covered in flashing LEDs, a portable, pseudo-intelligent supercomputer. That made sense. The nanobots for converting citizens into ghost drones would need to be programmed with the DNA of their individual hosts. That supercomputer likely contained the medical records of every citizen in Rykov City, perhaps even every citizen on Rustero. A dozen ghost drones wandered the floor, their legs clanging against the concrete as they moved along. As before, they looked like a ghastly combination of a corpse and a metal spider. 
At the far end of the warehouse, a flight of stairs rose to a row of lighted windows. The office complex, March guessed, from which Devereaux and Laurie could supervise the operation. In fact, he thought he glimpsed Laurie standing at one of the windows, watching his ghastly little factory. If March had a clear shot at Laurie, he might have taken it. Because Laurie had done something terrible and brilliant here. By using companions as workers and guards, by using ghost drones as security, he had mobilized an effective workforce while cutting down the risk of leaks. Glory was building an army in secret, right under the noses of the Renarchist Republic's leaders. Perhaps the pro-machinist administrators congratulated themselves on believing whatever lies Glory had fed to them. Maybe they believed they would rule over their hated fellow administrators and their loathed citizens as satraps once the final consciousness conquered Rustral. Idiots. They would be sent to the camps along with everyone else. But March had what he needed. He took a slow, long look over the warehouse, letting the camera at his ear record everything. They could review the video in the security of Tolix's warehouse and plan their next move against Lori and Devereaux. Then March saw something in the heart of the fabricator that made him freeze. It was just a small thing, just the glint of light off a component. But the component was at the heart of the fabricator, and thousands of delicate wires connected to its cradle. March reached into his pocket and drew out a small pair of portable binoculars. He opened them and lifted them to his eyes. Axiom grabbed his shoulder and squeezed, and March ignored her. He knew she was right, that they had pushed their luck far harder than was wise, but he had to see. Because he had seen that kind of glint before. He focused the binoculars, and he saw the thing lying in the wiring cradle. It looked like a big bluish-green insect, a sort of stylized scarab about the size of both of Macha's fists put together. Had he not known better, March would have assumed that it was a piece of alien artwork, or perhaps a piece of human artwork done by an artist with peculiar taste. But he did know better, to his lasting regret. The device looked like a larger version of the quantum inducers that powered the machinists' wraith mind control devices, the machines that had gotten so many people killed and presented a mortal threat to the kingdom of Kalaskar. That meant the device in the cradle was technology created by the ancient and malevolent Great Elder Ones, and God only knew what the thing could do. Whatever Lori was planning had to be stopped. And March had to take the alien device back with him to the kingdom of Kalaskar. March closed the binoculars and shoved them into his pocket, turned to Axiom and nodded. She opened the door in silence, and they slipped down the stairs past the freezer cases, back to the lower basement, and then into the gloomy silence of the subway tunnel. Why did you look at the nanobot fabricator with binoculars, said Axiom. That seemed an unnecessary risk. Dark energy, said March. What, said Axiom. Did you see any dark energy radiating from that fabricator, said March. A strange look came over her face. I did. How did you know? I've seen this kind of thing before, said March. The dark energy was radiating from that peculiar sculpture wired into the fabricator, said Axiom, which was highly unusual. Dark energy is often unusable within a planetary gravity well, which is why mankind did not discover hyperspace until we were well away from primeval Earth. She frowned at him. You have encountered similar statues. I have, said March. I assume it is not a statue then, said Axiom. What is it? Something worse, said March. Something that might destroy Rustral in the wrong hands. We had better talk to Tolox right away. An hour later, March stepped into Tolox's office and closed the door behind him. We have a serious problem, he said. Tolox crossed to her desk, a puzzled look on her face. March had insisted on talking to her before anyone else, even before they viewed the video from the warehouse. More serious than the ones we already have, said Tolox, sitting at her desk. 
Yes, said March. We've been wondering how Lori has been hiding the ghost drones, converting them without the victim's knowledge. The implants are in a quantum state. But how did he do that? There's no known technology that can cause that kind of effect. Tolix's expression grew solemn. But you found out how. Yes, said March. Has the Silent Order told you anything about the machinists using alien technology? Tolok shook her head. All right, said March. I'm not sure how much of this you're clear to know, but the technology is here, and we have to deal with it. A long time ago, long before humans ever left primeval Earth and spread into interstellar space, this part of the galaxy used to have many alien races. I've heard of that, said Tolox. They all went extinct for some reason or another. I remember seeing some video from a historian on Kalaskar talking about it. Dredger kept commenting on how tight her skirt was. I think that was the whole reason he was watching the video. Anyway, that historian said all the alien races native to this part of the galaxy went extinct, wiped themselves out in a war or a plague or whatever. She was right, said March. They were destroyed fighting a race from another reality called the Great Elder Ones. They won and drove the Great Elder Ones back to their own universe, but they were destroyed in the process. Some of the Great Elder Ones' technology got left behind, and recently the machinists found a cache of the stuff and have been experimenting with it. One of those devices is powering Lori's nanobot fabricator. Okay, said Tolox. That's potentially dangerous, but so what? There's lots of old alien crap floating around in space. Half of it doesn't work, and the rest explodes if you play with it. We'll blow up the warehouse and blow up the device with it. It won't work, said March. The device is impervious to anything we can do to it. And I have it on good authority that the relics of the Great Elder Ones are dangerous. Like how dangerous, said Tolox. Nuclear bomb, dangerous. Asteroid hitting the planet, dangerous. It is possible, said March, that one of their devices might accidentally open a gate to their reality and let them back to this universe. Tolox stared at him. How do you know that, she said at last. It sounds fantastical. I know that, said March because an artificial intelligence built by one of those extinct alien races to fight the Great Elder Ones told me all about it. Seriously, said Tolox. March nodded. Good God, said Tolox. She rubbed her face with her hands. So, you're telling me there's an ancient alien machine in Devereaux's warehouse, and if somebody tampers with it the wrong way, it might open a gate to let a bunch of cosmic horrors from another universe onto Rustral. I'm afraid so, said March. Good God. Tolok shook her head. You came here to track down a murderer, and now there's some kind of ancient alien weapon of mass destruction sitting in Rykov City. She got up and started to pace. March nodded again. She thought it through. If we blow up the factory, and a power surge goes into that device the wrong way. It could be bad, said March. Nothing might happen. The thing's only the size of both of my fists put together. Well, you've got big fists. Jokes were unlike Tolox. The news had indeed agitated her. But I don't know how it works, said March. And even if we just blow up the warehouse and nothing happens, we can't leave the device buried in the rubble. Someone might find it. I wouldn't trust the Renarchist Republic with the thing any more than I would trust the machinists. It needs to go back to Kalaskar so the Silent Order can figure out a defense against the other applications of the Great Elder One's technology that the machinists have used against us. All right, said Tolox. We'll think of something. She pointed at him. This just stays between you and me, right? Don't even tell Dredger. Both Casimir and Axiom might get greedy if they knew what was really in that warehouse. Axiom already knows, said March. She could see that the device was emitting dark energy. 
Tolox blinked. Dark energy. Hyperspace radiation, yeah. March nodded. I thought that was impossible to stabilize inside a planetary gravity well. So did I and thousands of generations of human scientists, said March. Evidently, the great elder ones disagreed. Okay, said Tolox. This is what we'll do. We'll tell the others that Lori is using an extremely unstable alien device to put the ghost drone's implants into a quantum state. She laughed. Suppose it's close enough to the truth. We'll also tell them that if the device is mishandled, it might explode and wipe out Rykov City. Which I suppose is also not that far from the truth. You've got experience disarming the devices, so before we blow up the warehouse, we'll have to figure out how to secure Lori's device. Casimir still might try to steal the thing, said March. Or Axiom, if she thinks that she can sell it. Well, said Tolox, suppose it's up to you to keep that from happening. An hour later, they gathered around the main desk and watched the video March had taken of the warehouse's interior. Dredger snorted. Naked companion guards. Sounds like a bad video game plot. Casimir grunted. I heard rumors that the Securitate was worried the companions could be used as weapons against the citizens of Kalaskar. If their programming was hacked remotely, they could turn against their owners en masse. Glory doesn't need to bother, said March. He's hacking the citizens of Rustral, not their androids. But if the basement is unguarded, said Helen, then the rest is easy. We'll sneak in demolition charges through the subway tunnel. The blueprints Mr. Casimir found will tell us where to place them. One of the easiest jobs we've ever done. It is going to be more complicated than that, said Axiom in a soft voice. I'm afraid she's right, said Tolox. This is the problem. She paused the video and zoomed onto the nanobot fabricator. The image resolution was clear enough that March had a good view of the alien device in its cradle. What is that? said Casimir. Looks like a big damn bug. It's not, said March. We wondered how the ghost drone's implants were in a quantum state. There's our answer. That is a highly unstable piece of technology from an extinct alien race, and Lori has adapted it to modify his nanobots. That's how the ghost drones are able to hide their implants, how they're able to be drones without even realizing it. Looks valuable, said Casimir. Axiom turned a blank expression his way. It's more dangerous than it is valuable, said March. Glory is playing with fire, and I don't think he realizes it. An entire machinist task force got wiped out by one of those devices. That was distorting the truth. The machinists had gone to Monastery Station to get their quantum inducers back, and the custodian had wiped them out when March had provoked them into attacking. If the wrong kind of power surge enters that device, it will explode, and the resultant energy discharge will likely vaporize Rykov City. So if we blow up the warehouse, said Dredger. We might have a much bigger explosion than we wanted, said March. God damn it, said Casimir. Not only is Lori turning citizens into drones, he's also bringing dangerous alien technology into the city. Devereaux is an idiot. Why did he get into bed with Lori? If I wasn't going to shoot him, I would smack some sense into him. It seems our objective is then twofold, said Axiom. We must first secure the alien device and get it out of the warehouse. Only then will it be safe to destroy the building. And just how are we going to do that, said Dredger. A distraction, said March. And what kind of distraction is going to scare off that many guards, said Casimir. March thought about it. How many of those Haroth assault drones do you have? Eight, said Casimir. He scowled. But I need them to guard my clubs. Otherwise the guests get rowdy. If I get rid of those drones, I'll have riots in my club and the Securitate up my ass. That's unpleasant, said Tolox. 
but having Lori accidentally blow up Rykov City would be bad for business. For God's sake, said Casimir. Why does being patriotic have to cost so much damn money? He pointed at Axiom. You already cost a fortune to hire. You. He stopped mid-rant, blinked and grinned. Although, he said, I happen to have a warehouse full of Heroth Mark VI assault drones. Hey, isn't that model? Attack. It took the rest of the day to prepare for the attack. Casimir took March and Axiom to the warehouse, where he stored his 147 defective assault drones, the warehouse itself owned by multiple shell companies to keep them away from Casimir's other businesses. The assault drones stood in silent rows, like statues buried with a long-dead ancient emperor. They were shorter and blockier than the Mark 12s at the Renarchus Prides, with wheel treads instead of feet. Their arms held built-in plasma cannons, and each one had a rocket launcher mounted on their shoulders. March and Axiom busied themselves by removing 20 of the rocket launchers from the drones and loading them into the back of Dredger's van. As they did, two semi-trucks driven by Casimir's employees pulled up, and the drones booted up and rolled into the trailers. It was only six miles from Casimir's warehouse to Devereaux's complex, but there was no way 147 assault drones could roll down the street without drawing official attention from the Securitate. Dredger drove them to the building surrounding Devereaux's warehouse, and one by one they sighted the rocket launchers on the warehouse yard and wired them to remote triggers. No one noticed their activity. People tended not to look up, and while the guards at Devereaux's complex were vigilant, they weren't paying attention to the surrounding buildings. After that, it was time to get ready for the attack. Plasma charges, said Tolox. She tried to lift the bag next to her desk, grunted, and gave up. Eighteen total. If you place these at the indicated locations in the upper level of the warehouse's basement, when they go off, they'll cause a total structural collapse. They're set up for remote detonation, said March. Yeah, said Tolox. She handed March a phone. Burner phone rigged to just the charges. Call any number, and the charges will go off. Boom. No more warehouse. No detonator for me, said Axiom. If I get shot, said March, you can take the detonator. Very well, said Axiom. Good luck, said Tolox. Dredger and I will stay with Casimir and inform you when the drones begin their attack. If this goes bad, our fallback position is the Rykov City Hotel south of the spaceport. All right, said March, picking up the bag of plasma charges. The damn thing was heavy. Good luck. You too, said Tolox. Hopefully by this time tomorrow, Lori will be dead, the factory will be destroyed, and that alien artifact will be disarmed. March nodded. And if all went well, by this time tomorrow, he would be flying out of Rusteral Station on the Tiger, heading for the nearest core system of the Kingdom of Kalaskar with another piece of the technology of the Great Elder Ones. Of course, if anything went wrong, anything at all, they all might be dead. They took a moment to sync their phones to a private, quantum-encrypted channel. That ought to let them converse without fear that the Securitate, or Lori, or anyone else would listen in. March fitted his earpiece, as did Axiom, and together they left Tolix's warehouse and descended to the subterranean levels of the city. A half hour later, they returned to the abandoned subway station. March swept his flashlight back and forth over the dusty platform and the crumbling murals of fit, cheerful citizens working in factories, so different from the reality of contemporary rustural. More rats skittered away from his flashlight beam, but nothing had changed in the subway station since their last visit. I don't think anyone has been here since we left, said March. I calculate agreement, said Axiom. March led the way down the subway tunnel, heading for the breach that he had carved into Devereaux's basement. After about a hundred meters, he heard a faint rushing noise from ahead. He froze for an instant, fearing that the tunnel was about to flood, or that a train had been diverted onto the ancient tracks, but then he realized the noise was coming from the breach in the wall. 
It was the noise of the warehouse's HVAC equipment, amplifying and echoing through the subway tunnel. They reached the breach without incident. No one seemed to have noticed it. March set down the bag of plasma charges, his shoulder aching more than usual, and climbed through the breach. The lower basement was still deserted, and he saw no trace that anyone had disturbed it since yesterday. A hard, fierce eagerness started to rise within him. Twice before, Simon Laurie had been one step ahead of March, but perhaps this time the machinist operative would not escape. Laurie had a great deal of innocent blood on his hands from the events at Rust Belt Station and Monastery Station, and March was sure that Laurie had enjoyed a long career of murder and subversion and mayhem long before their paths had ever crossed. Perhaps it would end tonight. It looks clear, said March as he returned to the subway tunnel. Axiom nodded and sat down against the wall, stretching her legs before her, and March seated himself next to her, the bag of charges between them. We'll wait until we hear from Tolox and the others that they're in position. Should be about two hours or so. Very well, said Axiom. An hour passed in silence. Every so often March or Axiom stood and stretched, keeping their muscles limber for action. He was amused and a little disturbed to see that Axiom used the same kind of stretching exercises. The training of the iron eyes was just as brutal as the training of the iron hands. I wish to ask you a personal question, said Axiom when March sat back down. He grimaced. This isn't a good time. On the contrary, said Axiom. We are alone, and no one is within earshot. Additionally, the noise from the air handlers makes it impossible for anyone to eavesdrop on us. March sighed. Fine. What do you want to know? I might not give you an answer. When we arrived, said Axiom, your heartbeat and body temperature rose in such a way to indicate anticipation. We're about to do something dangerous, said March. That's an automatic physical response. I would bet your heartbeat and body temperature did the same thing, even with your altered metabolism. Agreed, said Axiom, but I calculate you are looking forward to this confrontation. I've dealt with Lori before, said March. He killed a lot of people. Ruined a lot of people's lives. It's time he paid for that. And if he isn't stopped here, he'll keep on doing it. Then do you desire justice, said Axiom, or revenge? March shrugged. Sometimes they're the same thing. Which is why you wage war against the final consciousness, said Axiom. Not because of your loyalty to the king of Kalaskar, but for revenge for what was done to you and to stop the plans of the machinists. March shrugged again. If you like. Are you trying to get yourself killed, said Axiom. There was no accusation or emotion in her face or voice, only curiosity. Not particularly, said March. Everyone dies of something. Maybe I'll climb through that damn hole and crack my head on the edge. Boom. Axiom considered that. Are you a virgin? What, said March, thrown by the sudden change of topic. The question distresses you, said Axiom. It startles me, said March. He almost told her to mind her own business, but he kept talking. You know I'm not. You know the Iron Hands are given women as rewards for successful missions. And after you were removed from the final consciousness, said Axiom, I have observed firsthand that you are physiologically capable of performing. And after I was removed from the final consciousness, yes, said March, rubbing his neck with his right hand. God, but this was one of the strangest conversations he had ever had. But not for a long time now. I see, said Axiom. I hypothesize that you hate what you used to be, and any reminder of it is intolerable to you. For God's sake, said March. I should have just told you that I was married. Or that I didn't find you attractive. Axiom smiled. It is difficult to lie to a woman when she can see your blood pressure change. The silence stretched between them, and then March laughed. 
What is amusing, said Axiom. I'm starting to see, said March, why Helen has to do all your negotiating for you. For the first time, Axiom looked almost rueful. Yes. Social niceties are often beyond me. They are difficult when you view the world entirely in mathematical terms. How many seconds should be spent on polite small talk before business begins? What percentages of compliments should contain falsehood? What proportion of honesty is acceptable? All these questions cannot be solved mathematically and are a constant vexation to me. Is that why you are here, said March? You want to get yourself killed? I do not. I desire to be paid by Casimir, said Axiom. My long-term goal is to earn enough wealth so that my sister and I can live comfortably in some remote place. Her face softened. I also want for my sister to marry and have children, for that is what she desires. My life has been difficult, but so has hers. I wish for her to experience happiness. Money cannot buy happiness, said March. A cliché and a rationalization. And money can purchase security, which is almost as good. If your sister is the one who wants to get married, said March, why did you try to sleep with me? Axiom shrugged. Because I wish to. I do not often experience physical desire, but I did with you. Your musculature and height are pleasing. Additionally, you are confident and competent, which is more desirable than the physical attributes of a man. Her voice softened a little. And you would understand. Understand what, said March. What it is like to be me, said Axiom. Or to be one of us. Drones detached from the final consciousness, our bodies rewritten with cybernetics. You would understand. You would look into the machines that have replaced my eyes and not be repulsed. Then you're lonely, said March. There was a long silence. Yes, said Axiom at last, and then she laughed a little. What's funny, said March. I wish to ask you a personal question, said Axiom, and instead I told you more about myself than I intended. See, said March. That's the danger of having a personal conversation with an intelligence operative. Axiom laughed louder that time. A danger I shall have to consider in the future. March's earpiece crackled. March, said Toax. Here, said March. We are in position, said Toax. Casimir's parked his semis in an alley near the warehouse, and the Mark VI units are unloading themselves. Helen and Dredger are ready to remotely fire the rockets. Are you ready? We are, said March. Get started placing the charges, said Tolox. We'll alert you once we start the attack, and you can grab the alien device and get the hell out of there. Acknowledged, said March as Axiom got to her feet. March stood and hefted the bag of plasma charges. Ready. Always, said Axiom. She went first through the breach since March had to wrestle the heavy bag of charges with him. The damn things clinked every time they brushed the walls. He knew that the charges were harmless until the detonators were primed and then fired, but something about banging an explosive against a stone wall still made his skin crawl. No doubt Axiom could describe the involuntary physical response to him in great detail. The lower basement remained deserted, and they hurried to the metal stairs. Axiom climbed up to the landing, opened the door an inch, and peered through it. Then she nodded and beckoned him through. The corridor beyond the door was empty, the dim lights reflecting off the metal doors of the freezer cases. March set the bag of charges down on the floor with a sigh of relief. I shall do the left side, said Axiom, pulling out her phone. I'll take the right, said March, lifting one of the charges. They worked in silence, taking the cylindrical plasma charges and affixing them to specific places on the walls, the support columns, and the steel girders of the ceiling. When detonated, the charges would release a superheated explosion of plasma, capable of vaporizing anything nearby. 
That would chew through the concrete pillars and the steel beams, and if the calculations that Casimir had provided were correct, the entire warehouse would collapse into the basement, destroying the nanobot fabricator and killing everyone still inside the building. By then, March hoped to be well away with Axiom and the alien device. Ready, said Axiom, affixing the last of her charges to a concrete pillar. March nodded, tapping his earpiece. Tolox. Tolox here. All the charges are placed, said March. As soon as we have the relic, we can blow them. Acknowledged, said Tolox. We're going to begin in 60 seconds. Better get into position. March crossed to the metal stairs, and he climbed up to the landing, Axiom a half step behind him. He eased open the doorway a crack and peered through, fearing that the companion workers would have moved the stack of pallets. He was in luck. Not only was the stack of pallets still there, but two more stacks had been placed on either side of it. No one from the warehouse floor could see the basement door. He stepped back, closing the door. Tolox said March. We're about to head into the warehouse itself. We're going to have to go silent. Acknowledged, said Tolox again. We'll keep you informed. Hang on, I'll make sure you can hear the others. The earpiece crackled again, and the voices of Dredger and Casimir arguing about timing came to Macha's ears, at least until Helen told them to send the assault drones 60 seconds after the rocket volley. You hear us. Loud and clear, said March. Good luck to you. I always like to blow shit up, said Dredger. Best part of this job. Is that a common occurrence in the life of a vending machine repairman, said Helen. You'd be surprised, said Dredger. All right. We're going to fire off the rockets in another 60 seconds, and then Casimir is sending his robots to attack. Good luck. March nodded and looked at Axiom, starting the countdown in his head. Ready. As always, said Axiom, her calm unperturbed. March opened the door, slipped through, and stepped behind the stacks of pallets, his gun ready in his right hand. Axiom followed and closed the door in silence. March stepped behind the stack of pallets on the left and peered around the edge, looking into the cavernous space of the warehouse. He spotted a dozen companions standing guard, holding plasma rifles in their hands, their damaged heads giving them a grotesque appearance. More companions labored near the massive metal bulk of the nanobot fabricator, altering the canisters of sugar and repacking the pallets. A dozen ghost drones patrolled the walls, their metal legs clanging against the concrete floors. The lights were on in the office on the far wall of the warehouse. At the top of the stairs leading to the office, March spotted the gaunt figure of Devereaux, standing next to the bulkier shape of Simon Lorry. Both men were talking, perhaps planning what to do about Casimir. March considered taking a shot at Lori. If he had been carrying a better weapon, and if the situation had not been so dire, he might have done it. But a shot with a handgun across such a distance was chancy at best. More likely than not he would miss. Besides, in another 36 seconds, Lori and Devereaux were about to have all kinds of problems. Rockets firing said Helen in his earpiece. For about five seconds, nothing happened. March heard the faint whoosh. Devereaux kept talking, but Lori just started to turn his head to look at the truck doors, a frown appearing on his face. The rockets hit. The aim hadn't been great. The rockets had been designed to work with the Mark VI drones, targeting computers, the robot's pseudo-intelligence is providing real-time targeting and maneuvering information. The weapons had not been intended to be fired without any aiming mechanisms. Nonetheless, they did better than March thought and had a higher yield than he would have expected. The warehouse shook like a giant concrete bell, the roar of explosions echoing. An explosion blasted a breach six meters wide in the wall, chunks of broken concrete and twisted rebar clattering to the floor. Two more gaps of similar size appeared on the roof, and the boom of the explosions roared even louder. Devereaux almost fell off the balcony in surprise,
grabbing at the railing to keep his footing. Lori reacted with greater calm, yanking a plasma pistol from a holster beneath his jacket. Even with the echoes of the explosions, March heard Devereaux's furious cry. What the hell, he said. What the hell? Lori beckoned with his pistol, and both men ran into the office. Rockets away, said Helen with obvious satisfaction. Hope you two enjoyed the fireworks display. I would have preferred to enjoy it from a greater distance, murmured March. With the echoes and the distraction from the damage, he doubted the companions or the ghost drones would hear him. Here comes the second wave, said Casimir. Mark VI assault drones moving in. You two are hard-coded into their control program as off-limits, but otherwise, they're going to shoot everything they see. Even as he spoke, March heard the familiar stuttering howl of plasma fire from outside the building. As one, every armed companion and ghost drone looked towards the warehouse doors. The walls began to shake as stray plasma bolts struck them, and some dust fell from the ceiling. There was another explosion from outside, followed by two more, and then the chattering roar of the defense drone's machine guns firing at Casimir's robots. They had just started a battle in the warehouse district of Rykov City. March wondered how long they had until the Securitate responded. No matter how much Devereaux had paid the Securitate's senior officers, no matter how pro-machinist they were, there was no way the Securitate could let a battle unfold in Rykov City without intervention. Would Lori flee without a fight? He might. He had abandoned his allies to their fate without mercy on both Rust Belt Station and Monastery Station. Lori would think nothing of leaving Maurice Devereaux to die. But would he take the relic of the Great Elder Ones with him when he fled? Almost certainly he would. Or would he stand and fight? The armed companions turned, responding to a silent signal, and ran towards the truck doors as two of them slid open. Before the doors had even opened, the companions started shooting, sending volleys of plasma bolts into the yard. March saw a mass of Mark VI assault drones rolling back and forth, exchanging fire with the spidery defense drones. The companions' plasma bolts ripped into the drones, and several of them exploded as their power cells overloaded. The Mark VI drones turned to meet the new threat, and a companion went down, plasma bolts punching through the android's body without slowing. Several plasma bolts slammed into the nanobot fabricator, blasting through metal tanks and bundles of wires, and the machine started to give off both a groaning noise and a blaring alarm. March looked at the office window. Glory and Devereaux still stood there, watching the battle. There was no way the companions and the ghost drones could win against Casimir's force. Even if the companions started to turn the tide, Casimir would remotely overload all the drones at once, and March could trigger the plasma charges. But Lori didn't know that, not yet. Any minute now he would figure it out and retreat, and he would likely take the alien device with him. We have to move now, said March. Axiom nodded, and March tapped his ear. Tolox, Casimir, we're going after the device. If you don't hear from us in ten minutes, trigger the plasma charges. Acknowledged, said Tolox. Get moving. March took a deep breath and stepped around the pallets, in full view from anyone in the office and the warehouse floor. But no one noticed. The companions and ghost drones focused on the assault drones, and Lori and Devereaux watched the battle. No one noticed March and Axiom as they hurried alongside the nanotech fabricator, heading for the cradle that housed the alien device. Twice plasma bolts flashed in front of them and drilled into the metal tanks of the fabricator, which let out increasingly loud groaning noises as it broke down. Another plasma bolt struck one of the pallets of unaltered sugar, and March discovered something that he hadn't known about sugar. It was flammable. The pallet exploded with a shockwave and a roar, and March threw himself to the concrete floor. Shards of hot metal rained around him, and several of them clanged off his left arm, which he had raised to shield his head. At last the roar faded, and March got to one knee and looked around. A fireball roiled and hissed where the sugar had exploded, no doubt releasing a plume of narcotic black smoke. 
The shockwave had been enough to knock out the windows of the office, and March saw no sign of Devereaux or Lori. Maybe they had been killed by shrapnel. Axiom got to her feet, a little shakily. Are you all right, said March. Fine, said Axiom. Keep going. March nodded and started to turn. Wait. Get down. He looked up and saw Lori appear on the balcony by the office door, a plasma pistol in both hands and swinging in March's direction. He ducked again, and the bolt that would have vaporized his skull instead shot past his shoulder to blast glowing chips from the concrete floor. Glory fired twice more as March slammed against the side of the fabricator, taking cover behind one of the tanks. Axiom raised her pistol and squeezed off two shots. Glory had already taken cover, ducking behind the doorframe, and the bullets bounced off the wall. March eased forward, ready to open fire if Lori showed himself. The machinist agent must have spotted them when the damn pallet of sugar had exploded. But they had Lori pinned in the office now, and March knew there wasn't any other exit from it. All he had to do was get the alien device, escape the warehouse, and trigger the plasma charges, and that would be the end of both Simon Lori and the ghost drones. To the right, said Axiom, shifting around and opening fire her pistol flashing. March turned his head and saw two companions running towards them, plasma rifles in hand. Axiom's bullets slammed into the androids, but to no effect. Conventional bullets could penetrate the artificial flesh coverings of the companions without difficulty, but the metal skeletons proved harder to damage. Unless Axiom managed to hit a vital component, the companions would simply shrug off small arms gunfire. A plasma rifle swung in Macha's direction, and he ducked. The bolt burned past him and struck the fabricator, punching another hole in one of the tanks. March grabbed one of the metal struts holding the tank in place with his left hand and yanked with all his strength. The bar ripped free, and March found himself holding a four-foot length of steel. He leapt to his feet as the companion lined up for another shot and flung the bar. The length of metal slammed into the companion's forehead, knocking its head back. That couldn't hurt the android, but it did knock its optical sensors out of line, which meant its next shot missed March by six inches. The companion lowered its head and shifted its aim, but by then it was too late. March reached the android and punched his left hand into the center of its chest. Punching something that looked like an impossibly proportioned naked woman was a disturbing feeling, but the blow worked. The impact knocked the android backward, and the companion's programming took over both arms shooting down to catch its balance. March seized the plasma rifle, took aim, and sent a bolt through the companion's skull. The plasma vaporized the metal skull and turned the android CPU to slag, and the companion went limp. March wheeled, leveled the rifle, and snapped off another shot at the companion attacking Axiom. His aim was off, and the blast vaporized its neck. But with the spinal column destroyed, the CPU could no longer control the body and the android collapsed in a limp heap. Get that rifle, said March, shoving his printed pistol into its holster. Axiom nodded and seized the plasma rifle from the disabled companion, her hands moving with reflexive motions as she checked the weapon. March turned, scanning the warehouse, the rifle raised and ready to fire. The battle raged outside, but he didn't see any more companions or ghost drones. Glory might have summoned them to fight, but perhaps they had been unable to disengage from battle with the Mark VI drones. Let's move, said March. We only have seven minutes and 37 seconds remaining until detonation, said Axiom, calm. We. A flicker of motion from the edge of the fabricator caught March's attention. He raised the rifle just as a companion leapt around the fabricator, firing. Plasma bolts shot past March and he had no choice but to dodge as Axiom took cover alongside the fabricator. March fell to one knee and pulled the trigger, and his bolt tore a chunk from the concrete floor. Axiom fired, and her aim was better. The bolt drilled through the companion's skull and sent it tumbling to the floor. March got to his feet and took one step closer, and then dark blurs burst from around the edge of the fabricator. 
Simon Laurie and Maurice Devereaux approached, both men holding plasma pistols. Devereaux covered Axiom, both hands grasping the butt of his pistol, his face shiny with sweat and his expression tight with strain. Laurie looked far more relaxed, even amused, but the pistol in his right hand remained rock steady as it pointed at Macha's chest. In his left hand, he held a grenade, his finger holding the detonation switch in place. A dead man switch. No, Lori wouldn't risk his life like that. Likely, the grenade had been set to explode a few seconds after he released the switch. They stared at each other, the noise of the battle outside echoing through the warehouse. Lori and Devereaux were ten meters away, and Devereaux was standing right next to the cradle holding the alien device. Well, goddamn it all, said Lori. Captain Jack March. I should have known. If I can misquote St. Paul, you are the thorn in my flesh. Who? said Devereaux. It seems our little operation was more successful than we thought, Maurice, said Laurie. I bet one of the ghost drones we sent out drew official attention earlier than we thought. Who's your girlfriend, Jack? He didn't look at Axiom. Former Iron Eye, by the look of her. Hey, remind me, did you ever sleep with Rona Vindex? Before or after you shot her brother, that is. The taunt bolstered Macha's confidence. He hadn't shot Rona's brother. Rona herself had done that. Lori didn't know everything. The very fact that March stood with a plasma rifle pointed at Lori's chest proved that. God damn it, Richard, that doesn't answer the question, said Devereaux, more sweat trickling into the collar of his suit. He's an alpha operative of the Silent Order said Lori. Sent to stop us, I would guess, and to steal the device powering the nanobot fabricator. The little light show outside is also his work, I would guess. It's not too late to surrender, said March. Or do you want to die here together? No, I don't really like either option, said Lori. Either way, this operation is over, said March. Lori grinned. This operation was a success. A complete and unqualified success. The test was so successful that the Silent Order sent an Alpha operative all the way to Rusterol to find out what the hell was going on. Looks like the new class of drone was a success, wouldn't you say? Rusterol has a hundred cities the size of Rykov City, all of them full of useless citizens, sucking down sugar and amusing themselves with their companions. All I have to do is destroy the evidence here and start over in another Rustari city. In ten years, this world will be part of the final consciousness and we'll have an army of ghost drones to infiltrate a hundred other worlds. That will be hard, said March, once we're all dead here. Destroy the evidence, said Devereaux. What the hell do you mean by that? Glory took one long step back, the pistol still pointed at March's chest. What? started Devereaux again, though he dared not take his eyes from Axiom. Lori flung the grenade in his left hand. It hit the ground between March and Axiom and bounced past them, skittering into the fabricator with a series of clinks. In the same motion, Lori grabbed Devereaux's arm and yanked the gaunt man in front of him. March and Axiom had both fired at once, and their bolts slammed into Devereaux's torso, turning his chest into a charred crater. Lori threw him to the ground and ducked into a gap between two of the fabricator's tanks. There was only a split second to decide. When that grenade went off, the fabricator would absorb most of the blast, but the shrapnel would kill anyone standing too close to the grenade. March ducked for cover, rolling behind a pallet of sugar canisters, and he glimpsed Axiom scrambling to shield herself behind a parked forklift. The grenade went off with a roar and part of the fabricator ripped apart in a spray of debris. The explosion had been stronger than March guessed, and he heard dozens of clangs as pieces of metal bounced off the sugar canisters stacked against his back. If one of those shrapnel fragments penetrated the sugar canisters, it might touch off an explosion and kill him. Or maybe the shock wave would knock over the pallet, and he would be buried alive. Getting buried alive by sugar canisters would have been an ironic death, save that he had never used the stuff. But the explosion died away, 
and March leapt to his feet and spun around the pallet, leading with a rifle. The grenade had thrown up a cloud of gray smoke, and March couldn't see through it. Glory had to be here somewhere, he couldn't have moved that fast. The smoke cleared enough for him to see the wiring cradle. The artifact of the great Elder Ones was gone. There, shouted Axiom, pointing as she ran around the forklift. March just had time to see Lori's dark coat as he dashed around the fabricator's corner. He snarled a curse and sprinted after the machinist operative, Axiom a half-step behind him. March raced around the corner and came to the far side of the warehouse. Three of the truck doors were open, and March saw a truck starting to accelerate away. It was a mid-sized box truck, the sort used for deliveries, and March glimpsed Lori at the wheel. He raised the rifle and fired three times, but his shots hit the side of the truck and failed to do any damage. Perhaps Axiom would have better luck, but she had frozen, her eyes wide. Oh, she said. That is extremely bad. What is, said March, looking around. There were more trucks parked against the back wall of the warehouses, and he headed for one, urging Axiom along. Perhaps they could pursue and overtake Lori. Lori's truck had been accelerating like it had a heavy load. That truck was shielded, said Axiom. So, said March. So I did not see what was inside of it until the truck went past, said Axiom. There was a low level of radiation consistent with a quantity of plutonium. March looked at her, the truck forgotten. Plutonium? Glory has a nuclear fission bomb in the truck, said Axiom. Probably a 10 megaton yield, possibly 15. That is how he is going to destroy the evidence. He is going to detonate a nuclear device in Rykov City. 9. Burn the evidence. A nuke, said March. The sheer brutality of it shocked him. It shouldn't have, but it did. Ten million people lived in Rykov City, ten million men and women and children. Simon Laurie would murder them all to cover his tracks, convinced of the righteousness of the cause of the revolution of the final consciousness. Likely, Laurie would not lose a single instant of sleep over the mass murder of ten million people. Then his mind started working through the shock, and grim certainty settled on him. Let's move, said March, and he ran the rest of the way to the nearest box truck. The door was locked, but he punched out the window, grasped the door frame, and ripped the door away with a clench of his metal arm. Axiom raised an eyebrow. I'll drive, said March. Get in. Axiom scrambled into the cab, and March jumped after her, wrenched off a panel on the dashboard, and started pulling on wires. March, said Tolox in his ear. What's going on? I heard you mention a nuke? Glory has the device, and he's getting away, said March, twisting together two wires. The truck's engine started with a low hum, and March put the vehicle into reverse, stomped on the accelerator, and spun around just in time to see Lori's truck vanish as it turned right from the rear gate of the warehouse yard. He's also got a nuke in his truck. What? said Tolox. Her voice rose half an octave. March buckled in, as did Axiom. He was pretty sure they might wind up crashing the truck, and Axiom must have shared his conclusion. Devereaux was dumb enough to bring a nuke into Rykov City, said Casimir. Devereaux's dead, said March. Glory ran out the back with a box truck and the relic. He's also got a nuke. He put the truck into drive and slammed the accelerator against the floor. The electric engine whined, the tires squealing as they spun against the concrete, and the acceleration pressed March into the seat. Axiom and I are in pursuit. Go ahead and detonate the plasma charges. If he's got a nuke, where the hell is he going with it? said Casimir. Spaceport, said March. Has to be. The truck bounced through the gate and onto the street, and March spotted the brake lights of Lori's truck. The machinist operative was already going at least 70 miles an hour and accelerating. He must have a ship stashed there, 
something fast enough to get him into orbit, or at least out of the blast radius before the bomb detonates. Probably has the nuke on a timer to let him get away before he cooks the city. Then no one ever knows he was here, and he can take the relic and start churning out ghost drones somewhere else. There was a flash and boom, and March glanced in the rearview mirror to see Devereaux's warehouse collapsing into itself. Maurice Devereaux would be buried with the nanobot fabricator. Hell of a funeral pyre. Then we've got to stop him, said Tolox. If he sets off that bomb in the city, he's going to kill millions of people. Maybe we should contact the Securitate, said Helen. This is way bigger than all of us. If we screw up and we don't stop Venator, a lot of people are going to die. Yeah, fine, said Casimir. I'll put in an anonymous call. Though the Securitate probably won't respond, on account of a massive gunfight and explosion at Devereaux's warehouse. You get the plate number. No, said March. Not close enough yet. I. Axiom leaned forward and rattled off the number. Sharp eye there, Missy, said Casimir. All right. I'll call it in. But you two have the best chance to stop him. I'll call up some friends and try to join you, but... But it's probably up to us, said March, trying to coax some more speed out of the truck. Yeah, said Tolox. Looks that way. March focused on driving. There wasn't much traffic near the spaceport, mostly automated trucks hauling goods to and from the cargo shuttles, but there were enough of them that March had to focus on not hitting the trucks. So did Lori, but March was gaining on him. Lori's truck seemed to have a full load, likely from the weight of the nuke, and Macha's truck didn't have anything in the trailer. That meant he could accelerate faster, and they were gaining on Lori. Do we have a plan, said Axiom, as March accelerated past a semi. Yeah, said March. I get close, you shoot out Lori's tires. He crashes, we kill him, take the relic, disable the nuke, and then get the hell out of here. Very well, said Axiom. She smashed out her window with the butt of her rifle, the glass falling into the street. But get as close as you can. This vehicle's suspension is substandard and does not provide a stable firing platform. If I accidentally shoot the bomb, there is a remote but nonetheless real possibility that the resultant power surge might trigger the detonator. Then we'll get close, said March, and he pushed for more speed from the straining engine. The battery charge on the dashboard was draining fast. The truck had only been half-charged when he had stolen it, and the damned Rustari electric engine was an inefficient mess. He only hoped Lori's truck was just as inefficient. They drew closer, March weaving the truck around the semis. From the direction of the ruined warehouse, he heard the wail of a lot of sirens. It seemed that the Securitate had responded in force. Were any of them coming to stop Lori? If they did, most likely they would shoot March and Axiom and let Lori go. All right, said Axiom. I calculate I am close enough to attempt a shot. Don't fall out the window, said March as she leaned out the frame, bracing the barrel of the rifle on the side mirror. Then do not change direction unexpectedly, said Axiom. Try to get closer. Trying, said March. He was going 73 miles an hour, the RPM meter's needle vibrating like an overstrained rope. There were less than 30 meters between Macha's truck and Lori's now, and they were close enough that March could read the license number for himself. Axiom took a deep breath and squeezed the trigger. The plasma rifle spat a bolt and blew out a crater on the road, just behind Lori's right rear tire. March heard the hot shards of asphalt bounce off the front fender. Axiom fired twice more and missed both times. He could hardly blame her. The truck's engine was pushing at its maximum capacity, and between that and the lousy suspension, the vehicle was vibrating with enough force to make Macha's teeth hurt. She squeezed the trigger again just as Macha's front left wheel hit a pothole. The whole truck bounced, and her wayward plasma bolt blew away Lori's right side mirror. He's going to notice that, said March. 
Obviously he has been aware of our pursuit for some time, said Axiom. Her next shot took out Lori's right brake light. Damn it. If this truck would stop vibrating for just a second. The back door on Lori's truck started to slide open. What the hell? Why was Lori opening the back door? Did he want them to shoot the bomb? Axiom was right that there was a chance a plasma bolt might accidentally trigger the detonator, but it was just as likely that a plasma bolt would disable the weapon. Nuclear weapons, even comparatively simple fission bombs, were complicated machines, and it was a lot easier to disable a complicated machine than to accidentally trigger it. Then the door opened all the way, and March saw the naked men and women. No, not humans. Companions. Two built to look like men, and two built in the shape of women. Like the other companions, the artificial flesh had been peeled off the sides and top of their heads, giving them a macabre appearance. Behind them stood a massive black box about the size of a commercial refrigerator, which was no doubt the bomb. At the moment, March was more concerned about the plasma rifles held by the companions. Axiom, he shouted. She fired, and this time her bolt met the target. The shot struck Lori's right rear tire. The truck's heavy tires had been built to withstand the rough conditions of the road and to bear the truck's weight, but it hadn't been designed to hold up against plasma fire. The tire exploded, shards of rubber tumbling away, and the truck canted to the right. In the same instant, all four companions fired. March ducked as best he could as two plasma bolts tore through the windshield, blowing it into glittering shards. A pulse of searing heat washed over the right side of Macha's neck as a plasma bolt shot past. It must have missed him, because he was still alive to feel the pain of its superheated passage. Another bolt drilled through the hood and into the engine, which started making an unhappy howling noise as every warning light on the dashboard illuminated at once. Axiom yelped in pain. March couldn't spare a second to see if she had been shot or not. He couldn't spare that second because the remaining brake light on Lori's truck flared as the machinist agent struggled to get the vehicle under control. Worse, Lori's truck started to tilt to the side, the vehicle beginning to go into a spin from the loss of its tire. Which meant Macha's truck slammed into it at about 75 miles an hour. The bumper struck Lori's truck at an angle, and the impact was sufficient to flip Lori's truck onto its right side, sparks flying from the metal as it skidded along. The hood of Macha's truck crumpled like an accordion, and the engine failed with a hideous whining shriek. March was thrown forward into his restraints, and he just had time to be glad he had thought to buckle his seatbelt. The strap sawed into his chest and stomach with terrible force, but it stopped his head from cracking against the steering wheel. With a horrible shriek of tearing metal, both trucks came to a shuddering halt. March was flung back, his skull bouncing off the headrest with terrific force. That hurt like hell, but he didn't think anything had been broken. Axiom, he croaked, turning his head to the side. Axiom slumped in her seat, eyes closed. She was still breathing, which was good. But she was bleeding from a cut on her right temple, which wasn't good, the crimson blood stark against her pale skin. March jerked his seatbelt free and yanked his rifle from the floor. He didn't think Axiom was badly hurt, but if he didn't get moving, they both would be dead. A companion stepped around the wreck of Lori's truck, plasma rifle coming up to target Axiom's head. March snapped his rifle around and fired, and his shot burned away the top half of the companion's skull. The android jerked and collapsed to the asphalt. March tried his door handle and realized that the crash had warped the door. He then raised his rifle butt to smash out the driver's side window, only to see that it had been shattered in the crash. March heaved himself through the window, rivulets of broken safety glass falling from his arms and legs, and braced himself on the crumpled hood of the truck. Around them, heavy semis rumbled past, hauling cargo to and from the spaceport. March hoped the pseudo-intelligences driving the automated trucks were smart enough not to crash into the wrecks. Two more companions came into sight around the edge of Lori's truck. March lifted his rifle and fired, his shot taking the companion on the left through the skull. 
The second fired at him, the blast sizzling past his arm, and March adjusted his aim and pulled the trigger. His first shot punched through the companion's chest, and the second vaporized its skull. March jumped off the hood of the truck and whirled, rifle held ready before him. There had been four companions in the back of the truck, along with the nuclear bomb. He had accounted for three of them, but the fourth might still be active. Glory might have been injured or even killed in the truck crash, but March doubted that he was that lucky. He stepped around the side of Lori's truck, looking into the cargo area. The bomb had broken loose from its mounting and landed on the wall of the truck, coincidentally crushing the last companion. There was no sign of Lori. Had he survived? Had he escaped? A dark flicker caught his eye. He spotted Lori sprinting for the curb, a plasma pistol in his right hand and the alien relic in his left hand. March cursed and ran after him, taking a shot with the plasma rifle. Aiming a handgun while running was hard. Aiming a rifle while running was much harder. March's bolt came nowhere near Lori. The machinist agent twisted, bringing his pistol to bear, and started shooting. March dodged the bolts and fired again, just as Lori jumped onto the curb beneath another warehouse. This time, he had better luck. He missed Lori, but he hit the curb. A section the size of a fist exploded into concrete splinters, and Lori stumbled, tripped, and landed on his face. He kept his grip on the pistol, but lost the artifact. The relic hit the street and bounced away, and March shifted his rifle to his right hand and snatched up the alien device with his left. His cybernetic arm reported that the thing felt smooth and hard and cold. His right arm was strong enough to bear the weight of his rifle unaided, and he swung to aim at Lori as the machinist agent scrambled back to his feet. Lori fired again, and March had to dodge. His bolt missed Lori, and the machinist agent dashed into an alley. March started after him, his blood hot for the kill. This time, Lori wasn't getting away. This time, the machinist agent would be called to account for all the blood on his hands. Something small and metallic bounced out of the alley, leaving a few shards on the sidewalk. March thought it was a grenade at first and he stepped back, but then he realized it was a broken phone. That was the detonator for the bomb, said Lori, his voice ringing down the alley. The timer was set for three minutes, March. Chase me if you want. Maybe you'll catch me before we all burn together. March hesitated, looking at the phone, at the alley, and then back at the wrecked trucks. It could be a trick. It could be a bluff. Shit, said March, and he sprinted back towards the trucks. In the distance, he heard the slap of Lori's footfalls as the machinist agent fled towards the spaceport. March ran towards the open door of Lori's truck, and Axiom came into sight. She was wobbling a bit, the rifle dangling from her right hand, but she was on her feet and moving under her own power. She was staring at the black metal case of the bomb, her metallic eyes wide. March, said Axiom. The bomb. I know, said March, climbing into the back of the wreck truck. Glory trigged the countdown. We have about two minutes and 36 seconds until the bomb goes off, said Axiom. Hold these, said March, shoving the rifle and the relic in her direction. Axiom took them both without complaint. Glory's run off to the spaceport, so he set the bomb on a timer to stop us from following him. He looked around, seeking for an access panel on the bomb. There, said Axiom, pointing. March seized the panel with his left hand and ripped it away, revealing a maze of wires and components. He had seen warheads like this numerous times before, usually employed as missiles in starship-to-starship -starship combat, and he started ripping at wires and pulling at components. An electronic whine came from the bomb. March turned an anxious glance at Axiom. The power has stopped, said Axiom. The bomb has been disarmed. Good, said March, wiping sweat and blood from his forehead. More blood than he would have thought. He must have cut himself at some point, but he couldn't remember when. Anger flooded through him as he realized that Lori had likely gotten away by now. March could try pursuing him, 
but almost certainly he would be intercepted by the Securitate if he didn't get out of here now. Still, at least they had stopped Lori from nuking Rykov City. He saw Axiom staring at the alien relic in her hand. What, said March? That thing didn't activate, did it? You know, said Axiom in a soft voice, we could sell this for a tremendous amount of money. March said nothing. Come with Helen and me, said Axiom. We can sell this, and perhaps settle down quietly somewhere. Somewhere away from the final consciousness. Does not that sound compelling? He remembered kissing her, remembered the feverish heat of her skin when she had touched him. It does, said March, but that thing's dangerous. You know it's too dangerous to sell. You saw the ghost drones. The machinists made you and me into an iron hand and an iron eye. If we sell it, the final consciousness will get it back someday. They'll make more monsters. They'll rip apart more people the way they ripped us apart. Axiom sighed and then dropped the relic into Macha's outstretched hand. I meant what I said, Jack March, said Axiom. I think we could have had a lot of fun together. Maybe, said March, but we had better get away from these trucks. Getting arrested and shot by the Securitate wouldn't be fun at all. I calculate that you are entirely correct, said Axiom, and they ran like hell.